questions. And so um, I'd encourage that to be something that we all kind of celebrate here today. Um, and so then along those lines, I want to talk a little bit about um, LMWG wins, some of the research questions, priorities, and progress that we've made in the past year, some updates on, on those topics, and then hopefully have some time at the end to talk about CESM3 timelines um, and the activities that as a working group I kind of see it as being you know, opportunities and challenges that we, that we can kind of focus on in the next year. Um, for wins. Here. Um, I think it's awesome when anyone from our community can get recognized at, as, as a, you know, publicly for CESM, so thanks for your contributions. Um, they're well earned. Um, other wins, Dave is now back. Um, you know, a year ago, we had no idea that JF was going to leave, that Dave was going to step in as interim director, so thank you, Dave. Um, filling in there, um, and Gordon for stepping in as, as section head reluctantly. Um, two other wins, they're also a little bit bittersweet, so Donica um, has taken a job at, the, at CSU up in Fort Collins, so she'll be starting in, um, in the fall up there, and Jackie's taken a job with NASA. Um, so between the two of them, it's almost 20 years of contributions to NCAR um, that, that Donica and Jackie have, have made. And, and at least for me personally, like Donica and I started around the same time as postdocs. We shared an office for probably the first six or eight years that we worked here. Um, so it's a bummer to see them moving on, but it's also exciting um, to, to, to see them having some new opportunities. Um, uh, my animations are different than what's on here. Um, is that right? Um, and then joining Linnea as part of this group too, where they're sitting at NCAR, but actually funded through something somewhere else. So Katie's actually funded through CU and through um, University of Michigan. Um, and then the SAMs are joining the software team. Um, so Sam Levis is coming on um, as a halftime liaison, and we're just gonna be able to start hiring him as of yesterday full-time for the next um, while to help both with kind of get him up to speed on liaison activities. Um, and then Sam Rabin, um, through a variety of funding streams, has is, is, is been brought on to do some crop stuff for now and then move on to some other software engineering needs later. So welcome to, to both Sam and, and Sam, welcome back to Sam Levis and welcome to Sam Rabin. Okay, um, so for research questions, I feel like um, they kind of boil down to these three topics, broad topics that um, kind of can be summarized into, you know, how are we going to grow enough, how we, how are we as a, you know, global community going to grow enough food, where do we get, how do we, you know, get enough water to support our needs, and then where do we put the carbon? So between these three, three needs, I think kind of broadly CTSM is well positioned between the crop model, um, the hill slope hydrology model, and FATES to start answering some of these questions about food, water, and carbon, and especially how um, the ecosystems that, that support those activities. So I want to spend a little bit of time talking about how, as a working group, we're addressing these questions. Um, again, kind of talking about activities related to the crop model, to the hillslope hydrology model, and with FATES. Um, so this is work that Sam Rabin's leading uh, with implementing uh, crop calendars. And so kind of the question is, how much can we improve the, real, the yield realism by improving the timing um, of planting? And so if you look at Donica's CLM5 crop paper, there's kind of certain regions of the world and certain crops in particular that fail because they're being planted at the wrong time. And so Sam has implemented this crop calendar approach um, where in the black are some observations from FAO SAT and Earth SAT in the, does it look like blue? Oh, they're all blue up there. That's too bad. Um, no red. So the dark blue line is with the new prescribed crop calendars and the light gray line or blue, light blue line, I don't know what you, they, they look really nice here, Sam, um, is, is the default. And so, you know, for crops like sugarcane, this is just a global um, summary of crop yields. You know, for sugarcane, we're doing a much better job growing sugarcane. Um, and for rice, it's maybe a little less uncertain. We're maybe overdoing it a little bit um, with the prescribed calendars on, on rice yields. And so kind of this points to, you know, a new feature in the model in the sense that we're, we're planting crops within windows when they're actually grown on the landscape and, and, and the planting dates kind of can move around within these prescribed calendars. Um, 
yeah, and for some crops that's good, and for some crops that's bad. And I think it's a, an active research question moving forward into you know how do we improve crop yields with with the crop model. Um, so there's definitely some additional work to be done there. And then um, along with Donica, Sam is implementing um, a tillage scheme and a residue removal scheme that were contributed a number of years ago, ironically, initially by Sam Levis in single point runs, um, and then globally um, by Mike, who was a graduate student at Virginia Tech, who worked on this tillage and residue removal scheme. So um, for the next few months, that's what Sam's going to be working on, is implementing those, those two schemes into the crop model. Um, you know, so, so Gordon's kind of remind us for, for years now that really advancements in both measuring and modeling systems are closely tied. And so for decades, eddy covariance measurements have been used to calibrate land models, and, and they, you kind of can see this fundamental mismatch in scales in terms of thinking about how the footprint of an eddy covariance tower is really useful for calibrating, you know, this evergreen PFT that's in the foreground. But then eventually we're extrapolating our results to these really coarse grid cells. So I just zoomed in on to kind of roughly the dimensions of the grid cell that we're sitting in right now, which if you're familiar with the area, basically goes from Greeley to Granby, east to west, and then from Littleton to Longmont, north to south. So it's a huge amount of variance. So there's this kind of fundamental mismatch in, in like, you know, how we think about parameterizing processes on the land surface and then what they're actually used for. So, you know, we heard a lot yesterday about high res, and I think we'll continue to hear about high res moving forward. But even if you zoom in to something that's roughly kind of kilometer or several kilometer scale, um, I'm focusing in here on, on just kind of the area around the Mountain Research Station and the um, Nywat Ridge LTER, where I also work. You can see there's still a huge amount of spatial heterogeneity. It's largely div driven by topography. Um, and so I think even, it doesn't really matter what the broader CESM community is doing in terms of like these coarse scale one degree grid boxes or zooming into kilometer scale grid boxes. The atmosphere above us tells us a lot of information, but I think the land processes are still really important. And so the hillslope hydrology model is a really exciting way to start thinking about scale and, and scale that matters in land processes that we can think about. So working with Sean, ooh, the video is going to work. It's, again, not quite as pretty as I had hoped. Um, what you're watching is a video of snowpack evolution of the hill slope bottle that's forced with meteor meteorological data from a single eddy covariance flux tower site. And so this kind of offers, you know, ostensibly testable hypotheses in a domain that roughly goes from 2,500 meters to, it actually go the domain goes to 4,000, over 4,000 meters here. Um, and how snow, how snow melts, um, how snow belt melts in north versus south facing aspects in low versus high elevations. So there's a number of, of observations that are shown here, and I just want to kind of stop the video. Um, you know, so for some time in mid-May, you can kind of see where the snow is melted out. These are south facing, um, south facing slopes or lower elevation where there's still decent snowpack. This is you know higher elevation and north facing slopes. And there's a number of observational sites which are probably almost impossible. You can actually read them. There's not too much red in this um, figure. Um, so there's you know, actually four flux tower sites that are within this domain that's shown here, as well as three snow tail sites. And you can kind of see that we're broadly capturing the aspect effects of snow melt, um, aspect and elevation effects of snow melt in these, in these real positions on the landscape. And so, although the, the video that I showed is kind of just eye candy to illustrate some of the capabilities of, of capturing some of the subgrid heterogeneity with the hill slope model. We're also actually able to kind of validate that some of these patches actually look like places where we're taking measurements. And so, um, you know, we're, we're kind of capturing differences in, in, in snow accumulation and melt just based on aspect and elevation alone. Um, I totally cheated with these simulations. I didn't cheat, but they're all, these are just SP simulations. And so, again, going from 2,500 meters to over 4,000 meters, you have huge changes in vegetation, both in their LAI and their stem density. You can kind of see, oh, it even looks orange, um, on, the, on the low elevation aspect. We have too much snow and it's melting too late in the model, but that's largely because this is a, an ecosystem that's covered by ponderosa pine. The, the stand is much less dense, and the LAI is way less than what I'm prescribing in these SP simulations. And so this kind of points to some, some exciting opportunities on the hydrologic side that when you link it to a model like FATES will allow us to start thinking about how patches of, of hill slope should be evolving kind of different a different canopy composition in, in some exciting ways.
So I think this is more of an opportunity moving forward, um, and I just wanted to highlight that. Um, Sean also wanted to, to bring up this idea of, of a prognostic inundation fraction. And so on the left, what you can see here is how CTSM represents the inundated fraction as a function of total water storage. So it changes over time, but it's kind of calibrated um, to some global scale observations. Um, and kind of you basically get this inundated fraction that doesn't change a whole lot over time. It's, it's kind of baked in, whereas with the hill slope model, you get a much kind of more dynamic evolution of the inundated fraction that changes both um, with column depth and, and width, depending on, on how much water is on the grid cell. Um, and so this is just an example of two observational products. On the left side is this wetlands database that, that we have the current inundated fraction calibrated to, and on the right is the SMAP inundated product, which actually can't see underneath tree canopies, so you don't see things like um, wetlands in the Amazon. And then what's in the middle is this totally uncalibrated but promising look at the inundated fraction from the hill slope model. Um, and so you kind of capture places like the Amazon and I don't know if you can see this, but like up, up on the Canadian Shield, we're getting high, high inundated fraction in lots of wetlands. The other sort of interesting thing, at least to my eye, that pops out here is a lot of agricultural regions, both in China and in the Midwest, where historically, at least in the Midwest, they actually were inundated, but because of tile drainage, they're no longer inundated and they're really productive croplands. The hill slope model is predicting that these should be wetlands. We know in reality that management has made them not wetlands anymore. And so I think there's, again, some opportunities to think about how we can use features of the hill slope model to couple to things like um, the methane module, which I, as far as I know hasn't been touched since Bill Riley put it in almost a decade ago. Um, so another opportunity is, again, coupling the, the hydrology with the hill slope model to, to more biogeochemistry questions. And I think those, those opportunities are, are, were well situated to start thinking about. Okay, moving on to fates. Um, Oh, this doesn't look too bad on the red must have come back. Um, this is great. Okay, so this is work that Jackie's done in a global calibration of fates. Um, and so what Jackie's done here is added an active crown fire behavior. Um, and kind of the highlight here is that grasses, um, you can see where there's high grass, high fire intensity, you also get high C4 grass biomass. And so you have this feedback between climate disturbance, which is here fire and the vegetation that's growing here, um, where where FATES is predicting that grasses grow in areas with rainfall less than 2,500 millimeters, um, which is actually observed in the real world. And so this is a set of experiments. I think Jackie's got a, a fire resistant tree, a, um, a fire intolerant tree, and a C4 grass. And she's able to produce kind of maps of C4 grass distribution that across the tropics that actually makes sense. Um, so again, it's that climate fire vegetation feedback in FATES that's really important. Um, and, and in these offline simulations, it looks like FATES is, is capturing kind of the fire intensity and the burned area and the distribution of grasses in ways that are, are kind of sensible with our, our current day understanding and, and observations. Um, and a, another piece of this that was important was actually capturing the crown fires. And so by representing crown fires, especially for these fire tolerant species, fire tolerant tree species was an important feature that Jackie had to develop in FATES to, to get these maps to look the, the way they do. So this is a paper that I, I think Jackie's hoping to submit shortly to GMDD that you can look out for, and then a, a subsequent pull request coming to, to FATES, um, hopefully in, in the short term. Um, some other exciting work that Adriana is leading is on this kind of top-down global SP calibration. So FATES has some biases in terms of um, both its, its albedo and its GPP and SP simulations. And so kind of moving through the calibration cascade that Rosie and Charlie and, and Jackie and Adriana have been talking about, um, this is, you know, might look familiar to people who went, came to the, to the um, PPE session yesterday. Um, so Adriana has taken, a, a, you know, a number of the parameters that, are, that, that, that control albedo and identified, you know, which of these are most important for, con for parameterizing fate's albedo changes. Um, and, and Rosie's kind of taken a, a, similar, a similar approach, similar but different approach, trying to calibrate these. Um, Adriana is also then starting to look at these bottom-up site-level calibrations. This, this is more on the BGC side of FATES, um, where she's throwing and, and leveraging some of the, the, the resources that we have 
using NEON data, and so she's using things like LIDAR data from the NEON AOP as well as the Airborne Observatory platform as, as well as hyperspectral data. Um, NEON also has a bunch of inventory data that's been really important for the work that she's doing, and so kind of throwing all of the information that we have for these well-studied sites at the model and then trying to calibrate, um, calibrate things like GPP. And so the hope here is that with this top-down global-scale SP calibration, as well as some tools to kind of bottom up, calibrate some aspects of the biogeochemistry, that we'll be able to calibrate um, FATE's GPP here for site-level work. Um, and, and I'd encourage you to talk more to Adriana. Like every time I talk to her, she's got new ideas and new data sets that she's wanting to bring in. I think it's really exciting to, to see this moving forward. Okay, um, so along with these kind of agriculture or crop model, hill slope and fates work that's been going on, there's a number of new capabilities and features that are coming into the model that I think are excited about. Um, so we've talked for a couple of years now about these single point neon capabilities and we just had a workshop uh, two weeks ago that I'll touch on in a minute. Um, but briefly, like this system is up and it's running, I'd encourage folks to use it if you're interested, if you're a new student and wanting to work with, um, work with, the, work with CLM, I think it's a nice way to get started. And also if you're, if you're wanting to kind of dig into site level parameterizations, I think this NEON workflow is, is, is kind of a, a game changer for us. So we've improved the infrastructure, we've created a, uh, both a cloud and container instance of this. Um, the cloud is especially useful for tutorials um, as well as visualizations. Um, and some of the work that Tegan's been doing is expanded the data sets to, to work with Prism, and I'll talk about Prism in just a second. And then added some new functionality here so you, you know, we can run these FATES cases and increasingly calibrated FATES cases with the work that Adriana is doing. Um, and we're rolling out three workshops on this in 2023 alone. So we did one two weeks ago, we're doing one next week, and then we're doing one at ESA. Um, so I think there's some some hopefully some avenues to bring in, bring in new users to our community and also integrate with the, with the NEON folks a little bit more. Um, so the work that Tegan did with PRISM, we noticed that at a number of NEON sites, there's some uh, kind of frightening biases in the, in the precip data. And based on the NEON design, especially in the grassland sites, there's very few redundant streams for precipitation. And so if you've got bad precipitation data or gaps in your precipitation, precipitation data from NEON, we're kind of out of luck. And so um, what Tiga did was take data from PRISM, which is a observationally derived data product that's produced by the University of Oregon and put out with daily time steps at really high resolution. And she, we just grabbed the PRISM data from the grid cell where the neon towers are and then are using that as an alternate input. So users can choose if they want to use neon or use PRISM data. Um, Tegan made a pull request that has made a pretty um, extensive changes to other parts of the infrastructure of CDEPs and CMEPs. Um, and then also has a tutorial that's available online that you can use to look at. Um, we're kind of starting to look at, at some observational products. So it's shown here is for the Horonata. Um, in the red line is the prism results. The orange line is neon. And then blue is two independent observations of, of precip at Horonata. And if you are interested in using this, it's kind of um, be careful because sometimes PRISM looks better, sometimes it looks worse. We cherry picked one here where it looks much better, um, but hopefully it reduces some of those biases. Um, I wanna also just kind of highlight the tutorial we had a couple weeks ago. There was something like 40 people that came to the tutorial, roughly 60 of us all together that were working on things. Um, and it was, a, um, we kind of took the training wheels off and just gave students these project-based ideas that they could run with. The students self-aggregated into groups, and so in terms of, and then, and then in a couple days, basically did a, a mini project um, using the neon sites, and it was kind of an exciting way to do these tutorials that students were super invested in, um, and and came away, you know, having a, I think a, a stronger appreciation of what it's like to actually do models, like to actually do modeling. Cat can maybe provide some input. Um, she's one one friendly face who was who was a student there. Um, I thought it was really fun and so something to kind of think about moving forward is how do we want to start rolling these tools out and, and get people invested in, in the work that, that we're doing. Um, 
A couple other features are SLIM and Miser Route. So these are two new components to the CESM system. Um, and props to Eric for, for kind of managing both of these. Um, and also to Naoki and to Marisa, who Marisa developed SLIM, the simple land interface model, which again is a new component as an alternative to CTSM. Um, that you can run in CESM um, if you want to kind of black box land and, and make it simple. Um, and then Mizu Route is being developed by Naoki, um, which allows much more complex um, hydrologic river basins, um, which is also going to be a new a new river component um, in addition to RTM and Mozart that we can that we can couple to CESM. Okay. Any ideas what this is from? CMIP 5? CMIP 6? It's a Friedlingstein pro? No, it's from the PPE. I was so excited when Daniel sent this. Um, yeah, so Daniel and Katie and Linnea have, have been working a ton on PPE related projects. Um, this is work from 500 simulations varying 32 different land parameters which yields a huge range of outcomes for the magnitude of the terrestrial carbon sink. Um, so it's roughly 200 petagram spread, which is about 30% of the historical CO2 emissions um, over this time period. Um, so um, these top 10 parameters, you can kind of look through them um, and, and see that, like, you know, what are the most important parameters for, for different processes in these one at a time experiments. And, and Daniel um, provided a link and then I provided the QR code in case you want to go through. If you haven't clicked through these plots, they're really useful if you're trying to calibrate your model for a site or for a region and just understand where sensitivities are. Um, so there was a, a parameter estimation cross working group meeting yesterday. If you missed that, you can hopefully catch it on, on YouTube. And then there's both some talks today and then tomorrow at the biogeochemistry working group that, that, that leverage some of these tools. I think it's the PPE is a pretty exciting project that, that um, this crew is heading up. Okay. Um, Last slide, this one's gonna take a while to roll out. Um, this is kind of what I'm imagining for the development timeline. So the PPE experiment is quite mature and it's on its own branch that will hopefully get brought back to the trunk before um, we roll out C CTSM-6 and CESM-3. Um, other major activities are the creation of this new surface data set. Um, Sam Levis presented on this at the working group meeting in the winter. If you have questions, um, I'm happy to talk about it. This is almost ready to get merged, and I think um, we're, we're eager to get CT we're, so it's also on its own branch. We're calling this the, C the CTSM 5.2 branch. The plan is to merge that hopefully by the sometime this summer, or by the end of the summer, mostly for coupled model testing so that when they're running coupled model tests, there's a branch tag that people can pull from relatively easily to, to do coupled CESM testing. Um, and as soon that CTSM 5.2 tag is gonna be an N of one. There's, it's gonna be one, one dev tag on CTSM 5.2 and then immediately we're gonna move to 5.3. And so whatever physics we have on the 5.1 branch is gonna merge with this new surface data set on 5.2 and then we're gonna start working on CTSM 5.3. Kind of concurrently, I think there's four I think these are the four biggest contributions that we need to get to Maine relatively quickly. And so that's Danny's dust emission work, um, Matt Vey and many others, excess ice work, um, the roughness length um, work that Ronnie Meyer has done, and then snicker updates from Sen Lin. Um, these are kind of four, I think, core development features that are ready to go and, and just need some software engineering to be brought, brought to the trunk. Um, along with that would be Sean's representative hill slope, PR and Sam's planting calendars, as well as the tillage and residue work that he's starting to do. Um, and then Charlie's going to talk this after or later on this morning about the fates with land use change. Um, and then there's also a, another PR that Ryan's working on with Fates CN. Uh, it, it's I guess laying the groundwork to be able to do Fates um, Fates with carbon and nitrogen biogeochemistry. Um, okay, I'm going to back up. So this is kind of, I think, the core of what we need to get done. You know, hopefully, I don't, I don't know what a realistic timeline is. By sometime in the fall, all this stuff will hopefully get get moved to moved to Maine. And I think there's some new opportunities. Um, so one of those is prognostic lightning. The CAM crew is actually able to pass prognostic lightning to CSM. So instead of reading this climatology from NASA that we've been using for years for for lightning, um, we should be able to to read that 
in prognostically and it will change over time. Um, um, you know, Keith's yeah. able to, mm. to make diagnostic plots and say, look, this is how the cam lightning is different than the NASA lightning that we've been using in the past. But we really don't have somebody identified at this point to think about how to then use that and, and especially calibrate the fire model. Um, there's also some ongoing ozone work that needs to be wrapped up to brought, be brought to the trunk. And I have that in a dotted line because I don't know that we have the person identified to do that quite yet. Um, and then there's some extended opportunities that I think we can think about. So, um, and, and where, you know, this, this vertical line of when we freeze CTSM6 and CESM3 is a little bit nebulous. And I think it largely depends on, on what happens in other working groups. And I think we're going to hope we'll you know, like push as hard as we can to get as much science into CTSM6 as we can. And so that includes things like the DOM fluxes that the Norwegian group is working on. Um, Miseroute, and, and I don't see Miseroute being coupled fully in CESM3, but hopefully it is a feature that we can support in, in some land-only runs. And then work on irrigation, I'm calling it Irrigation Plus, um, that Yi is working on, and, and some of the water use stuff that um, that that folks from WIMS group are, are working on, I think is another one that is, is high priority, um, and, and we'll get to it kind of as, as soon as we can. And then lastly, on the FATES side, there's a bunch of work, you know, a bunch of opportunities on, on thinking about FATES SP and no comp and doing that calibration, I think is, is exciting. And when we have, we've made more progress, I would say on the SP side, but then integrating the SP and the biogeochemistry, I think, I think a, a realistic goal for the working group would be to have those as supported features in the release um, of CTSM6. Um, as, as much as we can. So with that, I think I'm just over time, which is unfortunate. Um, we, we do have some time for discussion at the end, and maybe if anyone has questions here while I'm transitioning over, um, you, please you go to the mic, or if anyone's online, Teresa, that has questions Not right now. Cool. OK. Um, OK. So now as we transition, Sam's going to be our first speaker. Um, I'm asking presentations to be kind of in the 12-minute range so we can have a few minutes for questions at the end. And please provide feedback to the speakers. Um, if you're in the room, the mic might have to get turned on, whoever is brave enough to ask the first question. Um, and then if you're online, please ask, ask questions in the chat. Without further ado, um, So our first, uh oh. There it is. Okay, cool. Is this all working? Cool. Um, so Sam Raven's our first speaker, and I'll let you figure out. Oh, thank you. Is that up for my whole thing? No, 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 it just popped up. Okay. <laughs> How about this? Puh, 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 puh. Okay, good. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks to the organizers for uh, letting me kick off this session as, as far as the, um, the guest presentations, uh, especially considering I didn't use CTSM at all for this work. Uh, well, I did indirectly, but uh, yeah, we'll get to it. Uh, the idea here, so this is work I've, um, uh, I did in my previous postdoc uh, where I was with Rutgers University working with Lily Shaw and Alan Robach on um, funded on a project about stratospheric aerosol uh, injection, a form of geoengineering. Um, there is definitely space to discuss the ethics of this, but not in a 10 to 12 minute presentation. Short version is, I think it's ethical to investigate the potential impacts, which is what we do here. Um, so there has been a lot of work, um, or a fair amount of previous work on crop productivity impacts under stratospheric aerosol injection, SAI. Um, uh, I, a lot of this work actually has used CLM's, uh, CLM's crop model. Uh, Lily Shaw looked at uh, impacts in China. Uh, Fan et al. Uh, looked at impacts um, uh, globally and decomposed it into the different, um, different contributing factors, whether it's temperature, the, the changing amount of radiation and split between diffuse and direct um, uh, radiation, uh, other climatic factors. Uh, seeing about overall for all crops about a 10% uh, median impact of uh, geoengineering. Um, and Brendan Clark uh, and others in um, the 
Um, the Shaw and Robach Lab have a, a paper, I think still in review, almost, almost done, um, looking at, uh, again, futures of um, CLM crop performance under geoengineering. But these productivity changes won't happen in a vacuum. The idea we had was to investigate how changing productivity of croplands and pasture impact land use change. So as things get more productive or less productive, how is that going to affect where crops are grown, how much fertilizer is required, what crops are grown, that sort of thing. So to do this, as I said, I'm not actually using CTSM. Um, we're using what's called LandSim, the Land System Modular Model, which is what I worked on in my previous, previous postdoc. Um, it's a very complicated system once it's all um, together where we couple a climate system emulator. Uh, we feed that into LPJ Guess, which is a dynamic global vegetation model. Um, LPJ Guess produces estimates of um, crop performance under a factorial fertilization and irrigation scheme, uh, changing pasture performance as well as, and this is new and kind of experimental, uh, forest productivity. Um, that, that's all being fed into Plum, which has recently gotten the ability to include these forests. Um, Plum combines those potential yields with socioeconomic data from which it gets demand estimates and uh, does very complicated math to spit out suggested land uses and management. And that can be fed back into LPJ Guess, back into the climate emulator, et cetera. Uh, here we're not doing that fully coupled work. Instead, we're using um, modeled weather uh, in CO2 from uh, CESM. Uh, so I did indirectly use CTSM, but uh, just, just to get the, the weather. Um, and we're not fully coupling it where the, the end product of this research is just going to be looking at the suggested land uses and management from Plum. All right, so a quick primer on how Plum works. Um, yeah, it takes those fertilization, or fertilizer and irrigation results for crops, changing pasture productivity, changing pr forest productivity. Uh, feeds those into Plum. Plum calculates demand for uh, crops, livestock, and forestry, forestry being both for timber and carbon. Um, livestock is split into the two uh, major um, biotypes, ruminants and monogastrics, and then it has a whole bunch of different crop types, and some of these are, have actually recently been split. Um, so oil crops is now split into nitrogen fixing and non-fixing crops. Um, wheat, maize, rice are the big, four, the big three cereals. Um, so it, it calculates all this demand, um, and then it, looking at the potential productivity, uh, it calculates how much for each country is being produced domestically versus how much is being supplied via trade. Uh, and with all that, it produces a lot of different um, aspects of land use and management, including area and intensity. Uh, so here I'll be focusing just on cropland. Um, talking mostly on cropland, talking a little bit about pasture, uh, and just for the sort of big four crops, which are wheat, maize, rice, and oil crops, uh, which again, um, I'll actually just be looking at nitrogen fixing oil crops, which you can read as soybeans. Uh, so the scenarios we're using here, uh, Yaga talked about this a little bit yesterday, if you were in that session. Um, we're using the Arise SAI 1.5 scenario, where um, you take uh, the baseline um, the baseline climate here is SSP2, RCP 4.5, um, which is, uh, so that's the control that we'll be comparing against essentially. Um, and we, for Arise SAI 1.5, it's the same emissions as that scenario. Uh, so we'll have um, a similar uh, carbon dioxide concentration, but um, you get S uh, stratospheric aerosol injection starting in 2035 with the goal to keep mean change over pre-industrial um, globally to 1.5 degrees. Um, you can see it, it's very effective. Um, you know, the, the controller algorithm that I think she mentioned is very effective at um, accomplishing that goal. And I'm really glad the red bulb is back because otherwise these would have been hard to read. Uh, all right, so first, looking at results for just the, the crop productivity impacts, not going the next step to land use. Um, if you saw my presentation at AGU, this is very familiar. Um, the difference here is that I've added more ensemble members. So in that one, I only had one ensemble member. Now I've done five out of the 10 that are available for each of these scenarios. Uh, so right now we're just looking at um, SSP2 4.5 results. Um, the, the bottom line in each of these, um, so these are time series uh, for each crop, 
uh, that we're looking at. Bottom line is with uh, zero fertilizer applied, middle line is 60 kilograms per hectare, top line is 200 kilograms per hectare. And these are just for rain-fed crops. And this is if you, if you plant over the entire world. This is not a weighted average based on current crop area. It's the entire world because that's what Plum sees, right? It considers the potential productivity of every single grid zone. All right, so you can see a clear delineation between the different fertilizer levels. Um, you can see generally things, uh, crops are getting more productive over time. This is due to the, the carbon dioxide uh, fertilization effect. Um, also, LPG, I guess, doesn't have some mechanisms by which heat waves and stuff would kill crops. So it might be a bit of an, uh, an overestimate. All right, so when we add in, so what we expect to see is some sort of difference between this and the arise scenario, and we actually see hardly any difference at all. Um, maybe for some of the most heavily fertilized ones, um, like uh, for cereals, uh, but you see they're actually, it's actually less productive under the arise scenario. Um, and that's mainly because you just see less incoming solar radiation. So the plants have, um, have less ability to photosynthesize. And we don't get a potential fertilization effect that you would see if we actually partitioned radiation into direct versus diffuse. Because the idea with spraying all these aerosols up into the stratosphere is, um, sure, it reflects a lot, but um, it also ends up diffusing the light, and that can make crops more productive. But LPJ gas doesn't have that. It just looks at total radiation. Uh, same st story pretty much for irrigated crops. They're just really similar, um, both scenarios. Uh, so that was pretty surprising. This is one of those like really scientifically surprising results, uh, but something that's not interesting, if that makes sense. Um, but anyway, we wanted to say, all right, well, maybe there are sort of regional differences that, that could be interesting. Um, all right, so here we're looking at in uh, the last period of the, the study, 2065 to 69, um, we're looking at arise minus SSP245. So positive numbers, arise is, is better. Um, and stippling here indicates uh, where there's a significant difference at a 95% um, confidence interval. Uh, and you can see there are not a lot of places where it's a rise is significantly better or worse. Um, one interesting thing is that in, um, in the far north, so like Alaska and, and northwestern Canada, um, C4 cereals and soy actually do worse under a rise because it's cooler. Um, that means that SSP245, the warming associated with that, would make it possible to grow these crops there, and um, it's just not possible uh, under uh, this geoengineering scenario. Uh, so this fits with some, some previous work um, by Brendan Clark that I mentioned earlier, uh, talking about sort of potential winners and losers when it comes to changing crop productivity under SAI. Uh, similar story for irrigated yields. Uh, there's much, there are much greater areas of difference um, significant difference, uh, at least for C4 cereals, but pretty much similar story uh, where um, low latitude countries would um, see improved productivity under um, a rise, but high latitude places uh, could see worsened productivity. All right, so now uh, taking it the next step to land use patterns, uh, maybe these regional differences would result in some differences in land use patterns. Uh, so we're, we're looking at Right now, global time series of cropland and pasture area um, normalized to 2035. So that y-axis here is percent difference from 2035. Uh, and again, uh, so this is just the, the um, shading here and in my previous figure is the entire range across all five ensemble members. Um, and the, the lines are the medians. And so you can see they, they overlap pretty much 100%. There's really not much difference, uh, which you might expect, again, from that the previous slide on crop productivity. Uh, maybe there would be regional differences in land use. Uh, not really so much. So um, the, the colors here indicate the, um, the fraction of the grid cell that is cropland here at the end of the period versus the beginning of the period before they diverged. Um, the two maps look very similar. And if we do a difference map, uh, there would be stippling here if there were significant differences anywhere, but there are not. Um, and there are just tiny sort of regional less than regional hotspots of, of differences. And again, similar story for pasture, really not too much difference. Um, if you look at individual crops, there is not a big difference in terms of what crops are being grown globally. 
Um, and as well as regionally, there are, again, sort of regional differences, but it's, it's interesting how, how close by these differences are. So like maize, there's a big shift from one part of China to a very neighboring part of China, but it's, um, you know, even at a national, if you just say national level, it's not a huge difference. So the next steps, I wanna double check the plum setup because as I said, this is uh, sort of an experimental function to have the, the forestry in there. And I think there may be uh, sort of too much competition from forestry leading to real constraints on expansion of um, cropland and pasture. We could run with all ensemble members, potentially do a climate forcing attribution. Would love to do this with other crop models, maybe even CTSM, um, potentially using emulators, which have been made previously. Um, all right, so I would like to acknowledge Silverlining and NSF for funding this work in the computation, um, BART for doing the, the plum simulations, and all of you for your attention. I'm switching, I think Lily's up next online. Um, yeah, so I guess I don't know enough about the crop model that you're using in this kind of complicated setup, but do you think that the results from, if you did a similar experiment with CSM would be similar, like, I don't know, um, scientifically surprising but not interesting? <laughs> or do you think there'd be more, um, you know, more interesting feedbacks there? Yeah, I, I definitely do think there would be more interesting effects. Um, the, the previous studies using CTSM's crop model um, in uh, SAI experiments have seen much stronger changes in, in crop productivity. Uh, so yeah, I think um, it would be really great to do this with um, CTSM and other crop models to get a, a better idea of sort of the intermodal spread. Lily, can you hear us? Yeah, I can. Actually, I have a question. So oh, for sure. the crop model in CTSM, what kind of crop model will be implemented in the new version of CTSM? Uh, it'll be the same same one that's in there now. So we had talked in the past about uh, moving to AppSim. Um, yeah. I, I don't see that happening in CTSM 6. Uh, okay. CTSM 6, but hopefully, hopefully that's still on the table. Yes, yeah, so that's what Ben Pang had been is is still interested in leading up, but at least at this point, he's he's not able to do it right now. Okay, so I suppose to share my screen, right? Yeah, because can you do I that? upload. Okay. Great. We can see your screen. If you can just put it in full screen, then we'll be ready to go. Uh, is that good? Uh oh. There you go. That looks great. Great. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Lily. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to talk in the land uh, working group. Uh, so I'll just uh, follow up uh, after Sam's talk. So we are working on the same topic about impact from stratospheric aerosol intervention. So. Uh, Sam was uh, uh, one member in our group uh, from Rutgers Impact Studies of Climate Intervention. And I would like to thank you, th thank Silver Lighting and the NSF supporting our work. So I'm going to talk about impacts of air pollution, surface air pollution under this very special climate scenario. So surface air pollution uh, is influenced by a combination of different factors, uh, especially from the surface emissions uh, from anthropogenic sources and natural sources. And the emitted uh, precursors, along with the background atmospheric com components um, with different weather pattern and different surface environment will go through a series of uh, chemical and physical process and then have different air pollution and form different patterns over different regions. And this air pollutant will also have a feedback on climate and that climate will feedback on the surface air quality. So it's a very complicated uh, process. And there are regional models like WORF to predict a uh, near term or trying to accurately predict the near term PM2 0.5 change or surface ozone change. But here I'm looking at long-term climate impact on air pollutant. 
There has been a lot of studies looking at the CMF6 simulation and to look at global PM2.5 change and the surface ozone change. And the emissions, the prescribed emissions in SSP, those are the driving factors to determine the future long-term pattern for the global average the PM2.5 and the surface ozone. So those here is just a, a from a turnout work, turnout's work, and those different colors indicate a different pathway. And this is just a, I put only two precursors here. So it's under the scenarios has higher emission, which will end up the global and PM2.5 um, average will be higher. So, but this is for global warming. So for global change in the future under different SSPs, but under sulfate aerosol uh, intervention, this very special climate uh, scenario there has been only four studies looking at the surface aerosol changes and the surface ozone change. So the first one is from Ben Kravitz. It's almost like one decade, more than 10 years, looking at if we inject sulfate aerosol into the atmosphere, what would be the change on the surface? And uh, his conclusion is in the blue, highlighted in the blue, if for this whole slides, if it's blue, that means there's not big impact. There's not positive impact um, ecosystem from the from the sulfate aerosol injection. And in year 2017, I did a study on how the tropospheric ozone will change, surface ozone will change under the sulfate aerosol, sulfate aerosol injection scenario. And my conclusion is it really depends on different scenario because it involves the troposphere chemistry, involves the stratosphere, troposphere exchange. So different SRM scenarios will have a different impact on surface ozone. And also Sebastian made the very user model from GeoCam did the simulation trying to quantify what would be the mortality based on air quality change and the UV exposure under geoengineering climate intervention. So that's, it's red. That means that's the more, there will be more death under climate intervention due to the air quality and the UV exposure. And also Dan simulated using a, using a, scenario, using a large ensemble study from NCAR, uh, the glands, and studied under RCP 8.5 and sulfate aerosol intervention to quantify whether if we inject a lot of SO2 into the atmosphere, what will happen on the surface. And his conclusion is this will be balanced by the decrease of anthropogenic SO2 emission, but there will be a strong regional differences. If you look at the global average, then they are balanced out, but there's a strong regional differences. And here, what I did is I looked at a new scenario called ARISE. This is a long name here, and the acronym is ARISE. And I think for this year's CSM workshop, there has been a lot of talks using this scenario. And also today from 5.30 to 6.30, there will be a special session Hold by silver lining, I think we'll talk about this ARISE simulation. So for ARISE simulation, they use SSP 24.5 as a reference case. And starting from 2035, they started to inject SO2 and try to keep the global average temperature 1.5 degree higher than pre-industrial level. Uh, those are the, the, the blue line means the simulation has been done and they propose to do another two sets of simulations to like further cooling the global average temperature to one degree and a half degree. Those are waiting for those simulations and analyze the results. And in total, there are two climate models did the simulation. One is CSM2, another one is UKSM. And Henry uh, will give a presentation about those results, comparing those two assisted models of climate response under this scenario. Uh, his talk is this afternoon, I think, is under the whole atmosphere working group. Uh, so he will give a talk at four o'clock this afternoon. So the red line here is SSP 2, 4.5, and the blue is if we inject SO2 and how 
it works in the Earth system model in terms of cooling the surface. So both models, they reach the target, the global average tem temperature target of one degree temperature target here. And so for me, I'm really interested to look at how PM2.5 will change in those two models under this scenario. And the way I calculate PM2.5 is the black carbon um, organic matters and the, the sulfate aerosol and also part of the sea and part of the dust. I want to use this method because this is the one uh, turn on used to analyze the CMF6 data. So this bar plot here is showing the control of those two climate models. The blue one is CSM2 and the green one is UKESM. And the first set of the bar uh, is a total PM2.5. And comparing with the red line here, that's the global average of CMF6 from different, it's an average of different models. And here, the gray line here, that's from satellite data, the same period for the CMF6 data. And here, we're, we're, we're just looking at a different um, period here. And you will notice for CSM2, it's like almost uh, four units higher than UKSM, as well as higher than the um, satellite data. And the reason is because the dust concentration in CSM2 is almost a double as in UK CSM, UKESM. Uh, and for other uh, components, they are very similar. So I, I did a little bit further study on the dust emission. And this is a paper uh, from Zhao 2022 and comparing all the CMF6 data in terms of the dust emission. And if you look at this one, uh, the, uh, the FMI, that's the uh, uh, satellite data average of 12 satellite data set, that's an observation. And CESM2 is much higher, this is the optical depth, showing much higher optical depth of dust. And the UKESM showing much less, it's much smaller optical depth comparing with observation here. And here the bar plot again showing CESM2 have like almost a double the concentration of dust comparing with UKESM. But this change actually won't make a difference if we're comparing the arise, the, the sulfate aerosol injection case and the global warming, the SSP 2.5 chain case. Here, those two plots are showing the change of the dust comparing with the control. I just use the SSP 2.4.5 this period as the control. Um, so you will see even the absolute values they are quite different, but if you are looking at the change, they are quite there's there's not much change if you are comparing those two models. So this is a time series of land average PM two point five in those two models, and the one on the left is a PM two point five including dust and sea salt. So you will see the absolute value of PM2.5 in CSM is higher than in UKSM here. But if you're comparing the red, the blue, and the pink and the green here, that's the difference between SSP 2.4.5 and the sulfate aerosol injection case. They are showing very mild change under those two different scenarios. But if we are taking out of dust and the sea salt, just looking at the majority from the anthropogenic emission and the surface environment change, both climate models, they are showing after we inject SO2 into the atmosphere, it seems like the land average PM2.5 will have a slightly, slightly less concentration comparing with SSP2.5. But the change is very, very mild. It's very, the difference are very small. But if you are looking at the, the global map, this is comparing the last 10 period of the sulfate aerosol injection simulation, comparing this is a sulfate aerosol injection minus SSP 2.5, 10 years average. And this map here uh, include dust and sea salt. 
And here you see all those very strong blue color in CSM2. Those are all in the dust emission place, Sahara Desert and in Australia, Middle East. So in CSM2, under sulfate aerosol injection case, the dust in emission has been strongly reduced comparing with global warming SSP2 4.5. And in another way, UK ESM, there's merely there's no change for the for the if you are looking at those dust emission uh, area. For maybe Australia, there's some reduction here, but in Sahara Desert and the Middle East, there's not much change. And if we're taking out the dust and sea salt, and the other component here, this is the PM2.5 concentration difference. It's the same calculation, same period. It's a sulfate aerosol minus SSP2 4.5. And you will see the reduction for those two models. They are in very similar locations. This is majority driving by the secondary organic aerosol reduction under sulfate aerosol injection case. So with much cooler, cooler environment in the surface, so the VOC emission from forest has been reduced in both model, which cause much less secondary organic aerosol. I also looked at the surface ozone concentration in those two models. Uh, if we look at the uh, global map on the, on the right first, that's the uh, control the 10 years average of those two models, surface ozone concentration, they are very similar to each other. If we're looking at the land average surface ozone here, you will see for CSM it's slightly higher, but if you are comparing the sulfate aerosol injection case and the SSP2, it seems like after we inject aerosol, it will increase the surface ozone concentration a little bit comparing with SSP2 4.5. And it seems like if we only look at the land average, those two models are showing very consistent results in terms of this slight increase. But if we are looking, oh, sorry, I should move this way. If we are looking at the map, it's still the same time period, still sulfate aerosol injection minus SSP2 4.5. If we are looking at the map, those two models, they are showing totally different pattern of surface ozone change. So let me, let me go back. If we look at the average, the land average, they are very similar increase. But if we are looking at the, if we are looking at the map, they are totally different. And the main reason for this, this difference is because surface ozone is determined by both troposphere, the surface, for the chemistry and also determined by the stratosphere troposphere exchange. So if the stratosphere ozone uh, concentration has been changed, it will have a large impact on surface ozone as well. So for the difference of those two maps, the main reason is because the aerosol we injected in those two models, they have totally different distribution in stratosphere. So for CSM, if you look at here, that's the optical aerosol optical depth. The majority of the aerosol are in southern hemisphere here. But in UK ESM, the majority of the aerosol is in northern hemisphere. So in CSM, the ozone depletion in stratosphere is, is the most over southern hemisphere, but UK. ESM is in the northern hemisphere, which of course in CESM, the surface ozone we will see a large reduction, a large decrease over the southern hemisphere on surface ozone, but you won't see that in UK ESM. So those are still, it, it, it's not, those, this study is not really completed. So, but I think based on this study, uh, we can, I, I'm really interested to know more about Firstly, the dust concentration in CSM is much higher than the other model and also all other CMF6 models. So I would really like, I think Tim just mentioned in the CTSM, the new development include, include the dust emission. So I really would like to get in touch with the person in charge of that part to understand why dust emission in CSM is much higher than other models. 
and to understand the dust feedback and impact on air pollution and the feedback on climate system. And also, uh, the current study was also showing if we only look at the average, it won't tell us much. But if we are looking at the map, there's a very large regional difference, especially over urban areas where human lives. So I would like to do more analysis over like those regions. So Lily, and, I'm, I'm sorry, we should probably move on. Oh, sure, sure. So I, I just want to uh, and I will just want to get in touch with the one you mentioned who's developed developing the dust emission part and trying to understand the dust question. Yeah, so Danny Leon is doing that. He's a graduate student at um, okay. UCLA, and that hopefully that works moving to the trunk relatively soon. Um, mm -hmm. But it's 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 getting closer. Yep, it, it definitely will be in in CESM three. Do you mind uh, shop stopping your screen share? Sure. And while we're switching over, are there any questions either online? Yep, thank you. <laughs> and I think, oh, now I don't have the agenda in front of me. Um, Ling Shang, are you up next? Yeah. Great. Okay, so let's go. Cool. Any, any questions for Lily? Maybe the best thing to do would be to, to put those in the chat. It looks like Ling Ching, your your screen's on, and I think I heard you. Okay, awesome. thanks. Yeah. Great, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. So my name is Ling Cheng Li. I'm from um, PNL. So today I'll talk about uh, how to use the machine learning approach to improve the pattern functional types of coexistence modeling in phase. So first, I would like to thank all my collaborators. Okay. So uh, I think many of you are familiar with the FACE. So FACE is a cohort-based vegetation demographic model. And uh, one of its big advantages to represent the competitions between the different uh, plant function types. Um, but however, this um, advantage also has challenges. So how to reasonably simulate the coexistence um, between different plant function types is still like um, may not easier in the models. So from the um, niche-based coexistence theory, it's just kind of two uh, principles. First is like the environment filtering, which means the vegetation has two convergence in strategies to adopt to the surrounding environment. For example, in the uh, rainforest, um, all these um, plant function, all these species can adapt to hot and humid environment. And the second principle is um, niche, Partitioning, which means uh, the plants have to be divergent in strategies to ensure differentiation in resource requirement. For example, in here, we have the canopy uh, species, we have other story species, there are, um, there are difference in use of the solar radiations. So in the models to uh, have the coexistence uh, to fulfill these two principles, one is really to have represent a sufficient mechanism and processes. For example, we have different uh, types in the, for the synthesis C4 and C3, we have uh, vertical structures reprinted in the face, uh, canopy and unstories. And uh, uh, based on these like, mechanism and processes, we also have to reasonable treat parameters to represent the um, real uh, strategies. So in our talk today, um, we, we, I will focus on the how to uh, reasonably represent the parameter values to uh, reflect these two principles in the phase. So we are using a uh, machine learning method and uh, um, we are conducting experiments at a one site level, at the tropical uh, forest site at Mars. So in the model configuration, we set two um, PIPs. One is only um, and versus late uh, successional ground leaf evergreen tropical trees. And the only and late, they have trade offs um, between um, them. Like, for example, the only has greater larger uh, for the synthesis, but it also has larger background mortalities. Uh, we selected 11 parameters to uh, reflect the um, trees, um, trees values between only and late. And all these 11 parameters. 
uh, their range is based on the observations from the tropical trees. So here is the overall steps um, uh, in, in our studies. So we have uh, used the parameter sampling and then we conducted a multiple ensemble um, experiments. And uh, we specifically, we want to answer three questions. Firstly, uh, if we can use the observed treated relationship, does this observed treated relation can improve the PLT coexistence in phase? The second one is um, based on our observed, uh, uh, ensemble experiments, can we build some uh, empirical, like simple correlations uh, to improve the PLT coexistence? The third question is, can we use machine learning, like select parameters to improve the uh, PLT coexistence modeling in phase? Uh, based on time of interest, I will quickly go through the first and second, but uh, pay more attention to the third questions. So firstly, uh, we did two uh, experiments on samples. One is control experiments. The second one is uh, observation constraint experiments. So compared with the control experiments, the second experiments consider the observed the treat curve uh, relationships. All this relationship is from the uh, pre previous literature. And uh, we find that even additionally, we consider observed treat relationship actually is degraded and gated the PFT coexistence simulations. So, uh, for to quantify PFT coexistence, we use the biomass ratios between the only and total biomass. If this ratio is between 0.1 to 0.9, it is coexistence. So when you look at this figure here, the x-axis is the biomass ratio, and the y-axis is the uh, numbers of the experiments. So you can see the red color here is smaller than the blue color, which means observation. Uh, when you consider observed relationships, it's actually dec uh, decreases the uh, coexistence cases within the coexistence range. So, um, simple observed treatment relationship cannot improve the PLT coexistence modeling. So, for the second part, um, when conducted, when we finish the conduct of the experiments, we also try can try could try to find a way can we like constrain the uh, parameter space into some range if we can improve the ratios of the coexistence. So here we select three like parameter, three parameter uh, space. If you look at it in this figure here, you can see the orange color is the coexistence uh, experiments and the other two color is either only or late. So if we can add some simple linear regression to constrain all this parameter space in this region um, and this region here by the three a simple equations, we, uh, it, we find that uh, if you constrain with this relationship, uh, this um, parameter space, they do increase the coexist cases, but, only, but still like uh, about 70% is isolated or only on PRKs, uh, it's not coexistence. And also the optimum cases, which is first you have coexistence, then also you have relative less balance compared to the observations, is about only 2%. So this is still not enough to have sufficient uh, for our uh, modeling. So then um, we are look at the uh, using uh, after we have the experiments, like we have the parameter ensembles, we have the output ensembles. We can build emulators to uh, mimic this uh, their relationship between parameter and the model output. So we build several uh, machine learning. Um, models use XBoost, and based on these models, we did some sensitive analysis and also the parameters selections for the uh, for phase simulations. So here is the overall uh, model performance. So overall, the like for the ET, for the sensitive heat, for the volume ratio, and GPP and the background biomass, they are doing a really good job. But for the uh, Biomass ratio, which to quantify the coexistence, is relatively difficult to uh, simulate. To emulate by the machine learning model. So here I showed you the based on the machine learning model, we did some sensitivity analysis, and then for the ET sensible heat and bubble ratio or TBP, only three features are important, which means this 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 like water and carbon energy simulation is, it can be easily uh, determined by less process, relatively less process. 
But when you look at the above ground biomass and the biomass ratios, you can see that more than six features are important. And uh, um, for example, for the coexistence biomass ratio, you see that the difference, parameter difference between only and net PFT are, are very important. So this figure to show you that uh, relatively the biomass ratio uh, is close related to the uh, competition and coexistence and a relative, very difficult and sensitive to many processes in the, in the phase model. So we, see, we then use these models to uh, select the parameters and to guide the um, model simulations in phase. So here is the overall result. The left um, plot here is model bounce, and uh, the blue color here is for the uh, control experiments, which used to, to train the machine mo model. And the green color here is the machine learning, uh, uh, is phase simulation based on machine learning selected parameters. You can see that the green color a machine learning guided simulation has relative less bounds, close to zero. And especially when you look at the biomass ratios, you can see that the control experiment has a lot of its only, um, only category, but now we have after the machine learning selection, a uh, select parameter, it has a lot of them is coexistence now. Specifically, uh, when we look at the 25 values, uh, compared to with the control experiment, machine learning experiment has three times, more than three times more coexist cases. And with in these coexist cases, if you filter them out with by additionally by the less uh, observation biases, we improved about more than 20%. So it's about one third of the experiments optimal cases and co compared to the uh, 1.4 from the control experiments. Um, when we look at, back to the environment, uh, the leach-based coexist theory, so I just analyzed that how our select parameter can reflect this theory principles. So first one is like environment filtering, which means you have to relative difference should not be considerable. So from here, you can see this is for specific area in the, uh, index, uh, specific area um, parameters, and what axis is the difference between OD and net PFTs. So if you have larger difference in the SLA, so you will see that it's more favorable for the green color, it's more favorable for the only PFTs. And the second one is like, uh, some degree of difference should exist. So if you have two small difference between them, it's more favorable for the blue color here is late um, categories. So for, and if you want to have coexistence, is you should have like some degree of difference, but still the difference should not be considerable. So in the middle of this is coexistence uh, in orange color. So in summary, like we try different ways to improve the uh, trying to improve the PFT coexistence modeling. So why is we use observation between the relationships, but actually it's like degrade degrade the uh, coexistence modeling. But to be noted that this observation um, relationship is still a very simple relationship, may have some limitations. The second, like we use uh, some empirical correlations, but still like can do some improvements, but not enough. Uh, finally, like we tried it with machine learning approach to select the parameter for the uh, modeling and it can improve the uh, um, PLT coexistence uh, significantly and also reduce the model bounce. And this uh, approach can be a re repeatable uh, method to, for other uh, models and other plant functional or ecosystems. So this study is recently accepted by the GMD. Uh, for details, please refer to these papers. Thanks. Yeah. Happy to see you, Ching. Any questions in the room or online? Yeah, go ahead. I guess the results are really encouraging. You know, from a practical point of view, what's the vision for for the Fates Committee when you might it sort of implies you'd have to do this for every different. I don't know, ecosystem or I don't know how, how fine grained you would have to get to, you know, to come up with a global model. And maybe that's an unfair question for Lin Chang, but um, just curious what, what the strategy would, if, if you guys have thought about a strategy for a global model. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. <laughs> so 
I, I'm not thinking, I haven't think about the global yet, but like for um, maybe like for this study, like at least we can do this for different types of ecosystems, like uh, maybe this is sufficient, like for example, for the tropical rainforest as a starting point for the global, I'm not sure. And also maybe perhaps give some insights for the model development, yeah. Thanks. Do you mind stopping sharing your screen and we'll move on to our next presentation? Thank you. Great. Uh, so Guna Saxaran from, I'm, I'm going to have you pronounce your name because I don't think I'm saying that right. Um, from Auburn, I think, will be presenting next. Yeah, good morning, uh, everyone. I'm Konshegan Monogan, and I'm going to discuss about our uh, next generation interactive soil moisture forecasting system using a deep learning approach. Uh, I would like to thank uh, our NCAR and uh, our USDA grant. And before going in depth about our uh, proposed uh, next generation soil moisture forecasting system. I would like to show a short video about our, our, our interactive platform. Let me allow to play the video, please. Now, let us see a demonstration of our forecasting system and how it works. In this map, if we choose a specific location, it will show the soil moisture value in a pop-up window. We can choose a specific date and select the option Get Chart. It will show the comparison chart of CESM2 versus CR-5, as well the CESM2 versus NEON versus ERA-5. The NEON data will display only for the marked sites. In the color map section, we can choose a specific date and select the weekly forecast for one to two week, three to four week, and five to six week. Then it will display the color map based on the soil moisture values. Yeah, this is our short uh, explanation about our interactive soil moisture forecasting system. So it is, as of now, it is developed in the local host. We are planning to publish this interactive platform in the public domain soon. Now, let's... So I'm going to, uh, this is a agenda of section one. So in the section one, I'm going to discuss about what is, our, what is that in our proposed next generation soil moisture system and why it is called next generation. What is the potential of our system? So our proposed model framework, it combines two different modes. One is CESM, that is Community Health System Climate Model. It is uh, H2SOI given by uh, NCAR, and another one is a deep learning model. So we combine both uh, uh, NCAR system as well as our deep learning model to create our proposed framework. So this is a short uh, video of our uh, interactive platform, how it will predict the soil moisture for the next 46 days. So here you can see the site ABBY is one of the location in the USA, and uh, it is uh, that we can give the date. So we have given 2017, January 1, and uh, then our interactive platform will predict the next 46 days soil moisture values as, as well as it will compare the predicted value with the real data that is observed data observed by ERA5 is a 
kind of satellite, European roaming to satellite. So we have compared compare the URFI on our proposed model predicted values. And also we have compared our uh, H2SOI predicted by NCAR. So this, this uh, graph represents our uh, next 46 days H2SOI for the January 2017. So in this graph, I'm showing you what is the uh, forecast efficiency of our interactive platform. So you can see in 2017, uh, we have predicted uh, for the next 46 days soil moisture value. It is represented in the blue color, whereas uh, NCAR predicted H2SOI values represented in the red color and observed value that is your file is representing the black color. So from this graph, we can understand how efficient our proposed framework. So in section two, I'm going to discuss about what are the design uh, methodologies and platforms tools we have used in our next generation soil moisture forecasting system and what analytical methods we have used and what are the visualization methods and accessibilities available in our proposed framework. So before going to discuss about our proposed framework, our team, we already done a generalized hybrid model which combines artificial intelligence and physics model that combines the uh, hybrid uh, that create a hybrid model that will forecast the uh, hydrological forecast for the US locations. And uh, we got a very good efficiency and we have published a paper here. So we take uh, the published work as a reference and we develop our new forecast interactive platform. And it uses two different uh, uh, framework. One is uh, H2SOI and another one is ERFI. In H2SOI, this is a CESM H2SOI uh, given by NCAR. We have used the data from 1999 to 2015 for the training to train our model, as well as we have data from 1999 to 2015 from ERI5. So that is hourly data. We have converted our data to daily data and we integrated both and given to our deep learning framework. Especially we have used LSTM, long-term short-term memory, and this neural network we have used and we trained our model and we predicted our Yes, as well as the soil moisture for the next uh, uh, future years from 2016 to 21. So these are the this for the verification and testing our model. So this is uh, this is what we have completed in the phase one. We are planning to come uh, add a new feature that is user can give the data new data, user can give the new data to our framework and our framework will train accordingly and give the forecast. So as of now, we have planned to integrate the new data from NEON. It's a kind of observation. Uh, we are planning to integrate to our model and retrain our uh, neural network and improve our, our, our uh, efficiency. So this is the deep learning model we have used uh, in our proposed framework. So it is long-term, long short-term long, short memory. So it contains three different data. One is for get input and output. So uh, unlike other uh, deep learning model network, this uh, LSTM consists of a uh, very good feature that is uh, it will not only consider the most recent input, it will also consider the past values 
and it contains three different gate. One is forget gate. That is uh, the use of the gate is to remove the und irrelevant information and input gate will identify the most useful information and the output gate will ensure the predictions for the next sequence. We have used this LSTM in our proposed framework. And uh, our proposed framework consists of three different characteristics. Characters One is accessibility. Uh, for developing our proposed framework, we have used Angular as a kind of uh, programming methodology to develop the front end kind of a website we, we developed using Angular. And uh, in the back end, we have used Django using with Python to, uh, to train the model and predict the results. Everything we done in the, uh, with the help of Django programming language. And in the front end, we have used Angular. So in terms of scalability, our proposed framework can enable to integrate new data source, even user can give the data or any new uh, uh, satellite or any sensors data, we can implement in any location, we can collect the data and integrate to our system. So our system can able to add more and more data because we use the design framework that can handle huge amount of data. So in terms of adaptability, uh, our system, as of now, we have developed our system for uh, predicting the soil moisture for uh, five different locations in the USA. In the future, we are planning to implement our system for all over the uh, US in different locations. So our system can able to predict for uh, multiple locations as well. In the final section, uh, I'm going to discuss about what is the performance of our framework and how user can interact with the website and what is our next uh, future plan of our uh, framework. So this is uh, our proposed model predicted result for the uh, location of the ABBY site and uh, the date from 2017, January, up to February 15, we have predicted our, uh, predicted the soil moisture in represented in the blue color and red represent the climate model, S2SA. We collected from the anchor and black one represent the observed values from EI5. So we can predict the uh, STSO for any different locations. So here I'm comparing the performance of our framework with a climate model that is uh, given by SO that is given by Anchor. So we our proposed framework errors much reduced. Here we can see the here for the lead seven and lead twenty one and lead thirty five. So lead represent the number of predicted predicted result for next seven days. This is predicted S two S O is the soil moisture for next twenty one days. This is soil moisture for next thirty five days. So with the past ten days we use uh, uh, past values to train the model. For different past and different lead, we got different results. So from this result, we can understand how efficiency of our proposed framework. So our next uh, future plan is to uh, implement our proposed framework in the public domain. So user, any user can go in any location and find it and scan. they can interact with the website and they can understand what is the soil mass values for the last five years or last 15 years. And also they can find what is the future values in the Colorado soil mass value. So that is going we are going to do. And another one is uh, uh, 
as of now, we have trained our deep learning model locally. Uh, in the future, if new data comes from ENCA or, or any other satellite, our proposed framework can and automatically add and uh, predict the result. And also we are going to implement our uh, framework with NEON observation. So these are our new future plans. So as I, I'm going to conclude our proposed uh, framework, that is we used uh, different uh, deep learning, the soil moisture predicted value with the help of LSTM and we integrated our climate model, satellite data, ground observations. Our proposed framework can predict the result for any location in the US in the future. And this is uh, the, our next proposed, this is uh, our proposed framework is the next uh, era for soil moisture forecasting uh, research domain. Thank you. Thank you for everyone. If you have any questions, please. Great. That's exciting to hear about. Um, any quick questions before we go to a break? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I might have missed this, but what resolution are you forecasting at? So we have used uh, 100 kilometers, so we, we collected from the HTS only. Thank you. Great. Well, let's thank all the speakers again for this morning's session. And we've got a break until 10.30, um, and then we'll come back for I think one more remote presentation, and then all the rest are in the room. Thanks.
Great, we should probably get started again. Um, who can I bug? Hey Sam, do you mind closing the door back there? And our next speaker is online is, uh, is Grace. Is Grace online? Uh, there she is. Can you, oh, you guys can't see her. Do I need to drag this up? Yeah, please. Hang on just a sec, Grace. I can't talk and chew gum at the same time. Oh my gosh, where is it? Might be, it might be easier if we just do the visual. Oh yeah. Just try that. Grace, is your audio working? Maybe not quite yet. Hang on. Oh, now can works. you hear me now? Uh, yeah, now we can. Great. Perfect. Um, yeah, go ahead, Grace. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Uh, and hello, hello everyone. everyone. Thank, Thank you for this opportunity. So my name is Grace. I'm currently a postdoc at Penn State. And today I'm going to talk about phenology influence online atmosphere feedback. So for those of you who have heard a version of this yesterday, I'm going to approach this from a slightly different angle. So hopefully I won't bore you. Um, so, uh, phenology is important for both the carbon circle and land atmosphere coupling, and it influences primary production and the carbon circle through modulating growing season and leaf directions. Uh, I don't think I need to emphasize on this to this trends. Uh, I don't think I need to emphasize on this to this group, but however, uh, something you probably don't know is that phenology varies, but probably not as much as we would like it to be in the climate models. So the interannual variability of spring onset can be as large as two weeks, and there's also an observed earlier spring onset trend for 1.5 days per decade over the past few decades on average. However, we've also seen large disagreements between simulated and satellite-derived phenology. So the figure here is showing the differences between REI simulated by uh, CLM and, from, and derived from MODIS. So the black line is the satellite-derived uh, REI, and then the colored lines are CLM simulations uh, from different models. And, uh, a uh, data atmosphere combination. And as you can see, there's large differences. And actually across the CNP6 models, we've seen a general, generally overestimation of REI, and more importantly, a delayed spring onset and a longer growing season. And however, these differences result in a still large but relatively small differences in GPP. And as we have discovered, GPP is a lot uh, responsible to its environment than REI, uh, at least in CRM. So then, but phenology also modifies environmental factors. And therefore, we are wondering to what extent would the phenology biases influence land atmosphere coupling and what these influences are. And to do that, we first run the BGC mode with uh, data atmosphere forcing. And then we replace the satellite technology, we replace the default satellite technology with the simulations for different phenology types and run each simulation for 100 years. So we replace REI, SAI, and uh, vegetation top for each plant functional type, and then we run the coupled land atmosphere configuration with uh, plant to ocean conditions. And then uh, for the results, uh, we found two distinct signals scale signals, and then I'm also going to briefly talk about the interannual time scale and the upper atmosphere. Uh, so uh, for the growing season, not surprisingly, 
if you enhance vegetation or uh, activity, uh, if, uh, if we replace uh, so satellite technology with simulations, will enhance that uh, will enhance vegetation activity. And so here, each panel is showing the differences in kind of evaporation and transpiration between the simulated stress deciduous simulation and the control run for each season. And the cross is in significant changes. So what we've discovered, especially in stress deciduous uh, phenology, is that uh, in stress deciduous dominated, uh, in shifted, in sh replaced, uh, Stress deciduous technology is that we found a diverging influences between canopy evaporation and canopy transpiration. So remember, we prescribed technology here so we don't allow technology to respond to the moisture stress. And therefore, we saw an increase in evaporation with increase uh, area, uh, with increased technology, uh, and that's area and SAI and uh, vegetation height. But then we also found, uh, we also see a decrease in canopy transpiration where soil moisture is limited. And therefore, uh, so for the, and for the overall influence, we see a decrease in surface temperature through both a direct influence on evapotranspiration and a cloud feedback and uh, in, at re in regions where soil moisture is abundant. But then in regions where uh, it's where evapotranspiration is more limited by soil moisture, we can actually see a uh, we we still see an increase in evapotranspiration overall. But then we see uh, overall an uh, increase surface temperature. And then so you might have also uh, noticed the strong increase in surface temperature uh, in the seasonal deciduous figure here and. Uh, and so we also found that in the late winter to spring season, uh, or which we call the pre-growing season, the increased uh, leaf activity, the increased phenology uh, would, uh, would also influence uh, surface temperatures through both uh, changes, direct changes on absorbed radiation and then also a combined snow albedo feedback and cloud feedback. So what we see is that uh, Increased plant activity would increase absorbed solar radiation by vegetation, and then that would result in an increase in temperature, and that would further increase snow melt at the surface. And then also there's an overall increase in the latent heat flux. We actually see a decrease in relative humidity, and which results in a decrease in a low cloud fraction. And therefore, also, so therefore, the increase. Solar radiation, and then as well as the snow albedo feedback and the cloud feedback, all works at towards the same direction and increases surface temperature. So the largest, uh, so the most significant signal we see in the modified seasonal deciduous run is actually the increase in surface temperature at the high latitude regions in the pre-growing season, uh, in the pre-growing season period. I should mention that this is also present in the evergreen simulations, uh, but then, uh, but uh, not as significant as we see here in the seasonal deciduous. And this is also the dominant factor at the interannual time scale. Uh, uh, this is also the dominant factor at the interannual time scale for seasonal deciduous. So, so as you can see, see for, uh, for the replace uh, stress deciduous technology runs, uh, you, you will see a, a you will see a significant decrease in surface temperature at the interannual time scale where there is sufficient soil moisture. But then for the uh, modified seasonal deciduous, you will see the dominant factor to uh, the dominant process to be the pre-growing season signal we see. And um, I think clear asked yesterday about how the interannual variability would change. So I looked at this last night. I'm still not sure I entirely understand the results, but we actually see a decrease in the interannual variability in mean surface, in annual mean surface temperature. Uh, and then also uh, that also happens uh, Across, that also happens within each season and then also across a lot of the other energy-related variables. 
And then I also want to briefly touch on uh, the influences on the upper uh, on the upper atmosphere. So what we've also discovered that is that the pre-green season signal we say in the modified signal deciduous run could also result in a significant influence on the upper atmosphere. So here uh, each panel is showing the influences of uh, is showing the differences between the modified between the modified seasonal deciduous phenology run and the control run for each of the variables at the different height in the upper atmosphere. So this is the trend mean uh, this is the trend mean variable and trend is the month we find the most significant influences. So, so as you can, can see, the influences on the potential height and temperature can propagate up to 500 hectopascal or even higher, and then the influences on moisture can uh, go up to 700 hectopascals. Which means that the influences not only uh, which means that phenology not only influences where uh, we modify phenology directly, but it may also influence other regions through uh, Changes in the uh, so changes in the circulation. Uh, so therefore, to conclude, we uh, to conclude that we found both direct and indirect influences through snow albedo feedback and cloud feedback, and then the growing season signal depends a lot on soil moisture availability. But then we also found a significant influence in the in seasonal deciduous uh, phenology in the pre growing season. Uh, in the program season period. And then uh, the discrepancies could have potentially large influences on the mean state of the upper atmosphere and large scale circulations. So thank you for your attention. Uh, I would like to thank my collaborators and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks, Grace. We're going to switch over to in-person presentations, but if there's questions for Grace here, um, Grace, can you stop sharing your screen? Uh, yes. Thanks. Grace, I apologize for double booking you. I didn't realize that you were in the interactions workshop yesterday too. Uh, no, sorry, I, I, I thought, thought last year was a discussion only type of uh, uh, discussion, so that's, that's why I selected both sessions, uh, but yeah. yeah. And then I, you, you scored, you got to do both. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Go Chong. Somebody on Zoom, give Teresa a thumbs up if you're seeing seeing our screen. Okay, great. Um, so switching over to hydrology now, Go Chang is going to talk about improving hydrological performance. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Guo Xiangtang from CGD at Ankar and. Uh, uh, I'm glad to have the opportunity to share our work about uh, improving the hydrological performance of CTSM through parameter optimization and large sample watershed modeling. And first, I'd like to thank the contributions of my co-authors, Andy and Sean, who are also from CGD TSS. And in this work, we try to bring an applied hydrology mindset to the Earth system model development context. And uh, in this slide, uh, just like many other fields, hydrology often use a hydrological model to represent the wor real world processes and model representations require the choices of model structure and the physics and depend on the specification of inputs. But those uh, choices and uh, specifications are inherently uncertain. 
this picture shows the paradigm of the hydrological modeling. So for hydrological models, there are multiple sources of uncertainty, like input uncertainty, structure and parameter uncertainty, and even calibration data uncertainty. And for a complex model, there are often dozens or even hundreds of parameters. So parameter sensitivity analysis is often performed to identify the important processes and parameters. And for those important parameters, we often use parameter optimization to further improve the uh, accuracy and the fidelity of the model. So the model can be really appropriate for actual applications, such as flood monitoring and water resource management and and other applications uh, kind of agree with the actionable science scope. And yeah, so for recent, recently, um, many uh, water re security related projects are exploring the use of CTSM compared to like traditional hydrological models. The applications are in many fields like climate change studies, flood drought, and hydraulic uh, prediction applications. And for this presentation, we try to describe uh, the initial work supporting a climate change project sponsored by USACE. And for this presentation, we will show our uh, first steps, uh, including parameter estimation approaches for CTSM and a large sample small watershed CTSM implementation test bait. And for hydrological model parameter es estimation during the past decades, there are many algorithms and theories have been, uh, that, that have been developed, uh, and uh, there are multiple available packages and uh, tools for parameter sensitivity analysis and parameter optimization. Some examples include uh, Dakota, Ostrich, Spot PY, and uh, many other methods. And in this slide, we will introduce our recent study published on water resources research, which uses uh, one of the popular parameter optimization packages. So for this hydrological modeling study, the meteorological forcing comes from the EM Earth Ensemble Meteorological Dataset, which is also developed by ourselves. And if you want to use this long-term ensemble dataset, just you, you can download it from the link here. And the uh, hydrological model is SUMA, which is a process-based uh, modeling framework allowing uh, many physical uh, options. And the measure out routing model and we select uh, about 300 representative cryosphere basins from a global database of about 19,000 basins. Uh, we select those basins to reduce the com uh, computation cost. And we uh, select the cryosphere basins because they often lack enough ground observations. And uh, the objective of this study is to uh, explore the impact of meteorological forcing. And for this work, we use the ostrich calibration tool and we use the uh, dynamically dimensioned search algorithm. The model outputs are calibrated to stream flow measurement from gauges and remote sensing snow cover from MODIS and AVHRR sensor. And for this work, we just, uh, the calibration design is to preliminary constrain the a priori parameters. We didn't intend to achieve the optimal parameter estimation because that will require too long time. Uh, while our study uh, focused on like exploring the uncertainty, we didn't try to achieve the best model accuracy. Um, but after the limited uh, calibration, we still achieved substantial uh, performance improvement and the median kg values are about 0.6 uh, for both calibration and validation periods. So that in inspired us to develop, um, develop the CTSM parameter optimization uh, workflow. Uh, so the CTSM workflow is actually more complex and uh, contains more functionalities compared to the hydrological model calibration workflow uh, because CTSM is a uh, uh, more complex model and uh, requires longer time to run. So it has many specific designs. And the first uh, step of the workflow is like data preparation for just like uh, any other study. And the following four steps build the calibration structure for the CTSM model, including building the model, generating the calibration setting, and uh, generating the forcing subsets and the model spin up. So uh, the workflow is written in Python controlled by one configuration file, and the workflow is totally automatic. All data and settings can be generated by submitting one job, 
And this is designed for large sample watershed modeling because we need to run the workflow hundreds of times and we don't want many manual adjustment or modification during these processes. This makes the workflow have the advantage of reproducibility and usability. Uh, we, we think this will be useful to the community if uh, anybody wants to like do similar parameter estimation work, uh, just following the workflow and uh, prepare the data and everything will be completed uh, automatically. And the last step is to submit uh, the calibration job. And currently we have two tools, Ostrich and uh, the MOSMO, which will be introduced in the following slides. And in the future, we will also explore the machine learning and deep learning techniques like the differential learning, which has been popular in the uh, hydrological modeling community. Okay, uh, I will introduce a few components of the calibration workflow because they help, they help understand how the workflow works. And uh, uh, this slide shows uh, data preparation uh, concerning the parameter list. This spider shows uh, like of course, we need a list of parameters to, to define what we want to calibrate, uh, the parameter range, which, uh, what, uh, what is the source of the parameter and what method we want to use, and also the binding parameters. So for some parameters, if their values change, some other parameters also need to change accordingly. So uh, the workflow provides those functionalities. And this slide shows the ostrich toolbox we use for this experiment. And we also use the DDS algorithm. This algorithm is simple, but useful when the iteration is limited. So for complex models, uh, we, we cannot really run the model for a very, very long time and many iterations. So this algorithm could be useful. And the forcing subset uh, component, this is important for large sample, uh, small watershed modeling because we, don't, we, 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 will tr we try to avoid uh, time spent on reading and processing the forcing, which is often contained in large domain fires. So for those small watersheds, uh, the time consuming could be quite considerable. So the workflow can automatically subset the forcing and uh, perform the time merging, which can reduce the fire numbers. This is useful if you have hundreds of basins. And uh, our test bed is the CAMOS basins. This is a comprehensive data set containing um, more than 600 United States catchments. Uh, in the future, we may expand to global basins, but now we use the CAMOS as the test space. The CAMOS de test uh, data set has been widely used uh, recently, particularly in the machine learning uh, research because the CAMOS data set provides all the data needed by data-driven models, so you can just use it and build machine learning models easily. You don't need to worry about data format, preparation, anything else. And for our preliminary, uh, preliminary test, uh, we select about 10% of the basins because the workflow is still in the development stage and we don't really want to run all the basins. The objective function is uh, modified KGE and we only assign like one CPU and 12 hours because this is the test. We want to see if the workflow can really work and uh, output some reasonable results. So uh, this results in about 40 trials per person. So this is a very small number for calibration. Normally there we, we need like hundreds of trials or even more, but uh, the results show we still see the improvement in CTSM performance. The KG increases in 66 out of 67 basins and the median KG improves uh, by about 0.2. And this slide shows two example basins. The KG increases and, uh, and if we look at the stream flow curves, we can also see notable improvement. For example, for the first curve, if we look at the green curve from the row parameter, we can find there are many zero stream flow values which doesn't agree with the observed curve. And after the calibration, those zero uh, values are removed. And uh, for the PDF curve shown on the right side, uh, if we compare the red and uh, blue curves, we can see uh, the calibration does improve the distribution of the KG values. Okay, so after we finish the ostrich-based uh, calibration, we move to the multi-objective emulation-based optimization. So for this work, we use the MOSMO algorithm because it allows parallel compu computation and it allows multi-objective calibration. 
okay, so this is a workflow for each basin. We have a control task, and then we have like hundreds of uh, initial parameters. We run the model, and then we train the surrogate model, and we apply the multi-objective optimization algorithm to the surrogate model and select some Pareto parameters, and then we run the model again, and update the surrogate model, and repeat this process until we uh, reach the stop criteria. So all those work is done automatically. What you need to do is, ju is to just to run the workflow and then submit the job and all the th uh, those steps will be finished automatically. So this uh, figure shows uh, initial outputs and example using random forest as the surrogate model. And we can see like after a few iterations, the performance does improve. But uh, one challenge for large sample hydrology is that we need to, we need to train hundreds of emulators for different uh, basins. And uh, uh, how to ensure all the emulators perform well in all those basins uh, is an issue that we need to tackle in the study. So here is a summary slide, and we developed a stream, the line CDSM calibration workflow and uh, the hydrology test bed. And there are like, many future development uh, possibilities like the parallel computation, parameter refinement, uh, and this list is known. And uh, if you have any question, uh, like just contact us. And uh, uh, yeah, I will leave this as the last slide. Thank you. question and this is great uh, so when uh, the CTSM runs does it run for each watershed individually or uh, does it run at the US or the global scale and then you get the output and then you assess it uh, using the individual watershed uh, sorry uh, uh, can you repeat the question for each watershed do you run the CTSM separately or uh, yeah, globally? Yeah, right. Uh, we run it separately because we want the workflow can be easily transferred to any study region. So each basin is treated as a separate uh, domain. And uh, the, the goal is that you just need to provide the shape file of the basin and some basic files like the parameter list, and then the workflow will do everything for you. So each basin is independent. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, I'm curious about the surface data set and do you provide, I'm assuming these are SP runs, and so then you do provide, like how do you, I, I always struggle like the hill slope model, how do you put vegetation on the hill slope intelligently? Uh, so for the surface data set, we still like use the default surface data set from CTSM, we didn't uh, adjust uh, the structure, so we use, uh, we use the tool provided by CTSM to generate the surface data set. And for the update, we just uh, like uh, update the value uh, in that net CDF file, so we didn't uh, look into how like uh, the parameter, the, 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 how those parameters can be better performed in this circumstance. Awesome to see. Um, switch over, but Hisham, am I saying your name right? Are they remote? Oh, I missed the memo on that, sorry. Um, uh, yep, great. Am I doing this right? All right. Uh, can, can you hear me? me? Yep, yeah, we can. You want to go ahead and share your screen? Okay, okay great. great. Yep. Can you see, see my, my screen, screen now? now? Yep, that's great. Okay, okay, okay. Thanks. Well, thanks. Okay, thanks, thanks everyone, everyone for uh, attending this session and my presentation as well. Uh, I'm a postdoc at the Pacific Northwest National Lab and presenting today a part of uh, our work in, on uncertainty analysis. Uh, this is a part of the IMF3 project, Integrated Multi-Sector, Multi-Scale Modeling Project at uh, PNNL. 
Um, and my presentation is more about um, looking at the contribution of the forcing uncertainty as compared to the parametric uncertainty in the community land model simulations. Uh, specifically focusing on the, the, the simulations of the runoff over, over the clones. So as I said, the, the, the primary research objective is how does the forcing and permitting uncertainty can influence the key, uh, the key head logic processes across the different time scales and over, over the entire clones. And as, as presented in the, in the other I see in the previous presentation as well as different sources of uncertainty in land surface models in general include the, the model structure, the model input forcing, and also the model uh, parameters. For, for the work, I'm, for my work, I'm, I focus in the last two, and during my presentation, I focus more on the, the input forcing data sets and also the model uh, parameters. Here is the framework uh, I follow for this study. Uh, uh, we, as I said, we we try to uh, to focus more on the forcing input and the, the model parameters for the community land model, the CLM. Uh, we use the CLM version five and running this model for ten years, from two thousand five to two thousand fourteen. And then uh, for the model model outputs, we have different head logic signatures, including runoff, ETs, or SWE. But uh, as I said, we will just be focusing on the runoff. Um, uh, so, so back to the forcing input, we have uh, included, currently we have the four forcing data sets included. We, we initially started with NLDAS2, uh, also another data set that's driven by ERA5, and uh, we use a WARF model to down, dynamically downscale this uh, reanalysis data. We have also living at the temperature, so we have the, the, the five, five different forcing data sets <laughs> uh, ingested into the CLM model uh, and the model parameterization how to how to address the uncertainty here <clears throat> we use uh, first the default parameters that come with the model and we also use ensembles of parameter sets uh, my colleague he presented yesterday his, his work uh, Hong Chang he uh, also just published this paper on the ensemble uh, large ensemble evaluation of hydrologic parameter uncertainty. Uh, so he uh, he he did uh, the run the CIM simulations for uh, more than uh, or about fifteen hundred ensemble runs using the Latin hypercube sampling algorithm. So generating this this uh, fifteen hundred ensemble runs for uh, the, the the five forcing data sets that we are we are using. And then, as I said, the model outputs, we only focus on the runoff uh, and comparing the CLM outputs with the USGS. Uh, we are planning in the future to include other signatures like ET or SWE or the total user storage as well. And then the evaluation we did is based on different metrics. Uh, I'll focus here, for example, on KGE, uh, the clean blockchain efficiency metric, and also the total volume bias and the, the transformer root mean square error. So I will show some metrics, uh, but I'm not going to show all the evaluation metrics we used. And then the, the last step is uncertainty analysis. And we did it here uh, using the 2A ANOVA. So we used the, the ANOVA test to uh, address the uncertainty using the ratio, a ratio between the sum of the squares to the sum of the total squares and how this can explain the uncertainty in the uh, parameters versus the the the, the, the forcing uh, so the selection of forcing data sets. So here is a here is a uh, the maps showing the uh, the uncertainty uh, index based on the ANOVA. And as I said, this uncertainty index is just a ratio between the sum of the squares for the forcing. Uh, I mean, if I, if I focus on the forcing, then I, I just calculate the sum of the squares of the forcing to the total sum of squares. If I focus on the parameters, which is the left, uh, sorry, the right panel, it's the sum of squares of the parameters. I mean, again, based on the ensemble runs we, we generated with CLM uh, divided by the total sum of the squares. And you can see here the map. I mean, each point here is representing the camels basin. So we did this analysis over the columns using the camel basin data set. Uh, maybe most of you are familiar with data, this data set, but 
it's it's a uh, uh, it's it's a data set that provides the hydrologic and also climatic information about the uh, the, the different basins over the uh, over the corners, but these basins are mostly headwater basins, so they are not impacted by any water management in the in the in the downstream, and so the 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 flow in these basins are mostly considered as naturalized flow. And so back to these spatial maps, we can see here in the on the right panel, this is the percentage of forcing uncertainty uh, using the KGE of daily stream flow. So the metric we use here is the KGE, and we can see in most of the cases. Uh, the 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 uncertainty index is, is very low and it's 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 this is a color is blue which means it's mostly uh, has a very low contribution for the forcing uh, from the forcing uh, uncertainty and this this metric uh the uncertainty index ranges between zero and hundred if it goes up to hundred means like it has more impact from the uh the uncertainties that is considered if it goes down to low to around zero, it means it has less uh, contribution to the uncertainty. The picture is different for the parametric uncertainty. We can see for the KGE of the daily stream flow, in most of the basins, they have a higher contribution for the, uh, the uncertainty. So uh, the, the conclusion um, we made here for the sentences here, for example, is that the parametric uncertainty contributes to the most variance in the daily stream KGE. Uh, I'm just, I'm just trying, trying to highlight here some of the of the regions. Uh, the region, for example, in the Pacific Northwest, Northwest uh, sorry, and, and the, the region, region also uh, uh, along the, the Rockies Rocky Mountains. Mountains. So, so if, if we, we focus, focus, for example, on the uh, the, the, the the Pacific, Pacific Northwest, Northwest uh, uh, region, we can, we can see here. I mean, I'm showing two different metrics. So I'm just trying to zoom into one region and see how the different metrics can. Uh, provide a different uh, or produce different results for the the source of the source of uncertainty. So the panel on the left is showing the total volume bias, which is uh, which is an important matrix probably for those who are interested in water balance applications or reservoir management, for example. So the percentage of forcing uncertainty versus here the percentage of permitting uncertainty, we can see that in most of the basins here in the Pacific Northwest is more uh, uh, driven by the, the forcing uncertainty or the selection of the forcing data sets rather than being uh, uh, driven by the parametric uncertainty, which we can see here with most of the the, the UCI uncertainty index is, is higher, more than 60%. Uh, as I said, the, 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 the selection of the metric is important and if, it, if, if the application or whoever is interested in using CLM uh, is interested in uh, looking, looking at, at the, the low flow, then a metric, metric like transform and root mean spread error can indicate how the CLM performs in terms of uh, simulating the low flow. And then here you can see the picture is different because here we can see that the parametric uncertainty um, is more dominant and it's driving the CLM simulations or the uncertainty in the CLM simulations. Also looking at different flow regimes. So uh, here we we splitted the the stream flow into different regimes uh, based on the quantiles. Uh, from for example, a low flow can be uh, represented here by low quantiles from zero to ten, or high flows can be represented by uh, high quantiles from ninety to hundred. Uh, so if you just focus on these two as an examples, we can see that in in the low quantile flow, which again. Uh, Matches what we we have seen on the uh, on the previous slides are more dominant by the uh, the 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 the, uh, the sorry this is actually the the percentage of forcing to the parametric so when it's low it means that like it has less impact from the forcing uncertainty so the percentage here is mostly very low which means uh, it's dominant by the, uh, the 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 selection of the parameter rather than the forcing. Uh, when it is uh, for while for higher quantiles, we can see the percentage between the forcing to parameter is very is very high, which means like the forcing or uh, the selection of the forcing data set is more important for the higher high quantiles. Uh, the box plot I'm showing here on the left, it's just uh, clustering the basins over the over the cones into different regions. For example, when I I mentioned in the last slide, we are uh, 
in the previous slide, I showed for the Pacific Northwest, for example, uh, the, the basins which are clustered in the Pacific Northwest. So here is, is, is showing this how the low quantized or the high quantized perform for, for the different clusters. And we can see like for uh, for the case of the Great Plains, most of the basins here, they are more driven by the forcing uncertainty rather than uh, the, 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 or I mean, I'm sorry, but in the in the upper plan for the low quantized, most of the percentage is below 100, which means like the parametric uncertainty is more uh, dominant or driving the CLM simulations. And again, if you look at the high quantized, most of the percentage for all the clusters or all the regions, we can see that the, the percentage is above 100, which means the parametric, the, the selection of the forcing is more important than the, uh, the uncertainty in the parameters. So the, the conclusion from this slide is that the forcing uncertainty is mo most influential at the higher uh, quantiles. So I will end with some concluding remarks. As we said, as I said, the dominant source of uncertainty is dependent on the hydrologic signature and also the evaluation metric. Uh, I mean, here by the signature, it's uh, the runoff uh, versus, for example, uh, ET or something. But also, evaluation metric is important as it, as as we have seen the using the total volume bias for water bias application is different from using the KG, which can provide the KG can provide more. Uh, information about the, the, the dynamics of the uh, of the flow curve. Uh, so, so selecting both of them is important to decide which, what, which source is more dominant in, in, in controlling the uncertainty. The second is like the uncertainty in lower stream flow quantized is, is dominated by the parameter uncertainty, while forcing the uncertainty contributes more to the higher stream flow quantized. Uh, the next step we are trying now to quantify the uncertainty in the simulations for other land surface, surface variables, variables, this includes uh, the speed, the uh, snow water equivalent, the ET evapotranspiration, and also the total water, uh, total water storage. Uh, I think I'll stop here. If there is any questions, uh, just want to acknowledge that, again, this work is supported by the IM3 project at PNNL. Thank you. Katie, do you want to go ahead and ask? Thanks for your talk. Um, so do you have thoughts on why uh, the uncertainty uh, parameterization shifts or shifts to more forcing uncertainty at higher flow values versus the low flow values? Is it related to precipitation forcing or, or have you thought about that? Yeah, yeah we have flow that uh, some, some basins. basins. So, so I zoomed on some, some of the basins, basins and looking at which, which variables are more uh, impacting, impacting that, that and we see like the precipitation from the forcing data, data from, from the forcing variables is the one that's uh, more, more controlling this uncertainty. uncertainty. Plus, Plus also in some ba other basins, basins short wave radiation is another important variable. And so it's short wave uh, radiation is reflecting also into the evapotranspiration. Thanks. Yeah, go ahead, Sanjeev. So my question is, uh, how independent are these forcing data set? And if they are not very independent, then if you had to use a downscale large ensemble data set as a forcing data set, then whether your conclusion would be different. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, thanks for, for the, the question. question. Um, I, I think, think these data, data sets, sets we, we, we selected, selected based on the, the like, like, you know, the, the hydrogen community, community are mostly using, using this. Uh, this is the so most commonly used, used in the hydrology community, community using LDAS or WARF or something. Uh, but they are mostly, I believe, they are independent in LDAS versus the RIA. I mean, it's produced based on a RIA analysis from NSEP, uh, as far as I, I remember, which is different from the ERA RIA analysis data set that we use. And then we have the LIMA. It's also based on another RIA analysis data set from NSEP, but a different version. And then the prism and they are more relying on uh, gauge data sets. So they are not that uh, uh, linked or dependent. Uh, however, I think one, one thing we have found when looking more into these different data sets, because we did this aggregation or downscaling of the, 
of the Levin and Prism and the three data sets are provided at the daily scale, so we have to go down to the hourly scale and we use we use a meteorological simulator, it's called the Metsan, uh, to downscale this data set. And we found here some dependency between this uh, between the, the variables that we are producing at our data set. And they behave a little different from NLDAS and WARF, which are provided at hourly, hourly scale. Uh, we mentioned that in the paper that we are trying to prepare now, but uh, this is one, one thing we have to consider, that uh, the, the dependency in the the downscaling method that we are using for the different forcing data sets. Uh, I think the other question is if we are just using the, the instant runs. The paper I'm trying to publish this year is only based on NLDAS, uh, but which data set to, to choose between the five? Uh, I, don't, I don't have an exact answer for, for this question. Uh, I mean, the, we can say like using the, the best forcing data sets, which is based on engaged, probably that we trust more. Uh, but with that combination with the different parameters, I think we need to do that evaluation. The runoff evaluation was for, for different data sets. I, I did this evaluation with the five data sets and uh, using the, the, the calibrated parameters and also using the default parameters. And uh, I haven't found like uh, any of the data sets is performing best over the components. In each region, like, like these clusters, clusters I mentioned, uh, there is a different data set that can perform uh, better than the other. And again, based on the, which metric we are using for uh, evaluating the calibration. Um, maybe when you stop sharing your screen, Andy then can ask a question. Cool. Great, yeah, I, I, thanks for the talk. I had a quick follow-up, sort of similar line of questioning. I'm struck by the asymmetry between the sort of small ad hoc forcing collection that is representing forcing uncertainty and the large Monte Carlo sample of parameters. And it seems like, I wonder if there's any kind of um, a criteria you can use to determine how large to make the ensembles or the uncertainty on either side. You know, if you ran the Monte Carlo with twice as many, you know, uh, elements or half as many, that would control the uncertainty on that side. And then if you used a true ensemble data set on the forcing side, that would obviously lead to larger uncertainty. So, I mean, is there a rationale that can be put forward to determine what the true or, or what a realistic measure of uncertainty on each of these um, sides are that you're comparing? Yeah, yeah thank, thank you, you for that. The, um, yeah, yeah, I, I think, think that's, that's true, and we are we have been, been thinking, thinking of doing, doing a behavioral, behavioral analysis. analysis. So, so uh, behavioral analysis, analysis, we are we mean here to try to uh, uh, limit, limit or reduce, reduce a little bit the ensemble runs because, as I said, uh, statistically we have only from one factor, which is a forcing only five forcing data set, but for uh, for the parameter we have like uh, more than or about fifteen hundred. So. Yeah, thanks for for this comment. But we, yeah, we are thinking of this doing this kind of behavior analysis so that we reduce down the number runs and see how this can impact the results in terms of the uncertainty. Great, thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next speaker is in the building. Um, Win theory traveled a long way to get here. Can you guys see this online? Yeah, great. Thanks. Hi everyone, um, my name is Wim Thierry from the University of Brussels in Belgium. Uh, happy to be here, great to see you all in person. Um, I'll be presenting some of the work that um, my team and I have been doing over the past couple of years, um, leading to anthropizing CLM's water cycle. <clears throat> and I wasn't sure if anthropizing is a real English word, but I looked it up and it is. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, if, if you're developing a global land surface model, then you can look at some of the other models, what they are doing, and um, you can try to find out what the other models are representing. And from this, you can kind of build like a, like a common understanding of what is like an ideal global hydrological model or an ideal land surface model. And in terms of hydrology, this would then be typically the processes that you would expect. That would be in the model in terms of uh, vertical, vertical water fluxes and vertical water exchanges. And, uh, and, and, and more broadly also incorporating for human water management, I think is some, something that global hydrological models are, are increasingly doing. And um, in, um, 
in the study. Um, oh, this is not the latest version, but um, there's a paper by Camelia Teltu uh, published in, uh, in GMD uh, last year, wherein we actually compare all the re all the the equations and harmonize all the equations that are being used in all of these models. So, if you're interested how CLM is representing certain fluxes compared to other models, you can have a look at that that study. Um, and in this follow-up study that, that of which you see the results here, we are uh, like turning this into diagrams. And this is our diagram of our ideal global hydrological model. So, all the processes that you that you hope that the global hydrological model uh, represents. Now, in reality, there's none of these models in the community that, that represent all of these processes that are shown here. But then what we do is for each of the models uh, that are out there and that are contributing to EasyMIP, we are graying out the processes that are not represented. And if you do that for CLM, this is uh, CLM5, this is how it looks like. So you see that in the, in the vertical, there's actually a lot of processes on the left here that are uh, represented in the model much more and much more complex compared to the other models in the community. But then if you look on the right, you can see that there is some areas grayed out and notably in the part of the, the human, direct human interference with uh, the terrestrial water cycle. Um, for example, um, reservoirs are typically uh, not represented in the model. There is no um, transient lake area. There is no management uh, of, of, of dams um, in the model uh, at the moment. Secondly, there is an irrigation parameterization uh, in there, and if you look at it, if you compare it to other Earth systems, it's actually uh, the first model to, to, to represent it. Uh, but if you look at it from, uh, from a perspective of global hydrological models, there, it's still a quite uh, relatively simple parameterization, which is building off on soil moisture um, deficits, but just taking the water from the river and basically applying it to the land surface. And then thirdly, the model is, is not representing um, like sectoral water use outside of agriculture, for example, there is no domestic uh, domestic water use, no livestock water use, and no uh, industrial water use for electricity production and uh, manufacturing. So, in our group at uh, in Brussels, we have been trying to to address uh, some of these um, gaps uh, in the model by developing parameterizations that can be included in here. And so, I'll be going over them now very quickly. So uh, in the first uh, work by, by Ine van der Keele, um, we were looking at um, dynamic lake area expansion or reservoir expansion. If you look at this animation, you can see that there has been a great expansion across the 20th century in terms of reservoir uh, capacity, but also associated area, especially in the 1950s and 60s. And you have global data sets that, that provide information on this. So what Ine did is um, made the lake area uh, transient in the model so that it can uh, evolve over time and incorporate this grand data set uh, in, into the model. And after she did that, she did some coupled experiments, uh, F-concept F experiments from 1980 to 2014 at one degree, run five ensemble members, uh, done simulations with and without uh, reservoir, um, reservoirs present, and then look at some of the effects on the climate. And you can see, for example, that uh, reservoir expansion or reservoirs um, reduce the journal temperature range, uh, the, the, the cool daytime temperatures and the warm nighttime temperatures. But you also see that these effects are quite localized uh, in the irrigated areas. If you look at this um, from, um, from a monthly perspective, you can see that especially during the warm season, there is a reduction of journal temperature range, especially in those pixels that are uh, particularly uh, heavy in terms of, um, in terms of reservoir uh, extent. So from this, we can conclude that, uh, well, that irrigation expansion dampens the journal temperature uh, range, but it also mutes temperature extremes. It warms cold extremes and it cools warm ex uh, streams. Um, but the results are very much localized um, to the effect, to, to, to pixels with uh, dam extent where these effects can be substantial. So the next step is to account for dam management. And to, um, the reason why this matters is because of this particular example and many other uh, reservoirs across the world. Bumiboy uh, Dam in Thailand, where you can look at the observed time series of inflow. And so here is the inflow. We can see a strong seasonal pattern uh, in the inflow time series. But then if you look at the outflow measurements, you basically see that the seasonal cycle is completely reversed. So if you don't account for this uh, reservoir management um, in, in, in cases like this, you completely miss the seasonal cycle. 
So what we did is we implemented, and that's often what we are doing. We are we are looking at uh, at the other models in the community and taking some of their parameterizations and implementing them here. So in this case, Ina implemented the uh, H08 reservoir uh, management parameterization um, into Miseroute, and then conducted a few experiments with um, yeah different settings here. And if you look at the local, the local simulations that she did where she feeds Miseroute with observed um, reservoir inflow variables, and we looked at 26 individual reservoirs here, um, we can see that actually including, accounting for dam management substantially improves the scale of the routing model. So orange is here to run with, um, with the parameterization, with the reservoir management parameterization, green is the one without. And the more you go to the right, the higher scale you get. So really very clear added value of accounting for dam management when it comes to simulating uh, stream flow in these managed uh, catchments. Next step was to do global scale uh, land only simulations uh, where we took a runoff coming from CTSM uh, forced by crew NSAP and then feeding that uh, into Miseroute. And here the results are, were much different. And so we didn't really find this very clear added value. And, as, and we were then started digging into this and we, we found out that there's actually a substantial uh, runoff bias in CLM and this has sparked some further up uh, research in the community. So third was focusing on irrigation techniques. Um, as I said, there is a, 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 a basic irrigation parameterization originally pioneering, but potentially uh, potential there to improve it. And so what Yi Yao did is we, to split uh, this up into four different techniques. So accounting for explicitly for drip irrigation, flood irrigation, sprinkler irrigation, and paddy irrigation. And so for each of these irrigation techniques, there is different places where you can uh, implement the water, apply the water, but also different quantities to apply it. And so um, these different irrigation methods, they differentiate between uh, the irrigation trigger, so when to irrigate, how much water to apply, uh, um, whether you aim for this target soil moisture, which is currently in the model, or whether you aim to saturate the soil, um, where the water is applied under or over the cap canopy and whether you account for water ponding in the case of uh, rice, in case of paddy irrigation, we have using these small little walls where you aim to uh, pond water over the surface. And so if you implement those techniques in the model, you can again do runs um, in land only in this case, where you can look at the effects of these irrigation techniques on the land surface fluxes, here showing that irrigation increases the latent heat flux and reduces the sensible heat flux. So I'm going quickly over this, but he is doing his entire PhD on this topic, and he will present a, to uh, a talk tomorrow, so I invite you to have a look at that. Um, fourth, we have been imp implementing water, uh, sexual water use in CLM, and this is work by uh, doctoral researcher Sabine Taranu in, in our group and we have been, what we have been doing here is taking an input data set of uh, sexual water demand coming from the GCAM model, so from an, integ from an integrated assess model and provide that as input um, into CLM and basically you get, so you get livestock water demand, manufacturing water demand and so on. And so what we implemented is, is this hierarchy of water uses, so a competition between sectors for water, whereby um, some sectors are, have priority, get priority, and domestic is the most important, followed by livestock, electricity, uh, and so on, irrigation being the last to receive water. So if, so if, for example, domestic and livestock use up all the water, then the other sectors won't get water, even though they, they would like to get some. So what do we do? We take the water from the, from the river and from the routing model, in this case, Mozart, and then apply the water. Um, well, some of it is, is going back as, as return flow. We call it water recycling, going back to the, to the river outing model. And another part, so the consumed part, is being applied to the land surface and there it's allowed to um, evaporate. Um, and so when, we, when you do that, when you implement that and you run that in, in CLM5, you can quantify the, the, the total unmet demand. So there is a demand, that's the input data, but then you can check given water availability in the model, which fraction of that demand is either met or unmet. And if you look at the year 2010, you can look here in red uh, in the quantity of water which is requested but is not what the model cannot su supply because the water is not available. And so you get these, these, these water, hard, water scarcity hotspots coming from multi-sectoral water use that you can now uh, represent in CLM5. And, and here are the spatial patterns that you can see here. And, and, and why, the reason why you have all these green uh, um, 
circles and ellipses around is because it really matches quite nicely with this assessment from the uh, World Resources Institute of Global Water Scarcity Hotspots. So, so qualitatively, at least spatially, we can reproduce now in the model those, um, those spatial water scarcity hotspots. And so, yeah, this has been, this is, these are the developments that we've been doing uh, in the team and, and um, the lake area expansion is already uh, in the source code for the others. I mean, and, and the, the reservoir management is implemented in Miseroute. So when the coupling of Miseroute comes, this will become available for the irrigation and sectoral water use. We have pull requests up there and we are, we are queuing uh, for, for inclusion in the model. But at some point, this will, be, this will become part of the source code. And then, uh, yeah, hopefully you will be able to use it if, you, if you're interested in that. The question you can now ask is, yeah, sure, but why, why would you care about this? Because we're an Earth system model and we want to represent the climate system. So, so why, why does this even matter to have all of these developments? And I want to give, towards the end of my talk, two reasons why I think this matters. And the first reason is that it matters for climate feedbacks. Um, what do you do if you want to have the effect of irrigation on the climate system? You run an if, uh, a simulation with and without that effect. And so that's what I did in my postdoc, ran CSM with and without irrigation, and then looked at the effect of, on climate. So if you look at the effects on two meter air temperature, you basically see there's hardly any effect. So yeah, why, why do we do it then? Why do we need it? Well, the reason is this. If you look at TXX, so the warmest day of the year, you can actually see a very strong effect. With an average 0.8 degrees Celsius cooling from irrigation over irrigated areas and locally up to three degrees of cooling during the warmest day of the year. So this, this is quite a big signal. So we need to incorporate this to get the climate response to land, land use and uh, land management uh, correctly. Now the next step is that you can actually compare this to other climate forcing. So we are, we are in a climate crisis where greenhouse gas emissions have been causing global warming. And an analysis that you probably have seen before is how global warming may lead to the increased probability of, of hot extremes. And so we calculated this with CSM by doing some extra experiments in the early um, 20th century. And then we calculated the probability ratio, so the change in probability between the early 20th century and today in terms of hot extremes. And so this is the 99th percentile of daily maximum temperature considering all four things except irrigation. So we're essentially seeing greenhouse gas signal here causing almost everywhere across the world the probability of hot extremes to increase. increase. So this we know already, right? From IPCC reports and from earlier work with the model and with CMIP, from CMIP data. But then what we can do is we can also do this for, this, for irrigation expansion. And for irrigation expansion, it turns out that irrigation expansion over the 20th century has caused a reduction in the probability of hot extremes. But in contrast to the, all forcing, to the other forcings, this effect is really very much localized to these irrigation hotspots. Notice how the Edingogenetic Plain in, in, uh, in South Asia is, is popping up, but you can ev even see the Nile on these global, global maps, which is quite remarkable. So the next step is to take these two maps together, and then you have the all forcings experiment. And what you can see here is that if you consider all forcings, it's still the greenhouse gas and aerosol uh, forcings that are dominating. But you can also see that over these irrigated irrigation hotspots, something interesting uh, is happening with uh, notably in South Asia, uh, a, a reversal of the signal in some parts. So if we then focus on that irrigation hotspot and we look at um, Pakistan, India, Nepal, and Bangladesh, and we take the spatial median of this area, we can get the spatial median probability ratio. And this value is two, which means that a one in 100 day uh, event is now a one in 50 day event. So, it's, um, so it became twice as likely the event as a consequence of uh, all four things except irrigation. And we can not only do this for the 99th percentile, we can do this for a range of percentiles. And then you get this result, whereby you find a scaling, whereby the more extreme you go, the further in the tail you go, the higher the probability ratio, so the stronger the increase is. This is related to, um, well, a, a statistical artifact, so the more you go into the tails, the, the easier you can get strong probability ratios. But in, the, in addition, we know that um, there's also some moisture temperature coupling effects playing here, um, and the extremes are responding faster as a consequence of that. Now, you can do this for all four things, but you can also do this for irrigation expansion. And then you get these results. So opposite to what we have been seeing for the other forcings. And then if you take the two effects together, 
you actually see that there's hardly any change. So irrigation expansion has effectively been masking warming from greenhouse gases across South Asia when it comes to, to temperature extremes. And so this is why it matters to have these, uh, these, these processes represented in the model. Now, the second reason why I think it's important to represent water management in, in CLM is because CLM is not only the, a land component in the Earth system model. It is increasingly becoming a full-blown climate change impact model. And um, ISIMIP is an international collaboration whereby different impact modelers run their impact model in um, a pre-agreed protocol, just like CMIP, and where, th where they can then quantify climate change impacts across uh, a range of sectors. And I've been running CLM uh, 4.5 for ISIMIP 2, and we're currently in the process of running CLM 5 for ISIMIP 3. And this, what is really nice about this is that you can quantify climate change impacts across a range of sectors. For example, we, have, we provided a data set, we developed a data set uh, led by Stif, works led by Stefan Lange, looking at the land area annually exposed to, to, to extremes, to climate extremes, including wildfires, crop failures, droughts, river floods, heat waves, and tropical cyclones. And you can now compare these, these different impacts to each other. And that's what's really nice. So what I've done in a study building on this data set is to calculate the total number of extreme events that you will experience across your lifetime, from the year you're born till the year you die. And so this, is the, this, is, this can be achieved by combining climate data on the one hand and demographic data on the other hand. So here's the results for heat waves. For every combination of birth year or, or age in 2020 on the x-axis, and global warming level, oh, so these colors look really horrible here. Sorry about that and global warming level on the y-axis, we can find a color. Here it's, here it's purple and red, but <laughs> sorry about that. But you can find a color, you, which you can look up on that color bar, and this gives you what I call an exposure multiplication factor. So how many more heat waves you will experience across your lifetime compared to living in a world without climate change? And we can do this for each of these six extreme event categories. And now you find that the color scale goes from one to four for all the extreme events, except for heat waves, where it goes from 1 to 30. And you can see that qualitatively, the results are similar in the sense that the younger you are and the higher the warming level, the stronger your lifetime extreme event exposure. You also see that there's very little color difference in the vertical for generations older than 50, which means that for those generations, the future warming level matters very little in terms of their lifetime extreme event exposure. But the younger you are, the stronger the difference in the vertical. And in other words, the more the warming level determines your lifetime extreme event exposure. The more you lose when we go to higher warming levels, but the more you win when we increase our ambition and limit global warming. Now, I want to give just one example here. And this is the example of my oldest son. So my oldest son was six years old in 2020. And if you look at this generation of six-year-olds, they will experience under a three degree warming pathway twice as many wildfires, twice as many tropical cyclones, three times as many river floods, four times as many crop failures, five times as many droughts, and 36 times as many heat waves compared to living in a world without climate change. And this is for a three degree pathway. If you realize that under current policies, we're heading towards 2.7 degrees and three degrees being in the uncertainty range, this is actually something which is on the table today. One final thing to highlight here, are these gray lines. These gray lines are what we identify as thresholds for living an unprecedented life. If you're to the right or above this gray line, you will live an unprecedented life. And we, we define you living an unprecedented life as having less than 1,000 chance, one in 10,000 chance of experiencing that many extreme events in a pre-industrial control climate. So you're above the P99.99. The P what you can see is that there is no gray line in the middle column here for crop failures and heat waves. And this is because for heat waves and crop failures, every generation born since 1960, under every global warming level, will live an unprecedented exposure to crop failures and heat waves. If you're under 40, you will, in addition, live an unprecedented lifetime in terms of exposure to droughts in the upper right corner and river floods in the lower left corner. And this even under the 1.5 degree warming pathway, which is the most ambitious of all climate scenarios. 
And so from this work, we can only conclude that we must limit global warming to one and a half degrees to safeguard the future of current young generations. And from a modeling perspective, we have to conclude that it's worth to improve our model to develop CLM so that it can properly assess climate change impacts and help to produce information like this. I thank you for your attention. I have an online question real quick. Um, how is the prioritization of the sectoral water usage determined? Is this universal globally? This was, yeah, so this, good question. So this was based on expert judgment. So we have just defined this order. And so this is basically hard coded in the model. Um, and of course, well, we didn't really find any information, but we were just making this expert judgment that, well, if there's shortage of water, well, who is cut first? The farmers for irrigation, who is cut last? That's the households. So um, just expert judgment. But of course, if there is data, you can quite easily swap, swap the order um, in the model if you would like to do that later on. Maybe one question. Then. Actually, Sanji, can we let, I don't know your name, I'm sorry. Yeah, can you come to the mic? Yeah. Uh, I was just curious if you've um, considered uh, adding retention ponds into the model, because I know, and I'm not sure to what extent how flooding is modeled here, if you're able to model the stream flow through the river routing models. But I know in the water basin where I live, you would expect there to be more flooding with the more extreme precipitation. And the reason why there's not is not necessarily because of dams, it's because I've been talking to water managers about this, because there's so many retention ponds that have been built over the years. So, I mean, for, in terms of, the, in terms of the, the, the reservoir management, the dam management, we have been taking the grand data set, which is actually a global data set, but only of the largest reservoirs. So it's, I, I, it's a couple of thousand reservoirs. I don't know exactly how many. I don't remember if it was 3,000 or 7,000, but it's the largest dams that you have that we now incorporate in Miseroute as, as, as vectors. I mean, Miseroute is vector-based, so it's like segments that are now in the river um, where you then apply apply this management. So what you these check dams? I guess you're referring to these check dams, for example, and yeah, non-dam related retention ponds. So, yeah. so smaller things that is, take up is, a lot of area. This is not in the model at the moment, but it is important. Yeah, yeah it could be and important it, for yeah, some Yeah, I, I guess for floods, it's for floods. It really it really matters. Yeah. yeah, and for irrigation, we have been using so for the for the for the paddy for the paddy irrigation, we have been using this. There is this surface ponding schemes, these puddles, surface puddles, right? And we have been using that that as an inspiration for developing the paddy. Uh, so there you have you do have small ponds right. in the rice fields. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Uh, the last speaker of the session is Charlie. He's going to give us an update on land use change and fates. Thanks, everybody, uh, and thanks, William. That's a hard talk to follow uh, emotionally. Um, and yeah, so uh, I just want to talk about um, up updates on land use and change. Just also warning, like, the, so there's no results here. This is all just sort of schematics of what we've done, what we've just recently gotten working, and then what we want to do next. Um, and then I want, I want to end with some, some general updates on fate stuff. Um, so I want to start off by thanking um, lots of people, in particular Greg Lemieux, Lemieux who's, who's really helped me out um, in, in getting this, this whole scheme to work. Um, but lots of other people have been batting ideas about of, uh, for many years. This, this, you know, we first talked about getting this stuff to work like five years ago. It's taken a while. And I think the key thing is this is kind of one of the last major model development pieces we need um, in order to start doing these global transient simulations uh, with fades in terms of the actual model development. Okay, so um, I want to start off with a slide that Rosie Fisher made in, in an old tutorial we made where, you know, sort of the basic essence of fades is we're moving from this plant functional type based tiling to a time since disturbance tiling. Right? So on the left is kind of big leaf CLM and on the right is this, this patch structure um, in fades. Um, and, and of course, you know, that patch structure has within it these cohorts. So you've got these kind of time since disturbance tiling um, on, uh, of the patches, and then within each patch, you've got all these cohorts of plants um, that are competing against each other. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the essence of, of what, what we're doing here in FADES. Um, and, and I think the nice thing about the, you know, framing things around disturbance tiling is that it really directly allows you to use land use um, as well, because you know, land use or land use change is, you know, is, is effectively much of a type of disturbance, right? So on the left is kind of this version of like a naturally, uh, you know, just a natural disturbance regime only in which you've got these different patches. And when disturbance happens, you carve off some part of a patch, make it a recently disturbed patch, and you have this kind of constant cycling of, of patches in, in a natural disturbance regime. 
On the right, you've got the same thing, but now you've got an addition of anthropogenic disturbance. In this case, what we have had in the while now for, for a while is, is um, logging only. So basically, you log some primary patches, um, and you, that's a type of disturbance, then you end up you know, sort of in the secondary uh, patches, and then you can, you know, you have natural disturbance on the secondary patches as well, and you can log from them as well and have further. So, you know, so you have this kind of mixing of the of the sort of natural disturbance regime with the the anthropogenic disturbance, um, but it's all just disturbance, and so you can use this patch structure if you if you move from just a sort of uh, a quantitative index of the patch age to a, some, some mixture of a quantitative and then a categorical index of the age and then, you know, this, some disturbance category, you can track all this stuff. Um, and so then if you, if you think about this, you know, what this, then if you generalize this, what it allows you to do is, is do this sort of more conceptual change from land cover to land use uh, in, in, in your tiling, right? So you've got, you know, on the left is, is kind of the, the, the big leaf CLM version of, of, of its land cover based tiling. So you've got these different PFTs. On the right, you know, we have something where you've got some mixture of these, of these categorical variables and then these continuous variables that describe the, the you know, the, the land use based tiling um, with, with a natural disturbance regime built into it. So you might have some patches that are primary, some that might be secondary, um, some that might be pasture, et cetera. Right? So this is, this is what we want to move towards um, in, in fates. Um, okay, so, so how do we do this, right? So on the left, I've got this figure that I pulled out of Peter Lawrence's um, uh, documentation for the CLM5 land data, in which you've got these different you know, types of data. You've got this, la this land use stream represented as a sort of blue box coming from the LUH2. So these are you know, the fraction of the land in, in different land use categories. Um, and then currently the way this is done is, is that there's a bunch of data on, on current day vegetation distribution and then sort of conditional on land use. And those two things all, that, that information all gets sort of wrapped together into these, into, you know, this sort of light, light bluish, purplish uh, box that, that, that goes, there's basically a land cover, which is what drives um, the, the, the big, you know, CLM5. So that's sort of the, the you know, the, the way things are done um, currently in, in, in CLM. Um, on the right is sort of the, the way we're, we're, we've designed this to work in fades, whereby, so you basically just have the, 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 the land use time series directly, um, which we get, which is, you know, download off the LUH2 data set. And um, then we've, what we've made is this, this Python land use for greater tool. Um, and all it does is regrid the data. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't add any information, it doesn't subtract any information other than what is lost in regridding. Um, and, and so the output of that is just, you know, your land use file on, on whatever resolution you're running at, and then that gets read in by CLM or E3SM, um, and then passed through the FATES interface, and then that's what drives things FATES. And so then that, that so it's, it's literally just, it's only taking the land use data itself and using that to run the model. Um, so then what does FATES do with that? So basically, you know, on the left is this, this kind of, uh, trend, you know, this, this, this data set that's coming out of, of, of LUH2, um, which, which is, you know, uh, describes all these, all these um, processes. And in the, in the middle is kind of this, this transition matrix um, where you've got a sort of receiver patch type and a donor patch type. Right? So your, your, your land use changes, you're changing from, from one type of disturbance to another type of disturbance. Um, but, and this is all in the context of a, of a, of a background of, of natural disturbance as well, right? And so we basically, in FATES, what we've done now is added um, these, the, this, these new types of disturbance, right? So we've always had tree fall, fall and fire. For a while, we've had tree harvest, and now we have land use change. And each of these, you know, within these matrix, you, the, each of these dis different disturbance types, or different ones of these disturbance types might operate, right? So from primary to primary, you, you know, that's only tree fall and fire, right? Um, and, and, and luckily, sort of, all, you know, the, you can have tree fall and fire. Well, you can't really have tree fall where you don't have trees, but, you know, you can have these kind of natural disturbance regime only on these, uh, on the diagonal elements of this matrix, because they don't, there's no land use change associated with the natural disturbance. Um, harvest is, is a transition from primary to secondary or, from, or within the, on, on the diagonal of secondary to secondary. I mean, then land use changes all these off-diagonal elements aside from the, the, the initial conversion of primary to secondary. So what happens is, you know, whenever you have this change, you, ch you, you, you carve off a new patch, it changes label, um, and then add it back into the, to the, to the, um, the, the, the fade patch structure. Um, and so, yeah, and so we, and we, I should say we've condensed down the, the LUH2 um, uh, states, you know, the LUH2 has, has multiple, has more states. We, we're sort of condensing them down just to these five states of primary, secondary, pasture range, and cropland. Um, okay, and then and the other piece of information you need to make this stuff work is some rule set for what happens during these transitions, right? And so um, there's a nice paper by Ma et al. in 2020 which says, like, you know, w w how this should be done um, for, um, for the uh, CMIP-6 
um, uh, thing. And it's basically what, you know, it's a roll set. So, so in, in some of these, these, these transitions, you clear all the vegetation um, during the land use change, and in other ones, you don't. So basically, the, the dark gray ones, we clear all the land use. Um, so if, you know, if you're changing from, uh, say, primary to pasture, um, you, you clear all the, all the vegetation, whereas if you're clearing, tr tr going from primary to rangeland, you don't. Um, and likewise, anything that's sort of going back to secondary land, you don't clear it. You allow, you know, you allow that, that, that things to, to just grow. So those are basically the only two pieces that, that you need to do, the, to do all this stuff. Um, and, and with that, you, you now have sort of this dynamic um, land use-based tiling um, within fates. But I should say that there's, there, there, there's, there's nothing currently in, the, in what we've got in, uh, underway. There's nothing more to it than that. Um, there's, there's no actual management on these different land use. Right? So, so the next thing, that now that we've built this foundation where we can have you know, dynamic pasture and rangeland um, you know, uh, and, and a very simplified crop, cropland uh, in fades, we, now we need to actually get the management on this. So we need some sort of grazing. Right? So Sam uh, Raven has, uh, in, in, in some of his prior work, has shown a, a way to do this. Likewise, with you know, different fire on, on different um, land use types. Um, so we could either develop some, some, some simplified fire climatology or make some of the key fire parameters, things like the number of ignitions or the intensity, intensity threshold for fire propagation, make those land use type dependent. Um, uh, as well as we need, you know, a, a key thing that we need, um, particularly for the, for the tropical forest problem, is, this, is some sort of parameterization so that as more of, of a given grid cell becomes uh, more anthropogenically managed, then we get uh, 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 transmission of fire from the, from, the land, from the anthropogenically managed land into the, the uh, unmanaged land, because that's a, a clear driver of forest degradation uh, in tropical forests. Um, uh, yeah, and as well as basically things like land cover management to, in order to to hold the, the, the land um, cover aspects of things, make those conditional on the land management within these things. So things like um, you know, some max canopy cover for a given PFT on rangeland, et cetera. Um, and so, so this is kind of you know, to, to be done and, and very much like looking for people to collaborate with this stuff and, 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 and you know, take on leadership on some of these things. Um, okay, but wait, so we, we can also make fates behave like a model with prescribed land cover, right? So we have, um, you know, probably, or several, some of you may have seen these, these things, but we're, we basically, you know, we have the full fates on the bottom where, you know, on, on any given patch, you've got different, you know, competing PFTs that, and the outcome of the land cover is, 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 is a result of that emergent competition. But we also have this way of running fates where we prescribe the, bio, the, the land cover, and we only allow certain PFTs to grow on certain patches. Um, and the advantage of that is that is well, there are a bunch of advantages, but but the but the main one is that it's a level of complexity that's that's more analogous to the big leaf CLM. So we don't have to solve all these global biogeography problems before we can actually start to use the model. Um, but in but in this so the, that kind of goes against what I what the way I kind of laid out the framework originally, right? Because now we're saying well, we actually want to prescribe um, land cover. Uh, in, in the model, and so if we're prescribing land cover, how does that affect the way, we, the way I was just describing things? Um, and so the idea of what we want to do then in fades with prescribed land cover, this quote unquote no comp configurations where we, where we, you know, we don't allow competition between PFTs and, and instead prescribe it. What we want then for each grid cell, we want this dynamic patch mosaic to include information about both the land use and the land cover. Right? So we want to track on patches both the, 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 the no comp, the, the land cover label, what PFT they, we allow to grow on it, as well as the land use label. You know, is it primary, is it secondary, is it rangeland, et cetera. Right? So we want to actually prognose the joint distribution of land use and land cover um, at every grid cell um, over time in the models. Right? So, so how do we do that? Um, and, and the key thing is we actually have the data that you need to do this. Um, and so this is the part that we, we, ha we haven't yet written this into fate yet. And this is still sort of the, you know, the, the schematic that, the, that we're trying to figure out. But this, this is the essence of what we want to do. Right? So, um, in you know in in CLM five we have these these key f files of basically the the the, the PFT coverage either the, the land the, the the yeah the land cover that's conditional on the land use um, for every grid cell um, that's the, the, we we have these you know these four things the, the pasture forest other um, and then the surface file which is, is just the, the 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 weighted average of all those for for year two thousand five um, so we have the, we have land cover conditional on land use and then we have time varying land use. Uh, and then we have this time-independent forest-non-forest mapping. And so what we can do is combine all these things 
um, in, in, you know, while the model is running and generate these, these, the, this dynamic um, joint distribution of land use. Um, uh, uh, we can generate a static land use to PFT mapping, right? So we've got primary and secondary would be this weighted uh, forest and non-forest average, uh, uh, forest non-forest weighted average of these other mappings. Pasture is straightforward, range is just the other. Um, the crop is sort of a, a whole different problem. Um, and we're gonna hold the bare ground fraction fixed. And, um, and so then, then what we do in order to make this stuff work is we need, um, you know, both the, the to, to bring in both these, the land use time series that we had before as well as now the static land use to PFD mapping data. Put those all through this, this regrader tool um, and, uh, and, and, just, and, and, and load the regraded version of all this stuff and then run the model with that. Um, and so then if we do that, what we're going to get is this kind of dynamic matrix where, so on the left is, is the thing we want to calculate, right? This, this joint distribution of land use and land cover over time. And it's basically just the product of these two things, right? On the right is a static mapping of land use condition, uh, or land cover condition on land use. And then we multiply that basically by the, you know, this, this dynamic vector of land use states over time to give you this joint distribution over time of land use and land cover. Um, and just, just to sort of, you know, as a sanity check to, to work through these data sets, so I've, so I've sort of sketched or downloaded the data in order to do this and what, what these look like. So these are sort of the big leaf P, uh, uh, CLM PFTs over time. Um, it can't decide if it, whether it wants to show red or not. Um, but, but if you, I'm just gonna sort of skip this. So, so there's obviously a ton of information here, but the point is you've got these sort of tree PFTs on the top and the grass PFTs on the bottom. And so, the, and so if you move um, from, you know, sort of from, from the primary and secondary, you lose the tree PFTs and you gain the equivalent grass PFTs, and then even more so in the pasture, right? So I can go back to, you know, the primary and secondary is mostly trees, and as you go from pasture, excuse me, to, to rangeland and then to pasture, you get um, let more and more grasses, right? And so, so that way you get this, this, this joint distribution of, 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 of um, land use and land cover over time. Um, okay, so then what's the, 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 the key longer-term land use infrastructure that we need then um, that, you know, subsequent is this uh, d develop a patch to column correspondence, right? So we want all patches within the same categorical label to have their own column, and then only patches within a given categorical label to be on their own column. And if we do that, then it allows us to do all these other things, right? Irrigation, fertilizer, um, nutrient, other limitations, secondary forest succession. The nice thing about that is it's also really extensible to natural disturbance regimes too, right? So you could, you could, we can extend this in principle to allow some types of natural disturbance, for example, boreal fire, to directly impact the soil dynamics, i.e. permafrost Frost and permafrost loss. So you can get, you know, permafrost destabilization as a result of burning off organic layers um, in the boreal forest, which is, you know, potentially a key driver of, of permafrost feedbacks that we don't have in the model right now. Um, and, and it's basically the same problem. It's just it's developing this sort of, as long as you've developed some categorical way of identifying um, some aspects of the disturbance regime and then develop a, a dynamic correspondence between the, the patches and the, and the columns, then we can do all this. Um, and, and this is very much still, to, to, you know, need, needs to be done. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there on the land use stuff and just give a brief update um, also on, on some other stuff that's going on in FATES right now. Um, and, and there's a bunch of, I just wanna bring things down. Um, you know, Will uh, you know, mentioned a, 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 ton, a ton of the stuff that, that, that's happening right now. Um, and, and I just wanna sort of highlight a few things. One is we've got this nutrient model. Um, we've got a preprint um, that one can read already. It's, it's still in review, but there's a preprint on the nutrient model in FATES. Um, we're developing a, a new rate of transfer model. And I've got a couple slides from Ryan Knox that I want to show on that. Um, but basically, we're, we're, we're developed, we've now added a two-stream um, so, uh, rate of transfer model in addition to the existing Norman scheme that is in there. Um, Marcus Long has been working on phenology. We've got a, a bunch of people working on seed dispersal and recruitment. Um, uh, other aspects of the, of, the, of the logging aspects of land use, in particular, being able to drive it by both um, mass of, of, of carbon harvested as well as the area that Shiji Shu and Jennifer Holm are doing, and then you know, lots of other things, some of which we'll mention. Um, as well as the other key thing is, is the calibration, right? And so we've got this sort of global SP mode calibration that Adriana and Rosie are working on, um, and then a no comp mode um, calibration, i.e. The, the prescribed land cover version um, that Jesse Needham's been working on um, in the E3SM and the Entropics projects. Um, as well as tons of site and regional work by lots, a lot of other people. Um, and so I just want to end briefly with, with some of these other uh, things on the two stream. So, so the nice thing is that, uh, so Ryan's built this, this um, uh, uh, two stream native transfer model. And what's cool about it is that it's really, really flexible. You can basically have any number of parallel and or um, vertically uh, oriented or, or vertically uh, stratified scattering elements. So you can have, have you know, a bunch of, of scattering elements in the canopy and then a bunch of scattering elements in, in the understory and, and then you just basically mix the light regime between them. And there are a bunch of therefore different ways of setting things up. So this, on the right hand side, this is actually not the way we're running the model right now, but this is one way of setting up if you wanted to say, 
have 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 different scattering elements um, for different for different like by grouping together cohorts with uh, depending on on the the LAI, i.e. the leaf area to crown area ratio of of a cohort within the canopy, um, or you could also do the same thing where you you know, uh, uh, have the cohorts that have high LAI, you can make those one, one scattering element, other ones next uh, that have less and less LAI um, uh, parallel to it. And, and on the right-hand side, what you can see is that, is that, is that, is that so you can have both scattering elements that include vegetation as well as sort of null scattering elements of, of bare space. And so you can get it, to get it you know, the, the, um, the, the, you know, like you, we can have an imperfect plasticity, for example, where we allow, so, you know, some light to go directly into the understory, et cetera. Um, it, it's, a, it's a matrix solve on this, so we don't have to iterate it, um, which makes it uh, fairly fast, given, given what we're doing. So right now, Ryan's been running it, actually, with every um, cohort is its own scattering element. And it's a little bit slower than, uh, than the, the existing team, but not that much, given that, uh, that it's doing a lot more. Um, and, uh, yeah, and we've got, you know, got parameters based on Gordon, Gordon's work. Um, and for example, you know, if, we, if you look at some of the output of this stuff, actually, I, so I lied originally when I said there was no results. This is the one side with, with actual results. Um, is that you can see that, like, uh, for example, the, um, the PAR intensity is different, and that in particular you get less uh, diffuse radiation, uh, uh, excuse me, more diffuse radiation in, in the two stream uh, than in the Norman uh, with depth. Um, uh, and uh, for, for one specific configuration in Barrow, Barrow or Colorado Island, where we're yeah, holding the exact same canopy structure between us. And so this is now integrated within FATE. You can, you can run it um, in, uh, you know, sort of offline or coupled. Um, it's undergoing testing right now. And we're pretty excited about this because it, you know, it, it has a lot of implications. We think that there were some, some sort of deep biases that, were, that, were, um, that the Norman scheme was introducing in the two stream uh, uh, should help to fix some of those. So uh, with that, I will end and let you all go to lunch. Thanks. So I um, think more clearly through the transitions and you're developing the transition matrix from the LUH data set, are you keeping track of the stand age of the forest or of some maybe aggregated estimate of stand age? And are you also keeping track of the soil nutrients as you are disturbing one type to the other? Are you, you know, it, it depends where things are coming from and how your rules are based, but you could potentially keep track of right. that. So, so yes and no. So yes on the first part. So, so, so every patch now has basically three pieces of information. There's a categorical piece, which is what, what its land use you know, label is. There's, and then there's two continuous pieces of information, which is what is its age um, since any type of disturbance? And then for things that aren't primary land, what is its age since most recent anthropogenic disturbance? Um, and those two things are different so that you can allow you to do things like forest rotations, even in the presence of, of a natural disturbance regime. Um, uh, so that's uh, to answer your first question. We, so we keep track of all those things for every patch. Um, in terms of the soil nutrient stuff, n currently no, right? Because everything's sitting on the same soil right now, and this is like the this is the big thing that that you know we need to deal with is that we, uh, we, we because everything's sitting on the on the same soil, all the the, the blow ground biogeochemistry information gets lost during during disturbance regimes. So what we need is some some way of doing a mapping for the above ground disturbance that we resolve with, with, with the below ground uh, columns. And, and that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's on the to-do list still. Okay, thanks. the land model working group meeting and um, yeah there's a bunch more stuff in biogeochemistry tomorrow and um, the poly stuff tonight I keep looking at poly I'm excited to hear what you're talking about all right um, thanks everybody and thanks to our speakers
take this off the screen. Paul just asked me to do that.
All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. So, um, and to those of you online as well. Um, so, we are the co chairs and liaison for the Polar Climate Working Group. So, for those of you who don't know us, I'm Rika Holland, this is Hansi Singh, and Dave Bailey. Um, and so, we'd just like to welcome you to the session. And um, we'll just start out with a few remarks in terms of how things are going to work, and then we'll dive into a great set of talks. Um, so um, in terms of logistics, I just wanted to tell any people that are presenting in the room, I've been told that you should stay fairly close to the microphone. If you back away, apparently people on Zoom can just stop hearing you completely, and people in the room, your sound goes down. So just stay close to the microphone. Um, I think that that's the main logistic. People that are presenting from online, you'll just be sharing your screen via Zoom and, and um, present that way. Um, and if you have questions for speakers um, and you're online, feel free to put those in the chat. We're monitoring the chat and those can be read out um, in the Q&A session after each talk. So we have a nice set of talks. They're gonna be about 12 minutes each with a few minutes for questions, ideally, if people do go over their time, I don't know, Hansi and I will drag you off the stage. Yes. <laughs> With a hook. Yeah. Um, so. I don't know where my hook is, but yeah. it's for you. Um, so we're going to try and keep people on time. Uh, and, um, and yeah, so that's basically how the session is going to work. OK, so a couple just updates in terms of things that are happening within the working group. Um, so as Gokhan mentioned yesterday morning, we're in the midst of developing CESM3. Um, and so uh, the Polar Climate Working Group is responsible for providing a sea ice component for CESM3. And so the plan in terms of sea ice within CESM3 is that we'll be using SICE6 um, and we'll be using some of the new model physics that's available in SICE6. So um, SICE6 has improved snow physics uh, and we are, um, so the things that are in green here are things that are almost certain to be included, unless they really somehow screw up the coupled simulations. Um, so that improved snow physics will almost certainly be included in the CESM3 runs. Land fast ice, there's a new parameterization um, to account for land fast ice. We're quite certain we'll include that. Um, there's also a flow size distribution, and along with that flow size distribution, there's wave ice coupling, um, wave ice interactions. That's a little less certain. It's a little more challenging to actually incorporate in that in the model, um, and we don't have experience doing that within coupled CESM uh, three runs, and so we're hoping that that will go in, but it's a little less certain. Um, Dave has already put in better ice ocean, fresh water, and salt coupling, so we actually have true salt coupling um, with the Michi layer sea ice physics, and we no longer have sea ice kind of tagged to a four PSU um, salinity. So Dave's already done that, so that's why it's green. Um, yay. Um, and there's the possibility that we'll be moving to a secret capability within the sea ice model. Um, and there's also a possibility, although quite uncertain, that we might include sea ice biogeochemistry and the coupling of that sea ice biogeochemistry to the ocean. But again, that's in orange here because it's, um, it's less certain. In terms of CESM3+, plus, um, kind of post CESM3, there's a lot of work going on. Um, a lot of that work is using observations, for example, from Mosaic uh, to improve um, the sea ice component of um, CESM and the SICE model more generally. Um, so things like subgrid scale, grid scale snow heterogeneity, um, improvements to the surface albedo, improvements to the parameterization of ponds. So those are things that are sort of in the works. Um, if things go amazingly well, they might get into CESM3, <laughs> but I think it's most likely, and I'm not looking at anyone in the room in particular, but I think it's most likely that um, the, the, some of those things will happen um, post CESM3, but there's a lot of really cool developments going on, and you'll hear about um, some of that work today. Okay, so in addition to the model development side of things, we also, of course, do a lot of model application work. Um, using CESM3 or CESM to understand uh, the polar climate system. Um, and so this is a list of some of the topics that we're working on within the Polar Climate Working Group. Um, again, some of these things you'll hear talks on in the next um, 
couple of hours, so Antarctic sea ice biological interactions, factors driving historical sea ice variations, sea ice and polar climate predictability, the influence of forcing uncertainty on changes in sea ice and polar climate more generally, factors influencing polar amplification, um, Arctic moisture sources, atmospheric rivers, and changing precipitation, um, Antarctic freshwater discharge and its climate influence, and also Antarctic um, hydrologic cycle changes more generally, um, and variability more generally. So um, some of you have co computer time to run experiments associated with these topics. Please use your computer time. Um, <laughs> And so, and if you're having uh, challenges doing that, please contact us. Um, and if you're doing work in this area and you're interested in um, computational resources, you know, feel free to reach out to us about that as well. Sometimes we have um, uh, dribs and drabs, little bits um, available for um, uh, users to uh, run interesting experiments associated with polar climate um, science. Okay, so. Um, this is the agenda for today. There is one change on the agenda, so that 2.45 time slot. There was a talk scheduled then. Unfortunately, um, the speaker had to cancel, and so we're going to have a very brief discussion for that 15-minute break or 15-minute slot there. Um, so we are going to have two discussions. Uh, the first one is going to be about better integrating observations and models to improve sea ice models and also the application of um, sea ice models within coupled climate system models. Um, and then the second discussion will um, touch on using CESM for actionable polar science. And for those of you who went to the actionable science session yesterday, the cross-working group session, there was a lot of polar stuff in there. <laughs> and that was actually just a subset of um, at least the projects I know um, going on in the area of um, actionable science. So we thought it would be helpful to chat amongst ourselves on whether some better coordination or lessons learned or things like that might be useful within the working group. Um, so that's basically the plan for today. Um, I don't know if my co-chair liaison want to say anything else. Um, okay, so if not, I think we'll just move to the talks and um, get the first talk going. And so, let's see. So our first speaker is Ed Blanchard Rigglesworth. So Ed, hopefully you're online um, and can present your talk. Hi, can you hear me now? Ah, uh, there he is. Hey, Ed. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry, I can't be there in person. Um, let me just share my screen. Uh, hopefully, everyone can hear me and see me um, well enough. Looks great. Thank you. So take it away. Great, thanks, Marika. Uh, so uh, the title of my talk is Can CSM uh, Simulate the Cyclone-Driven Record? Sea ice loss of January 2022, uh, uh, which I'll show in a minute, was a pretty remarkable extreme event. And this is kind of my one page uh, motivation for studying extreme events. Um, they have an oversized footprint on socioeconomic impacts. Uh, and I would argue also that they serve as a litmus test for weather forecast and climate models. Ed? Uh, one Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Can you speak a little more loudly? Yes. Um, is that better? Can you hear me better now? All right. They might. They're trying to increase the volume in the room. So let me. Yeah. Can, what? Can you Test. speak? Can you hear me now? Is this better? It's still really quiet. Uh, they're they're working uh, on it to see if it they can increase the volume. Okay. Um, hello, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. It's just very quiet. So I think um, 
I've just tested my microphone and that looked normal. So I'm not sure if I can do anything at my end. Yeah. Other than really, can I yell? <laughs> I think, I mean, people can hear you enough that they laughed when you said, can I yell? So, so why don't you just take it away and <laughs> we'll just be very quiet um, so we can hear you. So, um, so the, the kind of, you can, I think, um, define extreme events with these, uh, sort of four main questions uh, at the bottom. How well do we understand them? Can we, how well can we forecast them? How might climate change impact them? And, and also I think for this community, uh, where I think can be really valuable is how can we use them to improve our models? Uh, so this is uh, very briefly, um, you may have heard me talk about this case study in other talks, but in last year, in January, 2022, there was uh, a huge cyclone in the Arctic. It was actually the strongest Arctic cyclone on record. And I showed the sea level pressure and sea ice concentration in the top panel on the 24th of January. Uh, central, uh, the sea level pressure reached the depth of 932 millibars, which is what you'd expect in a hurricane. Um, in the bottom panels, I showed the sea ice concentration on the 21st of January on the left and on the 27th of January in the middle bottom panel. And the panel on the bottom right shows the difference in concentration between those two dates. It's just six days, but you can see that the sea ice concentration declined significantly uh, in the Barents, Kara, and even in the West Laptev Sea. And if you take an integral of that whole section between the dashed lines, uh, it's a loss of almost half a million square kilometers in just six days. Um, and the histogram on the left, that shows you uh, the histogram of six day changes in sea ice area in this region over the whole record in the blue. Uh, the black line was the observed in January 2022, and it beat the previous record by 30%. So uh, it was a huge, uh, you know, we have a record cyclone producing a record loss in sea ice. So the question now is um, how do we study cyclones in sea ice in, in a model, in, in this case, the CSM1? Um, option one, you can analyze the relationship between cyclones and sea ice in existing runs, like in the Latin ensemble. Uh, there's several papers that show this or have done this. Uh, you could also run just a standalone sea ice model or a nice ocean model with a data observed atmosphere. Uh, but in some, you know, it's you could argue that the answer is a little bit thin because the surface fluxes are so, you know, tied and kind of by forcing it with the atmosphere, it's. You know, it's questionable to see how much you're going to learn from just the sea ice model itself. And uh, what I say is an option three um, is that we can replicate the observed cyclone in a fully coupled uh, version of model in, in CSM by nudging the winds. And we, we nudge the winds just above the boundary layer so that the, the boundary layer itself and the surface, you know, they, they remain, they, they, they kind of uh, keep a degree of like couple, uh, you know, sort of a free running um, physics and, uh, you know, they, they sort of uh, have some uh, degrees of freedom, right? But you, you're sort of um, constraining the winds from above. Uh, so we've done, uh, we've run four experiments uh, where we do just this, where we nudge the winds in the model to the observed January 22 winds. And we've done this with uh, four different initializations with different forcings in basically the year 2022. And then in 2041, 2061, and 2081, the way I initialize them, they're a little bit different. The last, the kind of the future scenarios, they're initialized from the large ensemble. Uh, and the 2022, they're initial, well, they're actually a continuation of a nudge run that we started in, in 1950 that I think Letty might uh, show in the next uh, talk. And we've actually done, a, a, we've repeated these four experiments. That's why there's an asterisk. And we've done exactly the same thing, but we've changed the flow size from three meters, uh, sorry, two, three meters uh, from the default, which is 300 meters to see if, if, if having a different flow size had an impact on, uh, on how the sea ice responds. So these are the sort of kind of main results. Uh, the panel on the right, that, show, that shows you the sea level pressure in contours and the, on the 24th of January and the change in sea ice concentration. Uh, before and after, and the four panels on the left show you the sea level pressure contours in the model uh, after nudging the winds, and then the shading is also the change in sea ice concentration 
uh, the magenta line, which hopefully you can see, that just tells you where the sea ice edge is defined by the 15% concentration, uh, I think on the 24th or maybe the 21st, but kind of during this week. And so there's two main messages. One is that you, you can replicate the cyclone really well. Uh, it's a little bit less deep. It gets down to 939 millibars, but it's a slightly coarser resolution uh, than the era uh, five, so that might be a reason, but you know, I think to first order, you're all convinced that we are replicating that observed cyclone in the model. And then the second result is that the change in sea ice is very different in the model to what we observed, right? There's a lot less sea ice loss, and there's this kind of different pattern where you tend to have sea ice loss to the east of the cyclone and sea ice gain to the west, which has actually been shown um, by Robin Clancy, like looking at the large ensemble. Um, whereas in the observations, you know, it's, it's mostly sea ice loss that we see. Uh, if we look at the total sea ice area, uh, integrating in that region, uh, the dashed lines is the observations, and the colored lines are the four different model simulations. And as, as, as I showed in the previous slide, uh, the model simulations have a pretty uh, faint loss in sea ice. It's about uh, 100,000 square kilometers. In observations, it was half a million. So uh, it's a fifth. Um, or, you know, the, the loss in sea ice in observations is five times what we... Uh, what the model simulates. The other thing is that um, it doesn't really matter what your mean state is, um, whether it's 2022 or 2081. Um, you know, we're, we're like showing quite a, uh, a variety of mean states here, and the, the response is is always fairly modest. Um, there are some differences in 2081 actually loses even less sea ice, um, but yeah, none of these basically do what the observations did. Uh, the, these results now, the dashed lines, uh, the results from those other four experiments where we changed the flow size to three meters to see if there was a, a bigger response of the sea ice. And you can see that the dashed lines are pretty much almost the same as the continuous lines. So um, very little um, immediate uh, effect uh, from that change in flow size. Um, we also looked a little bit at thickness. Uh, this is a figure from our paper. This is the uh, change in thickness in the observations, looking at the SMOS satellite. And, and we also saw significant thinning, and that is uh, on the panel on the right. And uh, I will uh, point out that we looked at the surface fluxes for this case study, and the, the actual direct uh, fluxes from the atmosphere can only account for maximum of about 10 centimeters of melting, and we saw quite a lot more melting. So this is where we hypothesize in the paper that, well, maybe the additional melting must be coming from, um, from the ocean, from below, right? And that is enhanced vertical mixing due to waves, uh, winds, and, and fast sea ice motion. Because um, the atmosphere itself uh, cannot account for this much melting, um, if, you, if you believe, you know, kind of our estimates for surface heat fluxes. Uh, in the model, uh, the, this is the same variable, the change in thickness between uh, before and after the cyclone on the four panels on the left. Uh, and I've put the color bar to be the same as that panel on the right observations. And you might not even be able to see those very faint yellows or, or blues, but there's very small changes in thickness in the model compared to what we think or what our best estimate from observations shows that the, um, might have happened in reality. So this is again kind of agrees with the um, result from the sea ice, from the change in sea ice concentration, right? Just a smaller change uh, or a smaller response of the sea ice to the cyclone in the model. Uh, now, uh, nevertheless, there is some evidence that the ocean is responding in the model or the ocean to ice fluxes. So um, I looked at uh, bottom melt and top melt. There, there is no top melt in the model. Uh, all of it is coming in from the bottom. And what I show here is. Um, the total bottom melt on the right in the 20 days before, uh, so from January the 1st to January the 20th, and then the total bottom melt during the cyclone on the left. And you can see there's this, all this kind of additional bottom melt uh, that takes place during the cyclone in the model. So it is, it is having an impact, um, or it is, you know, you are getting some additional melt uh, or fluxes from the ocean to the ice in the model, but, but they, they seem, seem to be just, just too small. And if you look at the, uh, the mean ocean heat flux, um, again, uh, in the 20 days, uh, this is again cumulative in the 20 days prior to the cyclone on the right and during the cyclone on the left, 
Um, you can see there is some additional um, ocean heat flux, but it, also, it always tends to be kind of uh, too much on the open, open ocean side where there's very low sea ice concentration change rather than getting into the, uh, into the ice pack. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to finish by showing, um, you know, I started thinking, okay, well, what does the ocean mean state look like uh, in these simulations? And this, um, this is just taking the um, CSM NARS 2041 case study. And I just looked at the, um, at the ocean temperature versus depth at three different points in the marginal ice zone in the, in the barracks. And you can see that there's, there's a very deep mixed layer. It's about 70 to 80 meters. And I think this will also have an impact on the, uh, on the, you know, the response of the sea ice uh, slash ocean system to the cyclone, that even if the model say simulated waves going into the, uh, into the ice pack, and, and we know there were really big waves going into the ice pack in observations, so even if you could simulate that in the model and get some vertical mix in, maybe, maybe you mix the top 50 meters of the ocean, you still wouldn't be tapping into warmer waters below, right? So, you know, I, I think there's a combination of, um, uh, you know, how deep is your mix layer and, you know, like what, what kind of mixing you can get in, in the upper ocean. And uh, this is kind of a little bit of a schematic of, I think, some of the physics that uh, might be going on in reality and how the model simulates, uh, at least as of now, we know that waves, uh, in reality, they, they, you know, they penetrate to the ice pack, they break up the ice flows, and they mix the upper ocean. Um, so if you, you know, especially if you don't have too deep of a mix layer, you can get all this additional melting from below. And what the model's doing on the right right now is the, the waves just get to the sea ice, but it's, it's like a wall, right? There, there is no yet wave sea ice interaction, um, definitely not in CSM1. And uh, perhaps the, the mixed layer is uh, too deep. Uh, and I'm trying to get some observations of mixed layer depth in that region, but there's one buoy, uh, sorry, uh, there's one from the Norwegian just, just east of Svalbard. Um, so, uh, you know, that's kind of a question mark. And again, we could always do with better observations, but I think at least these results uh, can help to kind of target both model development, but, you know, the kind of observations we would need. And uh, with that, I will end. Uh, I will say all this is very current work, so any comments and ideas uh, are very much appreciated. Thanks. Ed, really interesting talk. So are there any questions for Ed? And if so, please use the microphone so people online can hear you. And, it, and Uta is coming up to the microphone, so. <laughs> Hi, Ed. Um, one, two, three, four, yes. Nice talk, but can we have the variables and the units on all these slides which have a format with where the color column is on the right, there's never the unit or the variable listed? Oh, we can't hear you. I believe your mic is muted. Ed, are you able to, can you hear an unmute and answer? <laughs> Sorry, Sorry I, I was uh, not allowed to unmute by the host again. Uh, yes, no, that's guilty as charged uh, about the units. Um, that's the problem with making last minute figures. But the main, the main point here was just showing you the relative value, uh, especially in those last two figures of the uh, bottom melt and the total ocean heat flux. Um, yeah, Virja has a question. Uh, hi, Ed, uh, great talk. Uh, I'm wondering that, do you think that having a higher resolution model with high res sea ice might be able to resolve this sea ice changes in a better way or it's, a, it's an inherent problem of physical representation and not spatial resolution? Uh, that's a great question. And uh, we're planning to do basically kind of rerun these experiments with the, uh, the nested high resolution Arctic grid um, in CSM2. That uh, I think uh, Adam, uh, is it Adam Harrington? I know uh, we're collaborating with Robin Clancy on this, but yeah. 
Great right. question and work in progress. And so, Ed, you'd be doing nudged runs, but within the variable resolution Arctic grid. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> we we also want to. I've spoken. I'm, I'm you know collaborating with CC Bits on this, and we also want to do the same runs, but nudge in the mixed layer depth in the model so that it's not so deep to see, you know, if you set the mixed layer depth at 20 or 30 meters, uh, can, can you get enhanced um, bottom melt? Yeah, there's one last talk and then we'll move on to the next speaker. I mean, one last question, sorry. And then we'll go move on to the next talk. So, if, yeah. Great talk, I just wonder, uh, have you checked the moisture transport and like uh, moisture transport or column moisture over the Arctic? Uh, because just nudging the wind, can you reproduce the transport of heat and moisture in the atmosphere well in your simulations? Yeah, uh, I haven't directly in this experience look at, looked at the atmospheric moisture, but it does generally do really well. You know, I've been uh, myself and Leti and Tsinghua, you know, we've been uh, playing around with this nudging technique for a few years now, and it, it does remarkably well in sort of, uh, you know, reproducing... Um, Kind of uh, you know sort of some of the other state variables even if you're not nudging them at least in the domain that you're nudging um i you know it, it's a bit of a question mark how much the um like the bottom or, or like the downward long wave and latent fluxes during observations there's quite a bit of uncertainty between the satellite and era five but even in the satellite which gives you the higher um uh, the high estimates of top melt from the atmosphere in the cyclone, it's still really small. So I don't think uncertainty in exactly how much moisture you have will give you a massively different answer in terms of what the sea ice is doing. The cyclone was still fairly cold. I mean, it was warmer than climatology, but it was still, you know, just below freezing. Um, so, yeah, it's, I, I think in observations, it's like the ocean has to be doing most of that uh, change in, in the sea ice. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for the talk, Ed. That was great. And thanks for um, connecting from Europe. So yeah, we appreciate it. Um, thanks so, for putting me first. <laughs> um, so next up is Letty Roach. And Letty, hopefully you're online and can share your screen. Hi, Letty. We, yeah, you're muted, so we can't hear you. And see your slides, but don't seem to be able to hear you. Still not hearing you, Letty. I don't know if you're, hopefully you're speaking, but well. Uh, Letty, on our end, it is saying that you are not muted. So Letty, we're still not able to hear you. Yeah. Are people online able to hear Letty? Or is it just us in the room? If someone could put in the chat whether they can hear. Oh, yeah, looks like no one online can hear you either. Thanks, thanks everyone for chiming in. If you're using a external mic, I would recommend uh, taking it off and using the internal mic. And if you go down to the option to unmute, make sure that you have selected the internal microphone. Worked in the breakout room. Sure, yeah, let's, why don't we switch the order? Oh, um, except Rudra just, I think, stepped out. 
Um, Yeah, so I think, um, why don't we try that, Letty? We'll, we'll switch your talk and have Ruja, <laughs> who's running up to the stage. So we'll, um, we'll switch to Ruja's talk, and if you can um, try and figure out the audio and come back, that would be great. So I'm going to pull up Ruja's talk. Um, Sorry about that, I was just using the restroom. Uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Rudra Thakur. I'm a second year graduate student at University of Wisconsin-Madison, uh, working with some amazing people, Steve Weveris, Christine Shields, Alice Dubibie, Marika Holland, and Laura Landrum, and half of my research group's present here. Uh, I have been, I'll be presenting some of my master's work, uh, which I recently defended. It's going to be about changing Arctic atmospheric rivers and how changing climate affects these extreme events. So very tangential to the other talks as well. So quickly, what are atmospheric rivers? Uh, I think we are pretty much familiar with these events from a West Coast perspective, that these are long, narrow corridors of moist and warm air coming from lower latitudes, bringing so much moisture to the higher latitudes. Um, they tend to bring a lot of extreme precipitation, as well as heat waves and sea ice changes in the Arctic. Uh, I also like to use this analogy that atmospheric rivers is a guy who's sprinting towards the Arctic instead of just walking or jogging. So they have a high moisture, high velocity component to them. Uh, here's a picture created by Mark Ross and painstakingly edited by me on Photoshop, just showing how the atmospheric river would look like in the Arctic, even though it's geographically wrong. <laughs> Yeah, so about the literature, uh, there has been a lot of literatures about how the extremes are changing in the Arctic. Uh, the short story is that they're getting more frequent in the winter and also more extreme. Recently, we also start seeing the word atmospheric river mentioning in this literature since last six years that say that they have negative impacts on both ice sheets and sea ice, both again in Arctic and Antarctic. However, the question still remains that how this events are gonna change in a changing climate in the future. So the big question is, should the polar bears worry about the Arctic atmospheric rivers? Uh, and I'll try to answer that question. So the two questions I'll be asking, one, does CESM2 capture Arctic ARs? And how do these ARs change in a future climate? So just to keep uh, us familiarized with the concepts of ARs, I'll be focusing on two different aspects of ARs, frequency and intensity. So just remember that whenever these extreme events are getting talked about, they're a function of how frequent they're happening, which means that are the number of ARs increasing, or the duration of ARs increasing, and how the intensity is also changing, meaning that how much moisture flux they bring into the Arctic. Uh, also for the future slides, I'll be using these two different uh, functions to, to just stay clear. Uh, I'll be using MERA2 data set, which is developed by NASA. It's a reanalysis data set uh, from 1980 to 2019, uh, three early, and also at like nearly half a degree resolution. And I'll be using the climate model CSM2, which has a historical simulation and a future simulation with six early temporal resolution and one degree uh, spatial resolution. I'm focusing on the, on the resolutions here to just uh, notify that how coarse the CSM2 model is and how well it does in capturing these events. Uh, for the method, I'll be using an algorithm developed by Jonathan Willey, which is widely used for polar ARs, both, again, Arctic and Antarctic. Uh, we use three hourly or six hourly meridional integrated vapor transport, so it's your VIVT, just velocity and moisture integrated across the uh, atmospheric column. Then we calculate the monthly 90th percentile uh, for the given time. Uh, it also has a length restriction of 2,000 kilometers, and if, if all of that falls into pieces, then you have an AR detected. Uh, 
And on the right, I'm showing like how these blobs might be detected by the red outline going into the ERC deck. It's also very peaceful to just look at the GIF. So question one, uh, does CSM2 capture Arctic ARs? The frequency part, part one. Uh, on the left is MERA2, and on the right is a random ensemble member from CSM2. And after running the algorithm, I'm just showing that how frequent these ARs are. And notice that how rare these events are based on the extreme threshold value we are using, that they only occur 1% of the time in the Arctic and still can cause major impacts to sea ice. Uh, the first side, and we can see that the model does a fairly good job in capturing these events. It captures the hot spots near the Greenland, the Pacific sector, Atlantic sector, and also the Russian permafrost. Uh, as soon as we add all the 40 ensemble members and take a mean, the spatial features get smoothed out. But this is just showing that each ensemble member is able to capture this extreme event quite well. So the answer to the frequency part is yes, CSM2 is able to capture these events quite well. Moving on to the other part about the intensity, uh, we'll be focusing on the decade of 1996 to 2005, and we're gonna focus on the two regions shown here with blue and red color, which is the Pacific and the Atlantic sector. We're gonna look again at the meridional vapor transport uh, spatially averaged over the region. And for the future plots, I'll be using a logarithmic y-axis so that we can focus on the extreme events. Uh, I'm showing the distribution of three, like six hourly, both MERA and CSM2 now. Uh, the red line shows the, the MERA2 distribution, and the dotted red line shows where the 98th percentile distribution lies. And the blue line is showing the ensemble mean with the blue highlighted region as the ensemble spread. And the CSM2 does able to capture this intensity quite well as well. Uh, there are some extremes, like more extremes, in the spread, but that's just a bias, and I think we can cut some slack off for CSM2. Uh, now I'm also adding the 90th percentile threshold of individual ensemble member as a spread just to show that it also captures the distribution quite well. So the white region is showing that the red line of the, the distribution of MERA2 is being captured by the climate model. So going back to our question again, the CSM2 capture Arctic ARs. It is able to capture the frequency and intensity broadly, yes, and I think we can rely on the model to at least simulate these events. Uh, Coming back to question two, how do ARs change in future climate? So for this, we need to remember that as the climate warms, uh, we do see that the moisture increases just following the cloches clapeyron equation. So while detecting this algorithm, like this atmospheric rivers, how come we know that it's not just increasing moisture and actual moisture transport from events? So as the moisture increases, the moisture transport also changes, and you can have errors in your atmospheric river detections mainly because it's a very threshold sensitive uh, event. So to address this question, uh, we'll be using a decadal uh, algorithm instead of uh, an entire 85 years of time being fed into the algorithm. So each decade has its own threshold to detect these events. Uh, to give you an insight, I'm showing a random location uh, and the annual 90th VIVT percentile of one single ensemble member as well, and this is how the, the threshold would change. So if you're using one decade and not changing or moving the threshold, you might have more, just more extremes in the future climate. So what we do is that we uh, take each decade of chunk shown with the colors and use the black dots uh, as a threshold for that decade instead of one fixed threshold. So once we use a moving algorithm and see that how this frequency of AR changes in the last 35 years, which is 2065 to 2100, we see that there is a wild increase, like a wide increase of AR frequency in the Arctic, uh, both in the seasons of winter and spring. The, the, storms, the storm sectors like Pacific and Atlantic sectors do have higher in frequency as well, so there might be more storms going in. We also see a widespread increase in the fall, which are the months of September, October, November, just because there is no sea ice anymore. There's more moisture available from the open ocean that can fuel these events. And uh, the season of summer, it's more chaotic, where you see uh, like a dipole of increase and decrease across various region, but I'm not sure how significant these results in summer seasons are in frequency. So the key takeaways are here again. Uh, we are using a moving threshold. We see an increasing frequency due to the increasing extratropical cyclones. Uh, there, is a, there is a wide increase uh, across all the seasons and more increase or like more ARs going in deeper into the Arctic with changing climate. 
uh, going back to how the intensity is changing, we are gonna go back to our line plots, and I'm only gonna show the ensemble min instead of the spread here for these two regions. Uh, so here is a distribution plot. Uh, I'm showing different decade shown by different colors of line. So your blue to red transition is showing that how each decade is changing uh, for these two regions as ensemble mean. And the first thing that catches our eye is that it's shifting. The extremes are getting more extreme as the changing, as, as the climate changes. And uh, if we put the 85th percentile distribution as decade, we see that the entire distribution is also changing. And we put the 98th percentile, which we also use for detecting these events, which are like the rarest events, to show larger shifts happening as compared to your mean changes. Uh, we break it down to seasonal plots again. So here I'm just showing that during the summer season, there's more moisture in general, and you see that your moisture transport is also changing. However, we didn't see any clear increase or decrease in the frequency, so we are not sure that how it will be changing in summer season. Whereas in winter, where we did see a clear increase in frequency, we do see that increases in the Pacific sector are more pronounced and higher than the Atlantic sector. And the primary reason which are governing these events uh, is how the SST gradients are changing. So how your sea surface temperature in these two basins are changing is kind of governing how your intensity or your moisture flux is changing as well. And just I'm showing that how big the shifts in the Pacific are as compared to the Atlantic. So the answer to question two, uh, we do see frequency increases uh, other than the summer season and also intensity increases across all seasons. And to sum up, it's too much, so I'm just gonna do a summary slide that uh, CSM2 does capture these extreme events well in terms of frequency and intensity. However, our further analysis also shows that uh, this model tends to capture fewer individual ARs which are longer than 12 hours as compared to observations, maybe because of its partial, oh, sorry, coarser temporal resolution that you have six hourly chunks. So you need a high resolution model to capture individual ARs. Uh, we also see that CSM2 captures these extreme events well. Oh, sorry, also the frequency also is increasing across all seasons and the intensity also increases across all seasons. Uh, the future work is to break down the thermodynamic and dynamic impacts on ARs that what's driving this increases. So we are gonna try to scale the future changes in moisture and also scale the meridional velocity. And this is something that uh, folks at Europe are, are already working on through a methodology, so we're just gonna adopt them. Uh, and the methodology loosely follows that how the future, this is just showing an example of how we, we are gonna scale the moisture. So we are seeing that how, we are showing how the future moisture is changing and then we are gonna calculate new threshold based on this ratio instead of a decadal chunk which is not the smoothest way of doing it. So this is something that we are working on developing the methodology so if anyone has any suggestions or ideas or want to discuss this, I would be very happy to discuss this as well with them and I'll take any questions. Um, you might have said this in previous presentations, but your choice of MIRA to, you know, analyze the atmospheric rivers, how does that compare to like ECMWF reanalysis, the Japanese reanalysis? Is there much spread between the different products in those? So, so we have used ERA five as well, and they do see they do show similar results as well. We just didn't show them and didn't analyze all of the ERA five because it had a higher temporal and spatial resolution. We are still using the RFI to detect this individual ARs because that shows that it relies on how frequent the temporal resolution is. So we are using that to prove that is it an issue of just a resolution in, in time or not. But good question, yeah, thanks to you. Okay. Thank you very much, Thank you. that was great. Um, so I think we'll, we'll try to have Letty um, uh, chair again, so let me, and. Let Can you me hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay, great. Sorry, Sorry about, about that. that. Thank, Thank you for bearing with me. me. No, no worries. So, yeah, I think you just need to share your screen, Letty. Yeah. Great. 
Great. Great. Okay. okay, thanks, thanks very, very much. much. Uh, so, hi everyone. everyone, thanks for letting me join uh, virtually. Uh, my name is Letty Roach and I'm a research scientist now at NASA GIS and at Columbia. Uh, and today I'm going to talk about three studies that have a common theme, looking at the impact of observed wind variability on Arctic sea ice, Antarctic sea ice and AMOC. Uh, and I've listed the co-authors on the three studies here at the bottom, uh, and Ed, who gave the first talk, was a co-author on all three of these studies. So what I want to argue today is that uh, wind nudging is a very useful tool both to offer insights about the real climate system and to evaluate and give insight about coupled climate models. In all three studies, we use experiments with CSM1 that were branched from members of the large ensemble. And beginning in 1979, we nudged the winds and the model towards uh, reanalysis winds. This is done simply by adding an extra relaxation term into the uh, governing model equations. Uh, so in the first uh, couple of studies, we used error interim, and we nudged over 1979 to 2018, uh, only over the high latitudes uh, and from the top of the atmosphere to 850 hectopascals, so above the boundary layer. And we find that just by nudging the winds, it exerts a really powerful control on the whole model atmosphere, including uh, temperature, pressure, geopotential heights, uh, a number of uh, fields. And so here I'm showing the surface air temperature trends in two seasons, JJA and DJF, in the reanalysis, uh, the large ensemble mean, and then the nudge simulations. And so you can see that there are very high uh, spatial correlations between the nudge simulations and the reanalysis. Um, this is uh, for temperature, for pressure, the correlations are even higher. So surface pressure has uh, spatial correlations in some months uh, over 98% in our nudge model uh, as compared with the reanalysis. So given that the atmosphere is now very strongly constrained to the real world, how well do we simulate different components? So first looking at Arctic sea ice, uh, this shows the September Arctic sea ice area uh, with observations in black and 35 members of the large ensemble in blue, with the mean of the large ensemble is this uh, thicker blue line representing the force or radius of response. Uh, and you can see uh, more or less from this figure that the observed trend is a bit steeper than the large ensemble mean. Uh, it turns out that this is about 25% uh, uh, steeper than the lens mean. So then in our simulations where we nudge towards the observed winds, these are shown in red here. So looking at the left panel uh, first, um, you can see our three different ensemble members that started from different sea ice states, uh, but you can see they uh, uh, co-vary together. So they're, they're very strongly constrained, indicating that most of the initial condition uncertainty is damped in these simulations. Uh, the mean state is perhaps a little lower than the observations, but there is uh, some spread here in the observations uh, due to observational uncertainty. Uh, but you can see that the interannual variability uh, is very well captured with a very high correlation over 90%. And then if we look at the um, trends uh, by month, uh, you can see that now in September, uh, we actually have enhanced uh, the trend from the lens mean to almost perfectly match the observed trend, i.e. the uh, summer circulation patterns that aren't part of the, the model's force response act to enhance the September sea ice loss by around 20 to 25%. Uh, and this is consistent with a study led by Jingwa Din that came out uh, about the same uh, time. Uh, but if we look at the trends in other months outside of uh, the, the fall season, um, you can see that the uh, trends in the nudge simulations still remain within the range of the large ensemble uh, and are quite different from the observations, which have uh, more negative trends. And so the fact that we have these uh, winter sea ice trends remaining, um, despite the fact that these nudge simulations reproduce the observed surface winds and warming, uh, suggests that there may be important biases in the ocean and or the sea ice response in the non-summer months. Then turning to the Antarctic, uh, here the uh, model observation disagreement is perhaps more pronounced, uh, especially when we look at the trend, where for CSM1, uh, the mean of the large ensemble has a steady decline. In contrast, the observation, so we have a, a small expansion up until about uh, 2015, and then we had uh, a big low in, in 2016. Uh, and, and of course, course we uh, just recently had another record low. 
So then in our nudged wind simulations, uh, we're here for the Antarctic wind nudging forwards of 45 degrees. Um, and again, we started three ensemble members from different sea ice states. You can see that after some initial adjustment, uh, these uh, three ensemble members uh, agree very closely with one another and then closely follow the observations, particularly from about 92 onwards. Um, with uh, a high uh, correlation, even capturing some of the decline that we saw in 2016. And then on the right hand side, uh, I think quite strikingly, the nudge simulations uh, managed to capture uh, a large portion of the observed patterns of the sea ice uh, changes, where we've had uh, different uh, increases and decreases in different regional sectors. Um, and, and something, something that's, that's not seen in uh, at least any of the CMIP-6 simulations uh, that I've seen, um, this, this overall, uh, these overall patterns in uh, summer on the top here and, and winter on the bottom. So here I'm showing uh, the trend in the annual mean Antarctic uh, sea ice area on the y-axis versus the trend in global mean surface temperature uh, on the x-axis um, with the observations as the black squares and then the CSM1 large ensemble in blue and the mean of our three wind nudge simulations in red. Uh, so you can see that this is right at the edge of the large ensemble, suggesting that with uh, the wind nudging, we're really kind of choosing the pathway uh, in the model that's most similar to the observed internal variability. And if we take the distance between uh, the observations and the mean of the large ensemble, we find that the, uh, this, this wind variability um, can explain around a third of that difference. Uh, and then there's still some way to go, and, and part of the reason that we thought that this uh, would be was because uh, CSM1 has quite strong uh, warming throughout the Southern Ocean, uh, which isn't what we've seen in observations. So we did an additional experiment where we also relaxed the sea surface temperatures in CSM1 towards observations over 40 to 56 degrees south, so um, equated with the sea ice edge, and we did that at the same time as, as nudging the winds. And when, and when we, we do that, that we, we get, get this um, uh, this yellow circle here, which has an insignificant annual mean sea ice area trend over 79 to 2018. Um, and if you just take the distance between these uh, to, uh, to the observations and the, the lens mean, the uh, two factors together, the wind variability plus the SSTs, can explain around 70% of that model observation uh, difference. And then, and then thirdly, thirdly uh, turning to AMOC, uh, this was something we didn't really set out to investigate, but we noticed some interesting uh, impacts, so, so looked into those uh, further. So again, here I'm showing CSM1 lines as the blue lines. This is AMOC at 26 degrees north, which is the location of the rapid array. Um, the rapid array here I'm showing in black. This provides uh, observational estimates from 2004 onwards, and it has uh, an uncertainty estimate shown in the gray shading. And then in the colored lines, I'm showing in brown the uh, forced ocean simulation, uh, the, the core uh, reanalysis. And then in gray, I have um, the nudge simulation where we nudge the winds towards our interim. And then in red uh, is an, a similar situ uh, simulation that we started in 1950 rather than 79, and we nudge towards error five, as that has a, a longer period that's available for. So, so what we thought was interesting, interesting here was that just nudging, nudging the winds uh, in a fully coupled model uh, is similar to instead providing the whole atmosphere uh, and just having a, a data atmosphere. And there are differences between the reanalysis uh, products, but the overall picture still remains the same whether we use error interim or error five. So all of these constrained atmosphere simulations capture the uh, phasing of AMOC uh, pretty well. Uh, but, but we thought it was interesting that the multi decadal variability in these simulations isn't enhanced uh, to look more like the rapid array that has these, these very large uh, ups and downs, um, despite the fact that we're providing these uh, atmospheric variability. Um, and then we were also, um, unlike the sea ice, where we mostly stayed within the range of the CSM1 large ensemble, we find that uh, when we nudge the winds uh, uh, poles of 45 degrees, uh, that, that we, we have, have an impact, impact on AMOC, AMOC that actually brings it outside the range of this large ensemble and, and uh, really substantially lowers the overall AMOC strength. Um, and, and so, so we then uh, dug into this by looking into surface water mass transformations. 
Uh, and so here I'm comparing different simulations that we had where we nudged over some slightly different regions. So we nudged only in the southern hemisphere, uh, polewards of 60 degrees in both, and uh, as well as uh, 45 to 60 only in 45, polewards of 45 in both. Uh, and so essentially uh, any of the simulations that we found that nudged between 45 and 60 degrees north had very different surface buoyancy fluxes uh, over the subpolar gyre. So that's what I'm showing here. The uh, x-axis is surface buoyancy flux over the subpolar gyre and the y-axis is the AMR of 26 degrees north. Uh, and these uh, differences come from the heat component rather than the fresh water component. The buoyancy fluxes and appear to be related to the turbulent heat fluxes uh, over the sub subpolar gyre, uh, consistent with a shallow mixer, decreased heat loss, uh, leading to increased surface buoyancy. And we actually find a very similar result if we nudge to the absolute winds, uh, which here are shown uh, in, for example, in, in the red, as you do when we nudge only to the uh, anomalies based on the reanalysis space. These, these are the ones in yellow here. Um, suggesting that it's not due to the absolute magnitude of winds, but how they uh, co-vary with the uh, temperature and humidity. So, um, in summary, um, we think that these wind nudging replay experiments are a powerful tool to constrain modeled internal variability uh, and are a useful tool for providing insight for future model development. Um, besides this, we found that the winds are key for interannual sea ice variability in both hemispheres. In the Arctic, the winds enhance September sea ice decline by around 20 to 25%, uh, but they cannot improve the simulation of winter sea ice trends uh, in CSM1. Uh, in the Antarctic, uh, winds play a significant role in the model observation mismatch in sea ice trends, uh, but we find that we also need to, to perform an additional SST adjustment to improve the overall uh, hemispheric Antarctic sea ice trend. And then for AMOC, uh, we show that winds uh, set the phasing and influence the mean state of AMOC. But interestingly, they don't uh, uh, act to increase the multi decadal variability uh, to bring it in more in line with the rapid observations. Um, and then uh, finally, just to say, I didn't really have time to show here, but I'm working on some preliminary results with the NASA GIS um, Model E which I think is an interesting uh, point of comparison as it's an independently developed model that has a much simpler sea ice component and it's also coarser in spatial resolution. Uh, and so uh, stay tuned for um, more on that. And so uh, with that, those are the, uh, the three references that I talked about. I'm happy to take questions now and if, uh, if we don't have time, uh, feel free to shoot me an email. Thanks. Thanks, Letty. So I think we have time for a question. If anyone in the room or online has one. Oh, David's <clears throat> going up to the microphone. Yep. Yeah, is this on? Oh, sounds like it. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Letty, for a great talk. And uh, I wonder if you could comment a little bit on what your, your Arctic results mean for sort of priorities for parameterization development, um, if that's I guess I could see it either way being like, oh, we really need to improve the wintertime parameterizations, because that's where you're finding the largest biases. But, but in some sense, the change in the bias is largest in the summer, if, if I understood right. it right. So I, I, yeah, just curious for your thoughts there. Yeah, yeah I mean, um, the, way I, the way I was uh, would kind of think of this was that the fact that we were able to capture the atmosphere very well throughout all seasons, and then we are able to capture the sea ice in September suggests that things in the sea ice component are doing what they should in that season. Um, and the fact that the winter ones were more different, um, and, I, and I also have a bit more analysis that I can show here. Um, we link these spatially to, uh, to the Atlantic. Um, so to me, that, that points much more to, to the importance of ocean bias season in that season. Thank you. Thanks so much, Letty. So I think we'll move on to the last talk from the session. Um, so Letty, if you can stop sharing your screen. Um, and then Chinghua, I hope that you're online and can share your screen. So Chinghua Ding is gonna- Yes, Great, is gonna follow up on some additional nudged wind um, work, I believe. Um, okay. So yeah, Chinghua, if you 
want to put it in presenter mode and take it away, that'd be great. Thank, Thank you very much. much. And I, I hope my voice is uh, loud enough, enough for people in the room to hear. Yeah, it sounds OK. Yep. OK. Yeah, thank, thank you, you uh, very much. much. Uh, it's, it's good, good to, to present, present this talk, talk after, after the first AR talk, talk so people know AR a lot a better. Uh, uh, so, so the talk today is, uh, uh, the main goal of today's talk is to try to argue, uh, uh, try to understand the, the AR change in, like, like the, the over the past, past 40 years, and its role in uh, regulating some ultra variability in Arctic, especially in the summer time. So this is a collaborative uh, project with the many people here, at least here, uh, like Tom Bollinger from uh, UAF, and also some other people. So you may see the plot in different color scale, uh, but mainly we show the same thing. Uh, so we know the Arctic become warmer and wetter, but also people argue probably the Arctic uh, is a little bit uh, just like a more storm or stormy uh, in the recent de decade. But I think it's still too early to see that uh, if we focus on the particular season, especially in summertime. So let's look at that is the case or not. Uh, so so we, I just simply plot some data from ER5, I think the ER5 just uh, uh, provided data going back to 1940. So this is a very simple plot, just showing a time series over like the 83 years from 1940. So let's focus on the JJA uh, season. So that is the Arctic mean, that's a 70 degree to 90 degree average, and uh, three variables. So Z200, that is the circulation, Japan show high, and the temperature is the whole air column, like a chop sphere, from a surface to 200 meter bar, and the specific humidity. So you can see three curve, uh, just the, uh, the very, very, very in same phase uh, over the period. And uh, but if we focus on the entire period, it seems like uh, there's uh, like the, a slight decline trend. Then just uh, uh, make an upper slope. Uh, things are uh, like a 1980. And uh, so it's hard to see there's a very clear warming trend exactly, especially over the whole period. Probably due to the aerosol faulting in the beginning or anthropogenic faulting in the later period, or maybe due to the like the uh, mixture of uh, many many different uh, agent faulting agent like the internal variability also. Uh, but if we focus on the recent 40 years, we indeed find this uh, increasing trend, especially recent 10 years, uh, just to uh, uh, make this a strong up. Uh, but if we look at ARR, so ARR is still JJA season from ER5. So uh, ARR algorithm here, we use uh, Guan Bin and uh, Wallet, Guan Wallet, sir, version three uh, uh, algorithm. So they're using, it's still uh, just uh, using the uh, scheme to look at IBT and uh, the percentile, I think it's 85 percentile. And you can see if you look at AR, if you look at only for the years period, uh, just the same as the period for this, uh, this the right right uh, arrow, if, if you can find just a slight increase in trend. But if you're going back to the 1940, if you transfer data uh, over the early period, it seems like the AR doesn't change too much in, in some cases. So I think it's still too early. It's still too early to say like AR or the Arctic weather become more stormy, uh, stormier. And uh, we know AR is important. This is the same plot as the first talk show, uh, the first AR talk show. And you can see this uh, another two talk just to show we know AR is so important. Sometimes can just uh, carry a lot of moisture from tropical region to the North America or from uh, uh, like the uh, North Atlantic, uh, like tropical Atlantic to the uh, Western Europe. But I think the study on AR in polar region, especially in Arctic and Antarctic, is still very limited. So this is a very two uh, new study recently published. So one study argue uh, AR is important to determine like the like a heat, uh, like a latent heat release in in the, uh, in the in in the in the, in the Arctic region, especially in the winter time. Another one is uh, argue AR is important to determine like the uh, stability of the ice shelf over the peninsular region. So we know it's important, but we we still are uncertain to know. Is the uh, underlying uh, dynamics. Uh, so let's look at the long term change of uh, JJAR uh, over these 40 years because we know there's a trend uh, over this period and the data is more reliable. And uh, we start with the JJAR, like a mean, just like a mean value in JJA, 40, 44 years average. And uh, this is a climatology. So you can see that the, the value here means uh, this a currency, just like the, uh, the, the, the unit is like a case or days per month. Yeah. Sorry? Any, any question? OK. OK. Yeah, so the plot here shows just 
the, the plot here just to show like the uh, if you see this number is a three, that means that every month maybe uh, or just a location uh, three days we will see uh, we experience experience the air activity and you see this is the climatology plot uh, in observation and this is a long term trend it's over forty four years and uh, the the trend unit here is like the zero point three or zero point four uh, uh, per month per decade so it means that every ten years. Uh, climatologically, there is uh, observed like three, but every ten years, this three will increase by like zero point five, zero point four. And uh, and another thing is that we see this AI is not uniform; it's quite uh, like the regional feature there. The most important region we see this AI increasing trend is over uh, Western Greenland, and uh, we call this the East Siberian, Siberian uh, Eurasia region. And some part, some location, some places over in Northern Europe, it's not very significant. Okay, we try to understand why is that. And uh, so we looked at all the variable together. So this is the trend of the temperature, air temperature in JJA over the whole air column and the humidity also over the whole column and air activity, same as a previous plot. And uh, the trend of the like job tension of high C. This, this pattern shows some, some feature we call the, like the, like the uh, like a high pressure over Greenland, like a pattern. And uh, same, same thing for the other three fields. We also see like a maximum increase in trend over the same location. And uh, if we plot pan Arctic air activity, like this plot, this is from January to uh, uh, December, like each month we look at this trend and the climatology, we know the summer season is a time AR can have more potential to influence uh, uh, polar region because it's understandable thing uh, like the, the migration of the jet stream right during summertime uh, the jet uh, located uh, uh, northward to most uh, to the uh, to the most northmost location and also uh, or for the trend is a right curve you see also have a increasing trend of this air activity in summertime. But the magnitude is not as strong, it's only 0 0.1, 0 0.2. It's very, uh, it's marginally significant. And if you only look at the Greenland region, this is a place with the largest maximum air increasing trend. It's also see this a trend occur around the like summertime. Uh, but if we look at the model, so here is a show the climate model, just like a, a semi six model, historical one over the same period from 10 different uh, members, different model. Uh, things that like IVT is not available from, it's not available from all the models. We only, we only find 10 members provide this variable. So we look at IVT from 10 member and add them together to this, to this trend. We find uh, if you compare a model with the ERA5, we find it's very different. In yeah, observation, we find that there's a high pressure over Greenland and uh, maximum uh, increase in trend of uh, humidity and the temperature and the air. But in the model, if it falls by CO2, uh, uh, driven by CO2 uh, almost, uh, you can see uh, uh, it's more like a uniform change and air change shows something like the, from this, uh, the Pacific uh, through this uh, Bering Strait uh, intruding into the Arctic Ocean or from the Atlantic Gateway, uh, rather than from this uh, Greenland uh, to, the, to uh, like a Baffin Bay area. Uh, so we know the model world, like the behavior, is very different from the real world because the real world, so many things uh, work together to 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 shape this pattern. But in the model, uh, the CO2 change may not uh, explain the full story. Uh, so we so we try to focus on observation again and let's see how this the field talk to each other or couple to each other. So we have a like four field uh, Z200 circulation, temperature, AR, and humidity, and. Uh, we just try to see how they couple to, to, to each other. So you can find a strong coupling uh, between any two pair. And so here we just show an example, just if we just look at how AR coupled with the Z200, we're using some method called a uh, SVD or SMC analysis between the two fields. But before we do this, we remove the trend. We find a really strong coupling between the two patterns. That is the high pressure over here and the favorite increasing over like to Baffin Bay and some increasing over Eurasia and a decreasing over other two locations. And this vector is the uh, is a wind vector, just like a JJA zonal mean wind anomaly associated with this circulation pattern. So from this plot, it seems like the the wind, like the JJA uh, JJA signal mean wind anomaly and uh, can just uh, play a very key role, like a steer more AR uh, um, move into this area or also like over this area. So this is this, this coupling occur on like year to year uh, uh, time scale. So if uh, on long term scale there's a circulation trend, we assume probably there's a circulation trend. We also favor uh, more currency of this uh, AR event. And this AR event will bring or uh, carry more moisture uh, into this place. 
So we can, that's why we can explain why strong uh, Z, Z200 uh, can induce a stronger uh, humidity change here. Maybe it's through this AR. We also looked at daily, like a short time scale connection. We found this one. The main argument here is that we do composite and there's two curve. One curve is AR, another one is a humidity over, over some key domain. You'll find once AR start to like onsite time and the, the humidity start to just build up and also start to rise. This indicate uh, specific humidity in the polar reading RT is a highly driven by the AR uh, event. This is the main argument we find from main uh, point we try to argue through, through the select. But then we do something, try to remove AR related to specific humidity from uh, ERA5. So we just find if every six hour data in JJA, when there's an AR, we just remove that AR related is the specific humidity from that spot or from some like a, like a region around that air activity. So we do that every six hour and then we use the residual field to do the reconstructed humidity, like a monthly monthly data. Then we look the trend again. So by doing by doing this, we somehow assume we can remove air in impact. Then we look the trend again, we find that without air impact, it seems like the, the trend decreased by this number. So that means the AR can explain like a 30% of the uh, the mountain trend over like the West and Greenland, Northern Europe, and East Siberia. So this is our like a statistical way to estimate the AR impact for its most mean trend or the three locations. Uh, the last two slides I try to show is that we also try to quantify this using CSM1 and CSM2. CSM so in CSM1, we just uh, also do a nudging experiment, but here we're nudging the wind anomaly. And uh, But this wind anomaly, we try to mimic this the wind trend. So the wind anomaly is like constant wind. Just like the, in JJA, each time step, we give them some wind pattern constantly every same six hours, same wind speed over the same location. But this wind pattern is very similar to the, the observed wind trend over the past four years. So we have a three set experiment, one control one, one like control one plus is a wind trend, constant uh, trend pattern. Another one is a wind trend plus an asphagenic fogging, uh, like a more CO2 something. And each one have a 40 years, and we looked at AR in each event, in each one, and we calculate the difference we show here. So by giving wind, and we see AR indeed increase over some location we observe in the in ER5. And uh, and this by using wind plus CO2 forcing, it doesn't change too much. So it seems like the, in CSM1, uh, AR activity is still very sensitive to this the wind pattern. If we give this wind change, like a steering flow impact the air can respond pretty quickly, uh, very sensitively. Uh, the second one test is using CSM2 large sample. Just a, this is a 40 member average. Uh, look at the trend, 40 years, uh, same period. It seems like AR is, it doesn't show a similar uh, uh, feature as observation, uh, as, as here observation. But then we looked at sub, like a subgroup individual member. We try to see if a one member by chance find the AR uh, a trend over Greenland, how circulation pattern looks like, how, how circulation trend looks like. We find it's a pretty similar like observation, just uh, this is sub of the CSM2, uh, a large example. If a like six group by chance find this increasing AR trend over here in the same same group, uh, this uh, is a trend of the uh, Z200 also show there's a high pressure. It's a very similar to observation. Yeah, so yeah, I will try to go to my take home message slides. So we see from our uh, analysis, uh, we try to argue low frequency circulation is important. And uh, this can explain this, this much of a variability. And uh, this, is the, this is important, uh, the mechanism we think. And because of this AR transport related to the moisture change to the Arctic, uh, it, it can determine many, many other things to induce the uh, local feedback. Another thing we want to argue is that circulation may not change the moisture through this persistent, persistent moisture transport, uh, but through this uh, somehow like the surge of the moisture through the AR event. Yeah, I want to stop here and take any question uh, you may have. Thanks so much. Um, really interesting talk. So I think we have a question in the room. Christine? Christine. I thank you for that talk. It was really interesting. Um, have you considered um, looking at different 
atmospheric river detection tools to test the sensitivity in your trends. I don't think it's going to be that sensitive with, with your synoptic results, but for your trends, it may be quite sensitive. I think you said you were using Guan and Walliser. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, I will do that. But, uh, you know, somehow it's, the, it's not available online, you know. So, yeah, I, I like to, to test all available to see the, how the sensitivity might result to the, especially like a trend to the different uh, agor yeah, algorithm. Thank you. Yeah, yeah so just, just so, so you know, the um, Atmospheric River Tracking Method Intercomparison Project has a, did a sensitivity uh, test across reanalysis. Um, and so there's ERA-5 and JRA-55 that are available across multiple ARDTs, including Guan and Walliser. And some of them are polar specific, so you may want to try to download that. So if you can just check out the web page, and if you have... Uh, an issue there's you can email the names on the on the website okay thank you thank you very much really really nice great yeah comments suggestions thank you are there any other questions or any questions online oh. um i have a question can you hear me Chinghua? yes <laughs> uh so it's it's pretty late here so apologies if you mentioned this and i just missed it but um uh, so how much of that pattern do you think might be internal or forced, right? That kind of West Greenland sort of uh, Baffin Bay increasing atmospheric rivers and, and like um, JJA warmth. Yeah, I think it's, it's a good, it's a very good question, but I don't know because the, uh, my study over the past years uh, indicated is the part of them is the tropical driven, but the, the issue is that the tropical forcing pattern may also driven by anthropogenic forcing. Right, so I, I don't know. Uh, it's hard to, it's still too early to, to argue it's purely internal. I just want to say that it seems like the climate model cannot capture if only consider locally uh, uh, radiative uh, aspergenically, aspergenically driven things. Model cannot capture, doesn't favor that pattern. So maybe aspergenic forcing driven a particular aesthetic pattern in the tropics, that pattern can drive the tidal action move to the propagate into the RT and generally the high pressure over Greenland. Yeah, but then now I think the model has some limitation to fully capture this the region from the tropical to the polar region. So uh, I don't know the yeah, still need to more time, more study to understand this the linkage. Thanks. So Thank Ching you. Ching Wa, if I understood your CESM two results where you showed that a subset of, were you, just to make sure I understood correctly, were you showing yeah, that sub a subset of the ensemble members simulate the kind of trends you see in the observations? Yes. So if we the, just uh, pick up, yeah, cherry picking some member by, okay. by purpose, yeah, yeah, by design, not just the, we, it's because if you look at 40, yeah, the, when you show that uh, online in our Shia archive, is only 40 member available, it's not like total, like 100 member for the IVT. Uh, so I only find a foreign member, and if you if you look to example me, a foreign member it doesn't look like the observation. But if we only pick the six of them or ten, uh, like seven of them, we show some like the maximum increasing trend of air over Greenland region. That six member gave us come up with a Z200 or the like the like the over Greenland. It's very similar to observation. So this tells me probably this observe, observe the pattern like the coupling is somehow due to this internal variability. Uh, because if you only look at the subgroup, that's not due to the asphagenic forcing, right? So mainly due to some like internal like spread of the member. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Very interesting talk. So we, um, for those of you who weren't here right at the beginning, the next talk actually is canceled. And so instead we're going to have a, a brief discussion. We only have 10 minutes before the break. Um, so I'm going to put up some slides. And Hansi and Dave are going to come up too, <laughs> in case you forgot. Um, Dave will circulate the microphone. Oh, Dave's circulating the microphone. I got to do one thing to oh, and see okay. if I'm mine. Yeah. All right, so um, let's see. 
Let me just get this up. So I was going to give a little background on, on this discussion topic. Um, and we don't have a lot of time to discuss, so we might be gathering people that want to discuss further um, afterwards as well. So this discussion topic on better integrating models and observations to improve both sea ice models and the application of sea ice models in um, climate models uh, came out of our winter working group meeting. So in the winter, um, we had our polar climate working group meeting. You can see some photos on the top there from that. And the week before, Mosaic had their meeting here in Boulder as well. And so there were actually a lot of Mosaic um, observers in town that stuck around for the Polar Climate Working Group meeting. And so it seemed like a really nice opportunity for the observers in the group and the modelers in the group and people who sit in both camps um, to, to think about um, revisiting the question of better integrating models and observations. And I say revisiting because, I don't know, 15 years ago, a long time ago, Jen, I'm looking at you, because Jen Kay was one of the people involved in this effort. And, Alex Yan and Francois Massenet, um, we put together a couple documents on kind of best practices or needs in terms of using observations to improve models. Um, but we thought, you know, it's been a long time. There's amazing new satellite data available, other remote sensing data available. Mosaic has an incredible wealth of data that people are using to understand sea ice. And so we thought it might be worthwhile to revisit this question. Um, and so we kind of formed a group of people out of that meeting who were interested in the topic. We started coming up with an outline, which is what you can see here. Um, and we thought that maybe we'd you know, write a, a review paper or some kind of article for BAMS. So I guess I wanted to make this group aware of that um, and see if there are people in this meeting that would like to be involved in this effort. Um, there was just an IGS meeting, uh, International Glaciological Society Sea Ice meeting, last week, um, where some of this information was discussed at um, at least the Cl uh, Clivar um, working group session. Um, so anyway, yeah, what do, I don't know, people have thoughts, comments? Um, people want to be involved? Dave has a microphone. Okay, I see. Yeah, sorry if this was discussed before, but um, the monthly sea ice averages, and I say this, I'm you know, giving a talk tomorrow, a little bit of self-advertising, but using the monthly sea ice averages and then attempting to sort of interpolate is something that I went through. And um, for AMIP style runs, that not being available on a daily scale is actually kind of a problem. But also, you know, uh, I made it my own forcing, and so I'm wondering, if there's a way to do that, you know, and if not, then I've, you know, that's something I've gone through, but ways to actually create a MIP style simulation. So SST, CIS conditions where it makes internally a lot of, you know, a lot of sense. Yeah, that, that's a good, that wasn't a topic that we discussed in this because it was a bunch of sea ice people that were really, um, but in terms of uh, observational needs and, uh, you know, how to define the sea ice in AMIP simulations. Um, I think that's a good additional example. I mean, we do have daily model output, right? So a lot of us now look at this, the daily output for the sea ice model and not monthly. Um, and there are daily um, observations as well. So, you know, I think there's, it might be low hanging fruit to actually make something that's quite reasonable um, to, to accommodate that. So yeah. So in the front. Oh, Dave's Dave's carrying it around. So. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, sounds great. Um, I'd like to be involved, especially in the melt pond parameterization, because now we're going to have the melt ponds going forward daily on the ISA two data product. I just got the grant to do that. So I'd love to see, it rolled in this morning, that's the bragging. <laughs> so yeah, I'd really like to see how the community wants the ponds and also at this point, perhaps there is possibility for tweaking within the constraints of the data collection. Yeah. I'd also like to be the 27th co-author on that review paper. <laughs> <laughs> 
But no, it would be fun to see how the community, now that we have a whatever, collect, and the ponds go down to 30 meters, seven meters, depending on how we do them. And it's definitely a subscale problem and sort of artificial intelligence type things to be incorporated. So all that sounds cool. Yeah, and I think like that's an that's a really nice example of some of these amazing amazing data sets that are coming online that I think the modeling community should be taking better advantage of. So, yeah, so we'll we'll make sure on the, you're on the mailing list for all this. Uh, I was wondering if I could put Jen on the spot here, so because <laughs> uh, I think you led the the previous effort to do this, and I wondered if you had any thoughts about like successes, struggles, lessons learned before we re reinvent the real wheel on this effort. Yeah, I will say there's always a need for these kinds of efforts. It's ongoing. Um, being specific really helps. If there's specific actionable things that you can give as advice, like I think that was tree in the back. Um, yeah, I was thinking there's been a lot of work done on atmosphere only simulations and how to specify the CIs. That's not a new topic, like, and presentations in this group on that topic too. So some of it I think is just assembling collective wisdom and other is um, providing guidance on new measurements and what to do with them, which really is a fun conversation. And so I encourage you to get involved with it. It's quite fun. Um, just back to tree, like, one of the things that's really important is not just the distribution of ice, but also how thick it is. Um, a lot of the atmosphere-only simulations, they assume the sea ice is two meters thick, <laughs> and so you don't have the same types of fluxes coming through it that you might if you had a more realistic sea ice distribution, which you can imagine matters quite a bit because not a lot of the ice is two meters thick anymore, right? So things like that, that there's been work done on it, and it's just nice to have it summarized somewhere. And I'll... I'll chime in on that too. It's not just the mean thickness in a grid cell, it's the subgrid scale thickness distribution. And Laura actually has a nice paper looking at how important that is for changing surface fluxes, that that subgrid scale distribution of the thickness is important for what the atmosphere feels as well. So, you know, and then we can talk snow too. So, yeah. Um, anyway, I, but I, thanks, John. I think the helpful comments. Yeah, Rudra. Yeah, this, I think this is a great initiative, and I would be very much interested in coupling, like merging these observations to the modeling part. I am specifically super interested in the precipitation on sea ice mechanism. I was talking to David about that earlier as well, like how well it's represented, and then maybe a strong coupling or like con conversation, like connecting that atmosphere to sea ice, which we might be missing, might help us in improve this the sea ice predictions or like changes happening in the sea ice. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. So I, I think from both what Rudra and Tree have said, maybe expanding this to not just be sea ice, but also the, that coupling aspect um, could be a nice addition. Yeah. Oh, oh. oh sorry. Uh, so I have a question. I mean, I never used the sea ice model. But uh, I'm really curious about what the state of art of the data assimilation and the observation and the quality of the data set and how it performs when we turn when we switch the nurch system on. I'm really curious about this. Thanks. Yeah, so things like the state of the data assimilation, uh, these nudged kind of things. So there Dart does work with SICE in terms of data assimilation. Um, we, and there are individuals that are involved with the Polar Climate Working Group have been doing quite a bit of work uh, with data assimilation within SICE. So um, in particular, people from Cecilia Bitz's group at University of Washington. Um, but a lot of us here at NCAR have not been using um, that data assimilation capability. And I'd say that we don't the Polar Climate Working Group isn't really supporting kind of an out-of-the-box data assimilation capability um, for SICE. So, so it is a, something that's available, and the DART group has, has worked pretty closely with some of the sea ice folks to make this work well, and um, they've invested a lot of time and effort in that. But it's not something that we kind of support as a standard, um, you know, use case. So 
I think that might change in the future, but um, because there's a whole effort across CESM to have data assimilation across the coupled model. Um, but it's not something kind of on our polar climate working group to-do list right now, partly because we're resource constrained. <laughs> and yeah, Dave, correct me if I said something wrong there. I had one quick question based on what Jen said about the CI's thickness. I remember that earlier, the, the PCWG mentioned that they're increasing the vertical levels in the upcoming models from five to eight or eight to more. I'm, I'm curious, is that still happening? Are we still increasing the vertical levels for sea ice thickness or not? So within the sea ice model, we use eight vertical layers within the sea ice. Um, and that's in part to better resolve the salinity profile and Part of the reason to have a salinity profile is that then you can have nutrient fluxes and better simulate biogeochemistry within the sea ice. So we have better resolution, but we don't yet use biogeochemistry within the sea ice. So that's a hoped for to do for CESM3. Yeah. Okay. So there was a, a chat that just saying we could email Ben Johnson about the um, status of DART and sea ice. So, okay, yeah. great. Thank you. So yeah, email Ben Johnson if you have yeah. an interest. And I'll, in and I'll just add on to the resolution question. We also have three layers in the snow, um, but we're not increasing it further than that for CSM3. <laughs> yeah, so I think we're, we're eating into our break time now. <laughs> and Hansi's looking at me. Um, <laughs> and so I think we'll break, but if people in the room um, didn't chime in and they would like to be involved in this effort, please just reach out. Just send me an email um, or put something on our, we do have a Polar Climate Working Group Slack channel too, um, so you can reach out that way also. If you're not on the Slack channel and want to be, um, send me an email. Okay, thanks. Everybody.
I'm Rico. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, I don't, when I try to share here, it doesn't show the PowerPoint, but when I share it in the green room, I can see it. Um, it, yeah, it, I mean, it only gives me an option for the desktop, but if that's okay. Thanks, Hansi. Uh, sorry for the long title. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Ian Baxter, and I'm a PhD student from UC Santa Barbara. Um, and before I start, I want to acknowledge my uh, co-authors, Chinghua Ding, Hailong Wong, and Tom Ballinger. I also want to acknowledge discussions with Dave Bonin and Wei Ming Ma. Um, and I also want to acknowledge support from the Highlight Rasm project team, uh, the DOE SCGSR program and the CSM Polar Climate Working Group, um, the working group in particular that helped us with running these moisture tagging simulations that I'll show. Um, why are we interested in looking at precipitation in the Arctic? Um, well, here on the right, I'm showing a plot from Pithin and Young 2021. Um, and if you look at the third panel from the top in particular, um, what we see is that in the Arctic, the relative changes in precipitation are happening at a much faster rate than anywhere else in the world. And this is kind of speaking to a lot of talks that start with Arctic amplification. And so um, changes in precipitation are happening um, at an amplified rate compared just like things like temperature and sea ice loss. Um, there are two kind of major uh, frameworks or theories that have been tried tried to use to explain these changes in the polar hydrological cycle. Um, one in particular is the moisture avail availability hypothesis. Um, and this just kind of simply says that uh, decreases in sea ice, increases in sea surface temperatures in the Arctic, as well as increases in polar, poleward moisture transport, increase moisture availability that then increases precipitation. Um, there's also a kind of competing uh, hypothesis, the radiative hypothesis. Um, and what this kind of broadly says is that radiative cooling constrains precipitation because uh, this radiative cooling of the atmospheric column or this on a regional scale maybe um, needs to be balanced by latent heat release um, for conser conservation purposes um, through precipitation. Um, today, I'm going to focus on the moisture availability hypothesis because we're using this moisture tagging approach um, and what I want to say to compare it to previous studies and kind of give you some motivation for the approach that we're taking is that previous water tagging studies have generally looked at decadal means um, on the scale of like 20 to 30 year means, um, and they've generally used the free running CSM. So um, the approach that we wanted to take is using a nudging approach similar to the one that you might have seen in the previous session shown by Letty. Uh, so we have two sets of simulations. The first simulations are CESM1 and CESM2 simulations uh, using the fully coupled configuration um, with fixed CO2 concentrations. So this is the difference between our simulations and Letty's um, fixed to 1979 levels. 
And we nudged winds within the Arctic. So from 60 to 90 degrees north, from 1979 to 2020, to UNV from era five. Uh, the second set of simulations and the ones that I'm gonna focus on more are these ICSM-1 water tagging and nudging simulations. Uh, so for these, we nudged UNV just the same as we did in the CSM-1 and 2 nudging simulations above. Um, but this time we also nudged T. Uh, in addition to that, we also nudged Q or specific humidity in the very lowest atmospheric layer closest to the surface. Um, and we also took an AMIP style approach as opposed to using the fully coupled configuration where we prescribed uh, ERA-5 SSTs and CIs uh, globally. The idea with these kinds of changes from the um, previous nudging simulations was we wanted to try and attempt to replicate to our best abilities uh, the kind of era five total precipitation changes within the Arctic. Um, and we thought that nudging temperature Q as well as um, using this AMIP style approach would help that. Uh, another motivation or goal with this kind of these changes was to try and characterize trends in um, particularly the sources of moisture contributions to changes in Arctic precipitation. Um, the map on the left, I'm showing the tagged water source regions that we're using in these moisture tagging simulations. So we have seven regions. Uh, the one that um, you're gonna see most often in terms of like all the time series that you see is we're averaging over this kind of Arctic or local domain. And this is just over the ocean and sea ice. Um, and this is going to be considered, again, our local domain. Uh, we also have two land domains. Um, one is North America and Greenland. One is Eurasia and Africa. And then we have two uh, domains for the North Atlantic and South Atlantic. And then, again, the North Pacific and South Pacific. Um, to kind of show you how well we're capturing era 5 precipitation in the Arctic uh, with our nudging approach, um, here I'm showing on the right total precipitation in terms of the relative precipitation anomaly. Um, and I'm defining that relative to a 1980 to 2000 climatology. Um, and I'm showing it from the different simulations. So CSM1 with nudging in green, CSM2 with nudging in orange, um, the ICSM1 with the nudging and tagging in purple, and then ERA5 in black. Um, hopefully, what you can see is that from CSM1 and C the CSM2 with nudging, um, we're not really capturing much of a trend, um, but we are still capturing a lot of the kind of year-to-year -year variability. Um, it's when we also nudge to temperature in particular that we're really capturing the era five total precipitation changes um, over the historical record. Um, and the detrended correlation between our ICSM1 total precipitation um, and the era five total precipitation is about 0 0.83 detrended. And then with the trend, it's about 0 0.87. Um, so we felt pretty good about how well the nudging in particular is capturing total precipitation in the ICSM versus era five. Um, next, what we looked at is the annual cycle. Um, and to show you that in the previous side, we we're looking particularly at an annual means Right. And so here we're breaking it down into the annual cycle and the consistency seems to kind of break down a little bit once we look at higher frequencies. Um, however, and so here I'm showing the annual cycle from those same kind of models in the same colors with ICSM in purple, CSM1 in green and then CSM2 in orange. Um, I've also added here the CSM2 um, parameter perturbation ensemble um, with the present day runs. Um, in the blue shading, just to give you an idea of the uncertainty associated with um, parameter uncertainty and sensitivity. Um, and some of the things that I just wanted to point out here from looking at the annual cycle is we find that with the nudging in particular, we seem to be constraining really well total precipitation during summer in particular. Um, and so if you look at these annual cycle time series, uh, they kind of all converge around June and July. Um, but then it's like in the colder months, particularly in winter, uh, where there's the largest difference between these different simulations, even though they all have the same winds. Um, and another thing to note is that 
uh, with the diff where we're nudging temperature in the ICSM versus not nudging temperature in the other simulations, uh, ECMWF reanalysis tend to have a warm temp surface temperature bias, particularly in these colder months. Um, and so that could be le leading to a very big difference um, during those months. And so uh, taking that um, purple annual cycle curve that you saw on the previous slide, um, and it's now here in black on the upper left panel, um, I'm showing that same annual cycle here in the upper left panel. Um, but now what I'm going to do is break it apart into the different source regions using that isotope tagging um, from our ICSM simulations. Uh, in all these panels, the green curve is showing um, precipitation changes or precipitation um, originating from land-based sources. So here I've added North America and Eurasia and Africa together. The orange is showing precipitation associated with uh, remote ocean-based uh, precipitation. And so this is North Atlantic, South Atlantic, and then the Pacific altogether. And then the blue is showing the local. So that's only within this red region at the very, very top within the Arctic. Um, when we look at the annual cycle in the upper left, and then the kind of annual cycle in terms of the relative contribution to the total precipitation on the upper right, um, we find that it's very consistent with our nudging versus um, what I've seen from free running simulations. So during summertime, land sources seem to be the dominant source, and they're contributing about 65% to precipitation in the Arctic. Um, then in the colder seasons, particularly DJF, uh, we find that the remote ocean sources are playing the biggest role with about 68%. And I think these values are pretty consistent with things that I've seen from like um, Hansi's previous study from 2017. Um, down at the bottom, I'm showing the monthly trends across the era five record. Um, and if you look on the left, looking at the raw trends on the bottom left panel, um, the trends seem to be just like an amplification of the annual cycle. Um, during summertime, the green trend is the strongest. Um, so the land sources, which were already the strong dominant source during summer, um, seem to be getting stronger. Um, and then in the colder seasons, it seems like uh, the remote ocean, as well as the local contributions, seem to play the biggest role because you're not getting so much of a source from the land sources. Um, if we look at the relative trends, uh, the local one actually seems to play a bigger role during summer as opposed to uh, looking at the raw trends. Um, and this is, again, just because uh, the local sources during summer seem to play the lowest, um, the least, the smallest part during summertime. Uh, and so small changes there are giving us really large relative changes. Um, the last thing that I just wanted to show was to show you the circulation patterns that we're imposing with the nudging and then the major pathways shown by um, these vectors here, which are showing integrated vapor transport or IVT. Um, and here, the panels on the right, I'm showing just the IVT and the vectors from land-based sources, so North America and Eurasia in particular. Um, and I just want you to focus on particularly on the panel on the upper right, which is showing JJ or summer. So we know this is when land-based sources are contributing the most. Um, and we see these kind of typical sources or pathways coming from Eastern Eurasia or Siberia. Um, and this is kind of consistent with past studies, um, but the circulation pattern has this kind of high pressure shown by the red shading um, in sea level pressure trends over Greenland and extending into the Arctic. And this is kind of giving us this strong pathway across along the west coast of Greenland. And so hopefully you saw Chingo's talk in the last session and he showed these kind of changes in um, atmospheric rivers during JJA. And it seems like we're capturing this vapor transport and a lot of that source for these ARs could be coming from land-based sources. Um, here, I'm showing the same kind of plots with integrated, integrated vapor transport and the vectors. And um, these ones are only coming from ocean-based sources. Uh, so the Atlantic and the Pacific. Um, and we see a very different um, signal here. During spring on the upper left, uh, we can see that the North Pacific actually seems to be playing a much bigger role. 
Um, and then during fall and winter, uh, the uh, North Atlantic in particular is playing the biggest role. Um, and it's kind of coming up on the Western side of these high pressure signals over Scandinavia and the Earl Mountain regions. Um, okay, just to can kind of conclude and leave you with the major um, kind of conclusions that we saw, uh, nudging of the winds seems to lead to good agreement between CSM 1 and 2 in terms of total precipitation during summer in particular. Um, but if we want to capture the trends um, and replicate era 5, it seemed to help a lot to nudge temperature as well as U and B. Um, the contributions to the annual cycle in terms of land versus room um, ocean or remote versus local seem to be pretty consistent with past free running simulations. Um, but there are slight differences in terms of the trends, particularly in this kind of uh, more prominent role of North American sourced moisture um, during summer relative to maybe Eurasia. Um, and it also highlights the North Atlantic in particular in fall and winter, whereas uh, other studies maybe have looked more found a bigger role of local moisture changes. Um, I also want to just say that the historical precipitation changes seem to be um, really um, impacted by moisture transport. And so this moisture availability hypothesis definitely needs to be considered, not just like a radiative framework, especially when you're getting down to seasonal and monthly timescales. Um, and so with that, thank you for listening. And um, if you have any questions or want to discuss, um, please reach out. Thank you. I think, thanks um, for your questions and comments. Uh, the first part, yeah, I, I separated um, the North America and then the Eurasia Africa signals. Um, during like peak summer, so I'd say like June and July, and even into August, um, they're actually, in terms of the trends, they contribute like equal amounts, which I think was kind of a new um finding from doing the nudging as opposed to the free running simulations where um, I've generally seen studies only look at the Eurasia component, like you mentioned, um, and not really look at North America. And so I think this brings up kind of a new focus on looking at North America as well. Um, and in terms of the second part, uh, separating uh, Africa from Eurasia and things like that, we definitely want to do that. And these are kind of considered for us as like preliminary water tagging simulations. Um, we definitely hope to break apart these regions into much smaller regions and um, focus on more specific areas, like you said. And so, thank you. I, I haven't tried that. Um, I know that Ed had done the like the perfect model kind of experiment in the past using this nudging approach. Um, and I haven't tried that. Um, but I think that's a really good suggestion and that'd be a really interesting study. So may maybe we can discuss that um, in the future. Thanks, Jen.
Oh, yeah, sorry. Everyone can, uh, can go home, Albedo's solved. Um, <laughs> hear Dave laughing. Uh, but if we then break it down a little bit more and look at, for example, the surface fractions, um, now on the right I'm showing uh, the observed melt pond fraction. Again, the observations are in dark blue, the model is in light blue. And uh, we can see that they're, they're completely different. We have uh, far greater melt pond fractions are being represented in the model um, than are actually observed on the ice. And in the coupled context, this is, it's hard to say that much more than this. Is this because we're generating too much fresh water? Is it because we're storing too much fresh water? Is it the aspect ratios off? Is it because the flexibility of the bottoms of ponds is actually higher than we represent? I went to a great talk on that last week. Um, it's hard to, it's really hard to resolve that. And so um, the approach that we're taking here is um, it's actually in a way to simplify the model and uh, take a single column model approach to trying to understand the processes and parameterizations 
that we're using uh, in the climate model. And so the, you know, the, the sort of schematic for how we think about this is instead of running the fully coupled model, we're gonna pull out just the, the column physics component of the sea ice. Um, this is named ice pack. And uh, for the, the inputs to this model, um, to the column physics, we're gonna use actual observed values from the field campaign. So we have atmospheric measurements um, that were made on the ice. We have oceanic measurements that were made under the ice. Um, in the, the upper right there, you can see an example of one of our ice mass balance sites. So these are um, ice thickness uh, measurements that we made manually. Um, and we, we put all that forcing into the ice pack model, which is the exact same code that's being run uh, in the climate model. And now when we get model output, we can do a much more granular comparison um, with the processes. Um, ice pack, I think many people are familiar with. It's just the column physics component of SICE. Um, it contains a, a sort of uh, ice thickness distribution, uh, representation of subgrid scale heterogeneity, uh, prognostic uh, salinity and uh, temperature profiles, melt pond scheme, kind of the whole nine yards. It's really a, a top quality um, sea ice model, at least for, for in the climate model uh, context. Um, so we have the model. Uh, now we also need some observations to do this. Um, oh, and it's, it's a real shame the colors aren't coming through on this screen. For, um, <laughs> so the, the way we, we made these observations was on the Mosaic Expedition, uh, which was a really incredible opportunity to study the ice, ocean, atmosphere, and biogeochemistry and ecological system in the central Arctic uh, over the winter. Um, and so we froze uh, this ship, the German icebreaker Polarstern, uh, into the ice um, north of Siberia uh, in October of 2019. And then we drifted with the ice um, all the way until July 2020 uh, when the ice exited Fram Strait. Um, and on the ice we had um, the image on the right here you can see is a map of uh, some of the many, many scientific installations um, that we had on the ice. Uh, and I'll, I'll be highlighting results from uh, the three green circles there. So it's from Ocean City, Met City, and the Stakes 3 Mass Balance site are what we uh, used for this analysis. Um, so now some uh, kind of preliminary results. Um, I want to actually start by drawing your attention to the uh, uh, figure in the upper right-hand corner here. Um, this is comparing the evolution of the modeled ice thickness at the Stakes 3 Mass Balance site is shown in the, the blue line, um, whereas the dotted orange line uh, with the, the error bars on it uh, are the actual observations. So each spot where we have error bars, that's a time when we went out to this mass balance site and we measured the ice thickness. Um, and uh, this is with no tuning, no parameterization, uh, uh, parameter adjustments at all. Um, right out of the box, the model actually does a remarkably good job of capturing the ice thickness evolution. Uh, so you can probably see that the, um, the, the blue line there falls basically within the error bars um, of the actual observations of ice thickness. Um, there is one major, major caveat here, um, which is that I cheated and I prescribed the snow. So the snow is shown in the bottom, bottom right there, observations versus measurements. And um, for reasons that uh, I'm happy to go into if, if people want to talk about, um, I chose to just use a linear snow uh, precipitation such that we match the, the overall trend in the accumulation measurements for this site. Um, you can also see on the left here that the uh, surface energy balance terms, so outgoing long wave uh, and then the turbulent heat fluxes, uh, are also very, very similar between the observations in the model. Um, so this is um, really, really quite good actually, out of the box. Um, and so now that we have a, you know, this type of case study, um, I wanted to highlight a couple of the different sensitivities um, in the model. 
Um, and the first one I want to highlight might come as a little bit of a surprise, but I, I want to talk about the sensitivity to the initial conditions. Um, and so the ice has a really, really long memory. Um, and so this is now what I'm showing are simulations um, in which I just varied the initial ice thickness by 10 centimeters. So the green line there is if we started with an ice thickness actually 10 centimeters below the observations. The red line is if we started with an ice thickness of uh, 10 centimeters above the, the observations. And uh, I know that everyone's familiar with the, the, the ice thickness, ice growth feedback, but I want to highlight that, it, that on this type of time scale, it actually doesn't have that strong of an effect. Um, so errors in the initial conditions have the potential to, to propagate basically all the way through um, this type of simulation. Um, we're probably all familiar to measurement errors in the initial conditions, um, but I also want to highlight that spatial variability can, can create the same magnitude error. So these results, uh, the blue line at least, is showing is using the stakes three uh, mass balance site. If instead we'd you know, initialized with the stakes three mass balance site, but then validated with, say, the Met Stakes mass balance site, which was only 200 meters away on the, the same ice flow, if you will, um, we would have had a, about this magnitude error um, in our validation. So it's really important when doing this type of field comparison um, to compare with the same, uh, the same actual unit of ice over time. Um, another... Uh, forcing that we, we thought about our sensitivity um, is the, the snow thermal conductivity, um, which you can see here has a, a major impact on the ice evolution, uh, as is, is consistent with you know, lots and lots of research. Um, another, one that was kind of surprising to us is uh, we also looked at the sensitivity to our oceanic forcing, which is the heat flux convergence into the mixed layer. Um, the, the values observed on Mosaic um, vary a little bit, um, but we found that in general the model was actually pretty insensitive to the oceanic heat flux uh, through the winter at least. Um, and this, this kind of surprised us, um, but you know, I think I'm running short on time, so you should uh, ask me later if you want to talk more about this. Because um, uh, I think it's, it's kind of interesting and, and goes against our, um, our priors a little bit. Uh, another thing we can do with this, this kind of model is obviously we can test out different parameterizations. And this is something we hope to do a lot more of in the future. I'm just showing the comparison here um, using the mushy thermodynamics in the blue versus what our ice evolution would have been under uh, Bits and Lipscomb thermodynamics. Um, and then finally, I want to talk uh, very briefly about offsetting errors. So although our overall ice evolution, you know, our thickness evolution looks very good. Um, if we actually break down the ice growth into the components, so in this case, congelation growth and frazzle growth, um, one of the things that jumps out is that we're, the, the model right now is simulating quite a lot of frazzle growth. Uh, about 25% of the growth is coming from frazzle. Um, and so even though the overall evolution of ice thickness is, is pretty correct, uh, we really don't think that there's actually this much frazzle being produced. Um, there was frazzle observed on Mosaic during this time, so it's not, it's not totally crazy that we're getting super cooling uh, in the mixed layer, uh, but 25% but just is, is far too much. Uh, and so that's something we're gonna look into in the future. Um, I'm running short on time, so I'll leave my conclusions up there. Um, I just wanna say thank you all for listening, and our future plans include extending this um, into to looking at snow redistribution, uh, and then focusing really on the melt season processes and getting at the albedo evolution of the ice. So thank you very much. Are there any questions for David? Did you look at the frazzle versus congelation in your Bits and Lipscomb run? Uh, and, and I, I did, in <laughs> fact. Uh, I, don't have a, um, I don't have a slide for that. But yes, if, if you look at the, 
bits and Lipscomb run, uh, we don't have this Frazzle production. Um, and what's curious is if you look at the ice evolution, the, the amount that the bits and Lipscomb is less is, is more or less the Frazzle production. So, um, yeah, so it's sort of, you know, you can, you can it's like whack-a-mole, right? You can maybe correct one error by eliminating your Frazzle production, but then your ice thickness evolution is off. Thank you so much, David. So bringing up our next speaker, it's Laura Landrum. Take it away, Laura. Okay, can you hear me? Yep, okay. I can't really see you, I'm short, but <laughs> that's okay. Maybe I don't need to. <laughs> Anyways, uh, the, uh, the title of my talk on your agenda is The Time of Emergence for Arctic Sea Ice and Marine Ecosystems, and I, I want to change that a bit because I am not at all the sole participant in this project, and um, it's part of a bigger project. And I wanted also to use the opportunity to give kind of a shout out to everybody who works with the CESM as a community model, a community earth system model. There's a tremendous variety of breadth and depth of work that goes on with this model, and um, this is but one of many examples. It's a very long list of collaborators. As a team, we are individuals looking at different aspects of marine ecosystems in the Antarctic. I only show two pictures of team members because when you show a picture of me at work, it's at my laptop, it's not very exciting. But if you see Steph Genouvier holding a uh, emperor penguin chick, you're like, oh, I wanna do that. Or um, that's Sarah Labrosse on the other side, she's tagging an elephant seal. Um, but as a team, we study the oceans, we study ecosystems, we study marine predators, and some of this work has been um, very valuable for societally relevant work, and it builds on previous work where we look, use the CESM-1 to look at differences in sea ice concentration changes and emperor penguin colonies, um, comparing the RCP 8.5 scenario to the Paris Climate Agreement um, two degree and one degree runs. And this work was instrumental in the Department of the Interior Fish and Wildlife Service last fall as listing the emperor penguin as a threatened species due to climate change. Um, so it's just one of many examples that we do work that has a bigger umbrella and picture. Anyways, I, my role in this is to um, look at sea ice and to better understand sea ice in the system, sea ice variability, sea ice predictability, and how sea ice might interact with marine ecosystems. And, um, and sea ice does so in many different ways. Sea ice can inhibit or promote the availability of light depending on when it recedes or advances. Uh, you have some of the polynias, particularly along the Admonts and Bellinghausen Sea, when you get although this one is a picture in the Rossi, um, these polynias can have these phytoplankton blooms in the spring that are just amazing. It's this really green soup of tremendous biological activity and, and sea ice plays an important role. So we're looking at this and the, one of the first things that we wanted to do, um, which we thought was kind of low hanging fruit, we're gonna laugh later at that, is trying to disentangle when does Antarctic sea ice start showing um, changes due to external forcing that separate it from the background internal variability of the system. And briefly, I'm going to, we use the CSM2 large ensemble in this, and the 50 members that are forced by the CMIP6 forcing, and, the, and I will also show some results from the last thousand years of the control run. Now I'm gonna tell you when we initialize these runs because later on that'll be important. These 50 members, um, there were 10 of which, what, which were initialized starting in year 1001 from the control run and then every 20 years thereafter. And then there were 10 members each for four different kind of mini ensembles initialized at 1231, 1251, 1281, 1301. Furthermore, when we look at the time of emergence, uh, we're once again working with a very multidisciplinary team and we put an we put a heavy value on trying to come up with the simplest definitions as we can because we have modeling output, you can do all sorts of statistical gymnastics with it. We have, you know, 
gigabytes of output. On the other hand, when you're looking at Adelaide penguin colonies or southern elephant seals, um, they're much more limited in the amount of data they have. And we want to come up with common definitions whenever possible when we're looking at emergent marine ecosystem qualities, mer emergent sea ice, and that sort of thing. So we started first with a, a relatively simple definition of the year of emergence as being the year at which the ensemble mean or mean plus the variability of the range exceeds the mean base state by two standard deviations of that base state. And by base state, I mean you pick a, a time period. Here is an example that Kristen did with, um, with net primary productivity on the left and zooplankton biomass on the right. This is from Eastern Antarctica. The light gray lines are showing individual ensemble members from the large ensemble from 1850 through 2100. And, and also the um, scenario that we use, and this is the SSP 370, the high emission scenario. The red line shows the 1850 to 1900 mean, and the dashed line show plus or minus two standard deviations. And these are time series for the months of the growing season. So October at the top through March at the bottom. And um, in this case, the year of emergence is when that the mean black line in that range exceeds that of the base period. And you can see that net primary productivity and zooplankton biomass in Eastern Antarctica are emerging um, in the spring seasons and in the summer, maybe not so much. We also are interested in, in a regional perspective because it turns out that the marine ecosystems, are, they're very complicated and they may have different important drivers depending on the region of Antarctica you're looking at. So for example, Adelaide penguins are, I believe, showing an increase in their population in the Ross Sea and decreases elsewhere. And there's, there's a really complex set of interactions. So we want to look at things from a regional perspective. So I'm going to go through these plots a little bit just to orient you because I'm going to show more of them. These are plots that show month on the y-axis, longitude on the x-axis. These are from Kristen Krumhart, and these are showing the year of emergence but based on that same definition as a function of longitude and month, so season and month, for net primary productivity on the left, zooplankton biomass on the right, within the sea ice zone. And she, we define the sea ice zone in this case as the maximum extent that it gets in the winter, the average winter sea ice extent from 1850 to 1900. And from this, you'll see that the net primary productivity is emerging earlier than the zooplankton biomass. And in general, um, Areas around Eastern Antarctica are emerging earlier, and some regions in the Ross Sea, oh, there are maps at the bottom to help orient you, are emerging later. So then I did the same thing for sea ice, and you're kind of like, okay, great, there's some similarities. Sea ice in general is emerging a little bit earlier than the net primary productivity earlier in East Antarctica than it is in, in the rest of the region, and sometimes not at all in the Ross and the Weddell Sea. But if you look closer, you'll notice that I have places, times, and regions that are emerging before the end of my base period. And that's kind of like, oops, got to go down the rabbit hole a little bit, figure this out. Well, it turns out that this happens, I, I use a variety of base periods, right? 1850, 1900, 1950, and whether I use 10 years ensemble mean or a 50 year or a 40 year, this always happens so clearly I need, this is when you go to your team, you say, I, I gotta go away for a little while, and they say, yes, please do. <laughs> Especially if they don't do climate models because you start talking about it like this, and they're like, oh, your model doesn't work. And like, no, my understanding isn't clear yet, so let me go away. And I'm gonna take you on a slight trip through this rabbit hole. Um, I'm gonna come back to that one. So the first thought I had was, okay, well, maybe the sea ice in Antarctica is, is drifting. It's not uncommon, and maybe if I subtract the drift, I can correct for this. So this picture is a time series of the Southern Hemisphere annual mean sea ice extent from the beginning of the control run to the end, 2,000 years. The light gray is the control run itself. The dark blue, or the dark black, the black, of course black's dark, um, is a 250-year running mean of that. And then each of those individual light gray lines are each individual ensemble member from the 50 members of the large ensemble. And the blue are the ensemble averages of those mini ensembles. And then the red line are the t is the value of the 251 year mean. That axis is on the right. And basically the big picture I want you to get here is that it does not make sense to simply 
remove the trend because the trend varies in sign over the time period that these were initialized. And you're like, okay. And, and besides, regionally, there are big differences. So this shows the mean 251 year trend, annual trend, from each of those 14 initialization dates, and the big one on the left, and the right shows from each initialization date. And, and, and then I multiplied it over 251 years just to give you a, a sense of the magnitude. So we're having magnitude changes of 18% sea ice concentration along the outer ice age that vary in sign depending on when the initialization date. So, okay, just removing the mean or the trend or the drift is not gonna work. So I went back and looked at the um, power spectra for Antarctic sea ice. And this is, so this is, again, the annual southern hemisphere mean sea ice from the control run, in this case years 1001 through 2000, after it's had some time to settle a little bit. And the, there are significant power spectra in that sea ice extent at years approximately 5, 20, 75, and 100 at the 95% significance. So in other words, there's extremely high variability in that sea ice extent at those. And, and now remember that these models, oh, and there's a typo. I noticed typos this morning. I'm like, never turn this in late at night. But the 10 members initialized every 20 years, starting at 1,001. And then two mini sets of ensembles, one at 1,231, and then 20 years later. And then another set at 1,281, and 20 years later. And also 1,381 or 1,281 is 100 years past. So anyways, we're initializing them exactly at the peak of the power of the variance in sea ice extent. So you're like, okay. So the next idea is, well, all right, let's look and see when the trends emerge. And this figure is a plot of the trend. The value is on the y-axis as a function of trend length on the bottom axis. The gray area is um, for the large ensemble, con uh, the control run, the 1850 control run, the last thousand years of it. It's got a black line in it that you, it's hard to pick out, but that's the mean, and then there's the range. And the blue is the um, spread of the trends from the large ensemble, 50 ensemble members, and in this case, just starting at 1850. All right, and there's a couple things to notice. Um, one, it doesn't look like we really capture the full range of variability. And that's kind of the assumption you make when you have a large ensemble, is that you have, you capture the full range of internal variability so that you can average out over the large ensemble and then see the mean trends that are due to external forcing. Well, it's not until you get to trend lengths of about 70 years that it looks like you have capture the same range. So, okay. And then, ignoring that, because I can't change that right now, I'm gonna say, okay, let's, let's have a definition of an emergence from the trends and say, okay, the trends emerge at the time at which either the mean or the range of the large ensemble trends exceed that given by the, the uh, 1850 control run. And in this case, um, those fall at roughly, oh, what is it, 100 years, um, so 1950 for the mean and 100, what, 55 years, so yeah, 2005. And you can do this for different time periods. I'm showing you here just as examples, 1850 at the top, 1950 in the middle. So 50 ensemble members at 1950, the range of their trends, and you can see how they're all starting to go negative. And the 1979, just because people always ask, what are the observations showing? And in this case, the observational trends are well within the ensemble spread from the control run, but you can see in the CSM2, we do not capture that in the historical simulations. Nonetheless, I can still calculate a year of emergence based on this. Um, and so you take the year at which you start, so 1850, all the trends at 1850, and, and the length of the trend at the time at which the mean or the range exceeds that of the control run. And that's, a, that's what this figure is. So the solid line is the year at which it emerges for the mean, and the dashed line is for the range, and it still gets a little bit tricky because, okay, which year are you gonna pick? And I just said, well, all right, now I've gone from the mean, the mean isn't a good estimate here for establishing emergence, and maybe the first derivative, the, the trend, I'm going to the second derivative. So when there's no slope in it, that it doesn't change for a while, that's the year of emergence. And using that definition, 
I come up with maps of sea ice emergence. Now, this is kind of, it's recent, so I don't know everything in here. And on the one hand, the range is on the top, the ensemble mean on the bottom. It, once again, now it's a function of month and region, so longitude along the bottom. And um, it emerges earlier over Eastern Antarctica in both, and later over the Ross Sea and the Weddell Sea in both. And the ensemble mean emerges before the range. I, and there's some similarities and differences and a lot to be explored. And I'm running short on time, so I can go back to the conclusions, but I wanted to throw out just some ideas for uh, discussion and future work. Um, and it turns out that the Ross Sea is the region that most models, most climate models, miss the, the observed trends. This figure is showing the mean and the range in um, the Antarctic sea ice area on the top figure and the trends from 1979 to 2014 in the bottom. The red is for the observations, the satellite observations. And the blue is for the CSM2 large ensemble. And the blue line is the mean and the trends. And each individual gray line is an individual ensemble member. And you notice that we do have some ensemble members that have, this just happens to be for March, April, May, which is a season with the biggest discrepancy between model and observed trends. Um, we do have some runs that get increases in sea ice in the Ross Sea in the austral fall. But none of them come close to the magnitude that we see in the observations. And I would just like to throw out there that there are some ideas that Letty threw out earlier today and that have been published in recent works that suggest there's really a lot more to understand about what's going on in the ocean and how the ocean and the sea ice interact in terms of their variability, their mean state, and the trends. Um, recent work has, has suggested that if you correct sea ice drift bias in model output, you'll get closer to the observed trends. Letty showed you some work where you, um, if you nudge to observed winds, you get closer. And if you do winds plus sea surface temperatures, you still get closer yet, but you're not quite there. Um, there is a, a paper out that suggests a high resolution run might do the same thing, although I'm not entirely convinced because I've looked at some of our high resolution runs and that doesn't work. The resolution itself is not sufficient. And Hansi also has a paper out that looks at the internal variability and suggests that if you start with a relatively cold ocean, when you initialize, that you can get an increase in sea ice. But anyways, want to throw that out. You can read the conclusions yourself, and I am out of time. Thank you. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, questions for Laura? Maybe just one question. Hey, Laura, it's a uh, really complicated story, it sounds like. Um, I, <laughs> I wonder if, uh, like for some of these things you're showing, if you could compare with the Arctic, just maybe show how much simpler the Arctic is in comparison, or if that would help. I definitely want to talk to you afterwards. Um, okay, so moving on to our next speaker. So I believe our next speaker is online. Yes, I'm trying to share so, my screen. Yes, yeah, so um, Mark England is going to tell us about robust polar amplification of ice-free climate. Um, relies on ocean heat transport and cloud radiative effects. And so, Mark, I think you need to share your screen. There you go. Hopefully, Hopefully you can, can, you yes, can see, see that. See it. it looks great. Thank you. Okay, okay great. great. Thanks, Thanks very much. much. Um, I will, I will try, try to, to talk, talk as loud as, as I can. can. I'm, I'm trying, trying to not, not wake, wake up a baby in the next room. room. So uh, apologies, apologies for that. that. Um, so, so yeah, yeah this, this is work, work which I've um, done with Nicole Felder at UC Santa, Santa Cruz, Cruz thinking, thinking about polar amplification in, in ice-free climates. climates. Um, and, and we, we, we conclude that there's an important role for ocean heat transport and cloud radiative effects. 
So I think I won't need to introduce to, to this audience the idea of polar amplification and how it's a prominent feature of, of modern climate change. Uh, and sea ice plays a very important role, but there are also other, other feedbacks and processes which can, can contribute to polar amplification. Uh, and so the, the question we examine is, should we expect polar amplification in, in ice-free climates? And so that's relevant for when we think about past equable climates, such as the, the Middle Eocene, which uh, was 50 million years ago, where there wasn't any um, ice in today's polar regions. Or if we think about um, far into the distant future, where, uh, for example, under a, a very high emission scenario, um, we could get ice-free conditions kind of creeping into more months of the, um, of the year. So, so that's, this question is relevant for, for thinking about those two, two problems. And past studies uh, seem to fundamentally disagree on, um, on the answers to that question. So you can either, depending on what studies you look at, you can either come away with a conclusion that polar amplification is a ubiquitous response um, to a, a circulating atmosphere. And so, yes, you know, if you, if you wrote, read those studies, you'd think that you do not need sea ice and you, you should get polar amplification in ice-free climates. Alternatively, there are, there are other studies which suggest that polar amplification is dependent on the presence of sea ice. And so uh, you'd conclude that no, you wouldn't get polar amplification in ice-free climates. So we did a very thorough um, kind of sweep of uh, the literature. We, we focused on uh, comparing slab ocean aquaplanet modeling studies. Uh, here in, in one of the columns shows the polar amplification factor. And there's a wide range in, in, in these results, either getting kind of less than one, which is polar damping, so less warming in the polar regions um, compared to the rest of the world. Um, and then some, for, for example, twos and threes you can see here, which are robust polar amplification. But if we limit ourselves to a very kind of clean comparison, so here we're, we're limiting the studies to those which have no representation of sea ice and which have a full seasonal cycle. And that was an important consideration due to the results of Kimmer Tower 2018, which seemed to suggest that if you didn't have a full seasonal cycle, you could kind of get some spurious uh, results. So we end up with these four studies, um, and two of them, uh, the Kimmer Tower 2018 and Shore and Smith 2022, suggest no polar amplification in ice free climates. Uh, and what we find is that uh, there's systematic differences between the studies which do and do not get polar amplification. So we find that uh, the models which have zero ocean heat transport prescribed in them, so that is the Kimmetau and the Shore and Smith, actually have uh, zero Q flux prescribed. Uh, whereas the, the, the Rizzuto and Biasuti TrackMIP paper and the Langnetau 2012 paper, they prescribe um, an ocean heat transport in their um, slab ocean model and they get robust polar amplification. And so this, this gives us a suggestion that, that maybe that is the, the kind of systematic um, cause of these disparate results. So we, we test this in the CSM2 uh, slab ocean aquaplanet configuration. Here we have a, a 30 meter slab ocean mixed layer uh, and where we don't have representation of sea ice. So the, it can get as cold as it wants without, without freezing. We have a full seasonal cycle and an idealized um, version of the aerosol and ozone input so that we don't introduce any, um, any asymmetries zonally or hemispherically. And we do some targeted experiments. And so we, we, we perform sets of, of one time CO2 and four time CO2 experiments. So here we're, we're thinking about the response to a quadrupling of CO2. Each of these is run for 120 years, and it's done with four different configurations of the, the climatological ocean heat transport. And so that's done by prescribing, prescribing different Q fluxes. Um, so there's four different configurations, but we're going to mostly focus on the first two. We, we can we compare one with zero Q flux, so this is no ocean heat transport, and, uh, and then one with um, 
a uh, Q flux derived from the 1850 control CSM2 simulation. And we also have one from a, a four times CO2 simulation. This has, has no ice in it because all the ice has gone basically by under four times CO2. We also test whether the seasonal cycle plays an important role. Um, the answer to both of those is they don't make a big difference. So we can continue looking at the first two panels, which are comparing zero Q flux with a, the, um, the 1850 control Q flux. So just to emphasize that in these one time CO2 and four times CO2 simulations, the ocean heat transport doesn't change. Um, it's, it's, we're just testing the sensitivity to the climatological ocean heat transport. And the main result we find, and here I'm showing you the, the surface temperature response to a quadrupling of CO2, is that in all three of the, the ocean heat transport experiments, they, we get robust pollen amplification. So in the top right, it's for the normalized by the amount of global mean surface warming. You can see they all get pole amplification um, of the surface temperature response. Whereas this yellowy orange line here, that's the zero ocean heat transport. That actually gets a very different response. It gets polar damping. So uh, it doesn't get polar amplification. It gets less um, warming in the polar regions than the rest of the, the globe. And there's also important differences in the seasonality of the response. So in all of the ocean heat transport experiments, there is quite a subdued um, seasonal cycle of this response with polar amplification occurring in each month. Whereas if we don't prescribe um, ocean heat transport, there's actually a, a very large seasonal cycle with the polar damping mostly occurring uh, in the summer. And that suggests um, that, that short wave feedbacks could be important because of um, when, when that is occurring. And you can ask, you know, can we explain this through some of the most fundamental understanding? And, and we, we, we do that by looking at a, a moist energy balance model. Um, and to skip to the kind of um, end of that analysis, if we look at the bottom, bottom right here, it actually predicts exactly the opposite. It predicts that if we add in, if we go from the, the yellow to the purple, that is by adding in ocean heat transport, it predicts um, that we should decrease the polar amplification factor. So this is the opposite of what we find in the, the CSM2 um, aquaplanet. And so therefore, there's a mechanism which is not included in the moist EBM, which both has to explain the increase found in CSM2 and also overcome this is um, opposing effect from a, a weakened increase in atmospheric energy transport. And what we find after going through uh, simulation results is that it, we, we can identify the, the shortwave cloud radiative effects um, as being uh, the, the cause of, of why the uh, zero ocean heat transport and the ocean heat transport experiments are so different. As shown on the left here, the, the short wave um, cloud radio effects are much more negative in the high latitudes without ocean heat transport. And we can ask why, why is that? Uh, the first reason, so this, this gets a little bit complicated, so I'll try and walk you through it a little bit. The first reason is now we're looking at the, the cloud fraction. And the first row is for the one time CO2 climatology, and, and the, the bottom row is. Uh, the response to an increase in, in CO2. So in, this, in the 1850 ocean heat transport case, there's a lot more um, polar clouds. That's this big blue um, uh, shading at the bottom here um, near the, the polar surface uh, compared to without ocean heat transport. And that means that when you increase CO2, you, you end up losing, you have more clouds to, to lose as shown by this big red color. And so because you're losing more clouds that, that allows you to um, absorb uh, more incoming solar radiation. And, and secondly, it's not just a cloud fraction um, story. It is also one about the, the properties of the clouds and how much uh, liquid water content there is. And so uh, now we're looking at liquid water content. And if we start off with the ocean heat transport, we end up with a moister um, lower troposphere 
um, than if we do not have uh, ocean heat transport. And so because you're starting with a, a, a moister lower troposphere, you actually have less liquid water content to gain as you warm. Um, and so both of those things, the cloud fraction and the changes in liquid water content will, will lead to this um, shortwave um, feedback. And so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of read this out because I think it's rather kind of a complicated story. Um, so adding climatological ocean heat transport produces a, a base climate which is has a higher fraction of near surface polar clouds and a moister lower tropospheric polar clouds. Um, and so you're going to reflect substantially more incoming solar radiation than in the zero ocean heat transport case. So ultimately you have more clouds to lose and less cloud moisture to gain uh, relative to having no ocean heat transport as the climate warms in response to a quadrupling of CO2. So this is our explanation of why you get polar, more polar amplification um, when you have ocean heat transport. And we can um, confirm that it is the cloud radiative effects. So I've just told you a story before, but it's not really a causal kind of analysis. We did some uh, cloud locking experiments where we took the zero ocean heat transport simulation and we prescribed the cloud radiative effects in the higher latitudes from um, the, the ocean heat transport experiment, so from a purple line. And it, this transformed it from a yellow line to this dash line. This is the new cloud locking experiment. And you can see that it's transformed from having polar damping to polar amplification. And so that is saying that, yes, it is the these cloud radiative effects which are um, causing this big difference between uh, our sets of simulations. And it can also be seen in the seasonal cycle. By, by prescribing this, the, the cloud radio effects, we recover the, the seasonality of, of polar amplification. Um, so it, it's really a, a cloud story hidden within an ocean heat transport story. Um, so to conclude, we found that um, introducing ocean heat transport enhances uh, the polar warming um, response to a quadrupling, quadrupling of CO2 and actually the moist diffusive perspective using an EBM would have given us the, the opposite behavior. So that was um, kind of leading us down the wrong path because it didn't include clouds. Um, and the, the, the um, explanation we found is that the climatological ocean heat transport, it really shapes the meridional structure of surface warming through these positive shortwave cloud feedbacks. Um, because the, the ocean atmosphere heat fluxes are preconditioning a larger decrease in cloud fraction without a compensating increase in cloud liquid water. Um, and, and the last bit is, there's a few takeaways here. The first, when we consider the past literature, we conclude that sea ice is not required for, for robust pearl amplification to occur. And we update kind of, um, I guess, the the state-of-the-art knowledge by saying that robust polar amplification is a ubiquitous response of a coupled atmosphere ocean system. We point to the, the ocean um, heat transport as being important. And I guess one takeaway is that um, it highlights the, some limitations in how we interpret climate model hierarchies because we found exactly the opposite behavior in simpler models. So if we looked at the EBM or if we had no ocean heat transport, we got exactly the opposite response that we simulated with um, the more complex model. And these, these um, results have relevance for understanding uh, future climate change as well as um, past uh, climate change in, in equitable climates. So um, I think this was rather a kind of confusing little story. So I have, you have, I've given you kind of hints on potential questions if you don't have any because I don't think I was able to cover everything within the time. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, I think we have time for one question. Hi, Mark. Uh, nice talk. That was really interesting. I'm wondering um, if you've run any simulations like this with sea ice in it, because without it, I'm assuming the Arctic is really warm, so the, the clouds might be quite sensitive to that base state with or without the Q flux? Um, so we haven't, um, 
we, we've done simulations with sea ice, but we haven't changed systematically changed the ocean heat transport um, because we were interested in this in this question of of like the ice free um, conditions. So we we didn't explore um, that particular question. Mark. So on to our next speaker, um, Ivan Matevsky is going to tell us about uh, Arctic amplification at high and low CO2 concentrations. Uh, I'm Ivan Mitevsky. I'm a graduate student at Columbia University, and I'm here to present some work led by Xin Yi Zhu and Yu Chao Liang, which is at the back. And this is about Arctic amplification and seasonal migration from uh, very cold 1 8 times CO2 to 8 times CO2 forcing. So, uh, part of this work is published in, uh, uh, by Yu Chao, and part of it is in revision. So the motivation to study Arctic amplification at high CO2 levels is mostly that the SSP 585 scenario projects around four times CO2 by 2100, and then uh, by 2200, we may get up to eight times CO2. In addition, we have the, um, the paleoclimate, um, which, which says that we might get to that, uh, which has that uh, very uh, high, um, very warm scenario. And also, most previous AS studies are focused on the doubling scenarios. And here, we're not just exploring the doublings. We also go to 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to 8 times CO2. And we also studied the cold uh, climate, which is with decreased CO2. Uh, we want to compare these two scenarios, the CO2 increase and uh, decrease, and see whether they're symmetrical and how they respond. And this is quite important because uh, as we know the impact of aerosols, it has been shown that it actually cools the Arctic more than the rest of the globe. And finally, one, a big motivation for this study is to study the seasonal cycle where we have, uh, during the boreal summer, we have the CO2-induced sea ice melting, then we have anomalous ocean heat uptake, and then in the later months, uh, we have the ocean heat uptake release back to the atmosphere, and then we have the lapse rate and the long wave feedback. It wanted, it, and we wanted to see how will this uh, seasonal uh, cycle change. So we use the CSM1 uh, CAM5 version of the model uh, with POP2, 60 level, and we do 150 year runs for the abrupt CO2 uh, scenarios. We do one eight, one quarter, one half, two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to eight times CO2. We also do some slab ocean experiments with uh, pre-industrial conditions, two, three, up to six times CO2 for 60 years. And we also do the fixed SST runs in order to diagnose the effective radiative forcing. So let's look at the Arctic amplification factor, which is, um, which is the, the ratio of the surface air temperature at the Arctic divided by the global mean. And here, this is only uh, shown for the warm scenarios. And we can see that the two and three times CO2, the uh, Arctic amplification factor weakens. Uh, it stays around 2.3. And whereas at the larger CO2 scenarios, uh, let's say seven and eight times CO2, it weakens. It goes from, starts from 2.3, goes down to around 1.9. And one exception is the four times CO2 scenario where AMOC collapses in that run. So we have large cooling in the North Atlantic and that causes our amplification to be lower. So here, the, the dots are the fully coupled model as a function of CO2, and we see that how the up, uh, amplification factor decreases all the way up to eight times CO2, and we have this, this kink here at four times CO2 where AMA collapses, and when we do the slab ocean experiments, we don't see, um, we don't see that, that kink. We also calculate the seasonal amplitude uh, which is the max minus the minimum of the amplification factor. And we see that that decreases with CO2 in both the fully coupled and the slab ocean model, which tells us that probably the seasonal cycle will weaken at higher CO2. 
So next, we compare the cold Arctic amplification factors, and we find that they're actually larger than the warm uh, Arctic amplification. The, the cold runs are shown here. Uh, I'm not sure. Okay. I'm not sure why the figures are shown like this. Yep, they're high resolution, but okay. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Uh, yeah. uh, it's okay. I can I can point. Uh, you can trust me. So uh, <laughs> uh, these are the cold uh, AFs, and we can see that um, at one eight times CO two, they actually in increase. They're around three, uh, and compared to the warm scenarios, which uh, at eight times CO two, which get down to uh, one point nine. And if we look at um, the, the surface air temperature in the Arctic between, let's say, 8 times CO2 and 1, 8 times CO2, they're quite symmetrical. They're warm and cool comparatively. However, if you look at the global, then, uh, in the global uh, average, then that's where the, the change happens. And that's because we have a weaker radiative forcing in the uh, CO2 decrease than we have in the CO2 increase scenarios. And this is the CIS extent, uh, which decreases in the warmer scenarios and by six times CO2, we are uh, ice free. And then in the col colder scenarios, we have sea ice uh, growth, but the, gr the sea ice growth is quite limited. It just grows a little bit at uh, one, half uh, and one half times CO2, and then one quarter and one eighth, it just kind of stays constant. All right, hopefully this is better. Uh, okay, uh, it's not very. So we have this, uh, the Arctic. <laughs> Uh, surface air response as a function of CO2, and we see that it's quite linear from 1.8 to 8 times CO2. And then we have the CIS extent, which we saw that it uh, weakens and uh, quite a lot, up to 8 times CO2 to ice-free Arctic. And then between one, one half and then one quarter and 1.8 uh, times CO2, we have uh, little CIS growth. And this follows the turbulent heat flux response, which is also quite linear between 1.8 to 8 times CO2, with exception at 4 times CO2. Uh, and then if you look at the Arctic amplification factor, we see that it decreases at warmer scenarios and then it increases at, at colder CO2 runs. So next we look at the individual feedbacks to, to try to see which feedback is actually uh, contributes most to the uh, amplification factor. So we start with 1.8 times CO2, and we on the y-axis is the Arctic temperature change, uh, which is we do a contribution for each feedback, and on the x-axis is the, the tropics temperature change, and we find that it's the Planck uh, in orange, lapse rate in green, and the albedo feedback which contribute the most to Arctic, uh, Arctic amplification. And at 8 times CO2, we also find these three feedbacks to be the most important. Now, to quantify which one is more important, we, we did the equilibrium uh, distance to one-to-one -one line, uh, and we find that in the colder scenarios, uh, the Planck feedback is the most important one, and it's statistically different than the albedo, and then it's, next is the lapse rate. And in the warmer scenarios, we, f we see that the albedo, uh, shown in red, actually goes up at eight times CO2. Um, so next, we look at the seasonal migration of the uh, amplification peak. So here we have the surface air temperature response, the seasonal, and this green here is at two times CO2 with, uh, with a peak in November. And then we see that the peak, as we increase CO2 scenario up to eight times CO2, shown in red, it migrates to December and January. And the surface air temperature in the colder scenarios is kind of locked in um, October. And this well, aligns very well with our amplification factor, which we have uh, to be uh, peaking in November at two times CO2 scenario, shown in green, and then at higher CO2 scenarios, it, it actually goes to migrate to December and January. And in the cold runs, this is locked in November, and it doesn't change. And this follows the, the, the sea ice extent change. So at two times CO2, we have the minimum in, in October, and that is followed with, with the maximum in the um, turbulent heat, heat flux response in November. And as we increase CO2, this, the, the maximum decrease in sea ice extent uh, goes down to January, December, January, and that's when the, the turbulent heat flux response is maximum. 
And for, similarly for the cold runs, we have the CIS extent change to be, uh, to be maximum in September, and that follows also the turbine heat flux to be uh, maximum in, uh, in October. So, so next, if we look at the individual feedbacks and then their seasonality, we find that this is the seasonal migration of the surface air temperature. Uh, we find that the lapse rate and the Planck feedbacks are two which kind of follow this, this migration, the seasonal migration from uh, November to December and January. This is the lapse rate and the cold runs, it's fixed at, uh, in October and similar for the Planck feedback. And the rest of the feedbacks don't show much seasonal, um, seasonal migration. So this was all done with idealized CO2 scenarios. You may wonder whether this is realistic, whether we can find this in a more realistic scenarios. So we looked into the 21st century scenarios, RCP 8.5 and SSP 585, and with the CSM1 CAM5, a large ensemble with 40 ensemble, uh, ensembles, we find that the, the, the peak of the Arctic temperature moves from November uh, it, by end of the, by, uh, 1990 to 2010, and then it migrates from uh, November to December, and similarly with the Arctic amplification factor, moves from November to December as we uh, increase, as we move to a warmer world, and similar with the GFDL model with 20 ensemble members, we see a migration of the temperature from November to January, and same with the uh, Arctic amplification factor. And in the CIMIP-6 models, uh, we don't see the migration. We kind of see this uh, locked uh, surface air temperature maximum is locked in, in December, and similarly with the Arctic amplification factor. However, half of the models show migration from, uh, uh, from uh, November to December, December to January, uh, but uh, half of them don't show much migration, and one, only one model shows the opposite, uh, migration in the opposite direction. So to summarize, we find a weaker Arctic amplification at higher CO2 levels. Uh, decreasing CO2 concentration produces stronger Arctic amplification than increasing CO2. And the peak of warm AA shift gradually from November to December and January um, as the CO2 forcing enhances. And we do, we do find the seasonal shift in the 21st century scenarios. And the peaks of cold AA are locked in October, bounded by maximum sea ice increase. And we find the Planck lapse rate and the albedo feedbacks to be sort of the main contributors to producing a force by CO2 increase and decrease. Thank you. Questions? Questions, yeah. I have a question. Um, this is a super interesting talk. Um, Mostly because I think we've both been doing these warming and cooling experiments, <laughs> and we've we've gone in different directions. So I think while you filled out the full parameter space, um, we went long, <laughs> <laughs> and so we ran out our doubling and having simulations out a thousand years, and we actually found that the warming simulation kind of plateaued and stopped changing, mm -hmm. and the cooling simulations they keep cooling and cooling and cooling and cooling and cooling, and the sea ice edge just keeps on moving equatorward. So oh. it's kind of, and at some point in time, we kind of crashed the model. I think we're getting unstable. I think I talked to Dave about this. Anyways, it's just kind of fun because um, I think for the context of 150 years, this is all true. But right. if you think about like, in terms of a paleo context, I just caution to be a little bit careful with interpreting what, especially the cold climates mean um, for longer term simulations. Um, and I think we could have a really rich and fun discussion, but probably not right now. But anyways, we'll talk <laughs> later. <laughs> yeah, good to know. Yeah. I should probably extend the runs. Anything else? Anyone else? So one question is, uh, uh, why only in the four time CO2 you have the collapsed AMOC? Do you have the collapsed AMOC for six and we eight We do times? have the collapsed AMOC at four, five, six, seven, and eight times CO2 in these runs. And we repeated the runs with the GIST model. Also, AMOC collapses at one point and then at any higher CO2 level. However, the, the, over, the, the warming from, uh, from around the North Atlantic overwhelms the AMOC response at the higher CO2 scenarios. So we see less of a temperature signature in the North Atlantic. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay. 
Thanks so much, Ivan. Hey, so um, coming up on our final speaker, um, we'll hear from Peter Sue, and he will talk about using SICE 5 to explore BKS ice variability. Hello, uh, my name is uh, Peter Seal. I'm a postdoc at uh, uh, Columbia University, and today I'm going to present using C5 to explore circulation ice linkage from synoptic to seasonal time scales. Uh, we know that the atmosphere and the Arctic sea ice form a tightly coupled system. It is pretty sure that the Arctic, uh, pretty sure that the atmospheric circulation has played a role to influence the Arctic sea ice change. However, whether the Arctic sea ice change have feedback uh, to the atmospheric circulation is more uncertain. In this study, we focus on the former link from the atmospheric circulation to Arctic sea ice uh, variability. And we focus on the, the, the Barents and Kara Sea in the winter time, where the sea ice experience the largest uh, wear, variability. Previous studies show that a typical circulation pattern that drive the Barents and Kara Sea ice change uh, loss is a high pressure system on the east side and a low pressure system on the west side of the sea ice basin. However, it is the only circulation pattern that uh, influence sea ice change, probably not. So the first question we want to ask is, what are the most important circulation patterns that drive sea ice change? To obtain all possible circulation patterns, we use the self-organizing maps uh, with a weight size of phi times phi uh, to get the circulation patterns. And the self-organizing map uh, clustering results reveals nine high latitude circulation patterns over the Europe Atlantic sector uh, in the cold season. Some patterns are familiar, for example, like the Cluster 2, which shows a high pressure center over the Scandinavia and a low pressure center over the South Greenland. We usually call this a Scandinavian pattern. Another example is Cluster 4. Uh, it resembles a positive phase of the North Atlantic Oscillation, NAO, uh, which is visible from a bigger map. So to see how these circulation patterns are associated with balanced carrier sea ice uh, change, we composite the day-to-day sea ice change on these individual clusters. And immediately we can see uh, cluster one to four favor balance and carrier sea ice loss. Cluster six to cluster nine favors balance carrier sea ice golf. And in particular, we can see uh, cluster one and two, this type of dipole patterns uh, favored are the most important for balance and carrier sea ice loss. Okay, so far we have established the link between the circulation patterns and the sea ice change. Uh, how about the mechanism? How such circulation patterns drive the sea ice loss? Uh, using cluster 1 as an example, such circulation patterns induce a southerly flow, uh, which can bring the heat and moisture from lower latitude to the sea ice basins, enhance the surface sunward first, and then melt the sea ice. This pathway is highlighted by previous studies. However, uh, 
the softly fold induced by such circulation pattern can also uh, push the sea ice over here towards the poles through a dynamic uh, pathway. So which one is more important? We can use the C5, uh, which, which is known as the sea ice component in the CSM2 to assess the relative role of the two pulses. Uh, we firstly used the reanalysis product to, to force the sea ice models, the, C, uh, the C5. And the C5 decompose, C5 simulates the sea ice change uh, from the dynamic and thermodynamic components by responding to those realistic atmospheric forcing. This this is the sea ice equation uh, used in the model, where the total sea ice change can be decomposed into the dynamic change and the thermodynamic change. Dynamic change refers to the sea ice motions and its convergence. And thermodynamic change uh, over the surface layer of the sea ice are calculated by those uh, surface energy budget terms and are uh, conducted uh, and a thermal conductivity term within the sea ice layers. Oh. Uh, before going into the results of the decomposition, we can uh, we first want to see whether the sea ice models can reproduce the observed sea ice change. And this figure shows a summary of uh, the day-to-day -day balance carrier sea ice change over different uh, cluster. As I mentioned before, cluster 1 to cluster 4 favor sea ice loss, cluster 6 to cluster line favor sea ice growth, evident in the observations shown by the gray box spots. And the C5, when it is forced by the realistic uh, atmospheric forcing, it agrees with such relationship as well as uh, and another model, PO maps, also agree with this. Okay, given that the sea ice model can reproduce the uh, observed sea ice change, we can go to see how the C5 sea ice model uh, decompose the two components. Again, we use the uh, cluster one as a a a example, we can see thermodynamic process and dynamic process. They both contribute to balance and carrier sea ice loss with similar contribution. For sea ice thickness or volume change, we can see the contribution by thermodynamic process is very weak, whereas the dynamic process dominates. And from the dynamic sea ice thickness change, we can see a uh, clear sea ice redistribution following the sea ice motions, which are shown as the water. Sea ice uh, over the balance and calcium are pushed towards the poles, and part of it is exported along the east coast of the uh, Greenland. And uh, the import role of the dynamic process is not only limited to a certain cluster. Similar results can also apply to other cluster and another sea ice model, PO maps. Uh, okay, so far we estimate the length between the physical length between the circulation patterns and the sea ice loss on very short time scale. How about the sea ice loss? Sea ice loss on longer time scale, such as the weekly sea ice loss, monthly sea ice loss, or uh, uh, sea ice loss over a season, and we find that the uh, sea ice loss over a longer time scale can be ex partly explained by the persistence of those day-to-day -day circulation patterns. Here shows the scatter. 
Here shows the relationship between the persistent days of the circulation patterns that favor sea ice loss and the accumulated daily sea ice change. We can see a negative relationship, implying that uh, when the circulation patterns persist, uh, larger sea ice loss. Similar message can be applied on uh, seasonal sea ice. So this figure, uh, color bars from this figure are showing the frequency of uh, circulation patterns in individual winters. Red bars represent the circulation patterns that favor sea ice growth. Blue bars represent the circulation patterns that favor sea ice loss. And we can simply create a circulation index by considering the balance of the red bars and the blue bars, which results in the gray line. And we see that this gray line is correlated with the wintertime seasonal sea ice gulf, which is represented by the black dotted line. And for example, in the winter 2011 and 12, the anomalously low sea ice gulf in that winter probably results from the high frequency of circulation patterns that favor sea ice loss. To summarize the results, uh, we found that the most important circulation patterns for balance carrier sea ice loss is a high pressure over the UVs and a low pressure over Iceland. And consider this uh, persistence of these circulation patterns uh, can help explain the sea ice change from daily to seasonal time scales. And we also found that the dynamic process are particularly important for sea ice variability on short time scales. Thank you. Any questions? So I was wondering what your ocean, were these ice ocean coupled runs or what were you doing for? It's a SOM, it's a slab ozone's model with a Pisquai historical QFAS. So okay. low, yeah, so the, the ocean remains stationary. Okay, okay, thanks. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, I think we should thank all our speakers first. So. And now we actually have a discussion that we are excited um, to uh, have with everyone. And um, so this discussion in particular is regarding uh, CSM and actionable science and polar climate. So, oh really? Oh, we have five great minutes for our discussion. So um, if you have comments, please make them fast. Um, <laughs> very quickly, we shall, we shall discuss things, okay. So, um, you know, just some, some ideas for, you know, going forward, right? I mean, we have all of these actionable polar science projects, such as RVCC, which we heard about yesterday, for example, as well as so many others. Um, and so, you know, there's kinds of many questions that come up. First of all, like, what is the value in sharing information across projects? What information would be useful? Um, how might we share this information? 
what common issues across these different projects are emerging and best practices as well since this kind of area of actionable climate science is relatively new? Um, are there particular um, modeling needs that are not yet um, being done currently and that we could, you know, with perhaps minimal effort, um, manage to do? And then finally, um, you know, this was sort of something that I'm a little obsessed with, which is like, who are our stakeholders? Like if you're doing Antarctic work, like are your stakeholders the penguins? Like, or like who exactly are they? And so in that sense, like how do you engage with stakeholders? Um, how do you communicate? Um, and you know, like um, how, you know, in the case where your stakeholder is a penguin, like how, how do you determine what the needs are in that case, right? So happy to, Dave has the microphone, so he will wander around and take a couple of folks and their comments. If you could talk to a penguin, what would you say? Or, you know, another way of saying it is, you know, what, what you know, what products could you provide that would be relevant to penguins? You know, how would you assess, since you can't talk to the penguin, there has to be some other way of assessing the needs of this particular stakeholder uh, and, and thinking about, you know, which of these needs could be addressed by the, 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 the models, the strategies that, that you have available to you. And I guess it doesn't, have to be a, a, it doesn't have to be a penguin, it could be a, you know, a seal or, you know, any of the sort of, you know, wildlife of the area. I guess like on that note, right? I mean, I think maybe part of it is to think creatively about the stakeholders as well. So for example, when it comes to the Antarctic, right? The Antarctic krill is sort of the base of the global food web in the ocean. And so then if you think about, oh, there's like 2 billion humans that, that depend on fisheries for their protein, right? Then we start to get like, okay, so human societies are even, you know, to some extent connected to the Antarctic. And I think that those are connections when we think about stakeholders that maybe, you know, I, I don't know. I feel like in general, us as scientists, we don't talk to enough stakeholders. And then, you know, sometimes it's like, oh yeah, well, we just want to like maximize penguin health, which is great. Like, I love that. Um, but I think that there's probably ways to, you know, kind of expand that sense of who stakeholders are, even when we do this like very remote sort of work. I guess that's, yeah, just an idea. Yeah, I guess this is mostly a comment, but the, uh, you know, the, the tiny fraction that most penguins and humans uh, use of the ice on a regular basis is the land fast ice. Uh, and so I think representing that well in the model, uh, maybe thinking about how it's resolved and all, all those things seems like likely to be a, very relevant to, to any of these actionable science questions. Well, and that's super exciting because the new size has land fast ice. So that means that, yeah, that particular objective is maybe possible. I guess it's a curious category of stakeholders who haven't been born yet. Um, you know, if you're thinking about the Antarctic, the number one thing that you might be thinking about is will the West Antarctic ice sheet collapse and so on and so forth, you know, and so you could be thinking about, you know, potentially devastating climate impacts, but they're not going to happen for another 30 years, and so you wouldn't be interacting directly in a co-generation of knowledge sense with that stakeholder, although, you know, there could be other things you do in that, in that domain. Yeah, I think that's a really interesting point because I think um, then we start to get into issues of intergenerational intergener climate justice. And so there was a talk yesterday, and I forget the speaker. I have her name written down. Anyway, so, you know, we did talk about these, these legal sorts of, um, you know, remedies that people are starting to pursue. So there's currently a case in Montana that will be going on for a couple of weeks where I think it's like 12 children are actually, um, you know, pretty upset at the state of Montana because um, Montana does not allow consideration of greenhouse gas emissions. So, you know, this is like kind of starting to think about that intergenerational element. So absolutely, yeah, that's a, that's a really cool angle for the Antarctic as well, as well as the Arctic, right? In Montana. 
Hi, I think the person you're referring to is Shaina Sadai, who, yeah, she, she does great collaboration stuff. Thank you so much, stuff. yeah. yeah. Uh, my question was that I really feel that as soon as the West Coast extreme weather started converting their results to a monetary values in terms of how much loss it can, it can communicate in terms of money, uh, created a big impact in accelerating their research. Is there a way we can kind of link the CIs or I should changes based on the food chain link to a particular value which can have larger impact to financial institutions or not? I don't know, what if you do if the sign is the opposite of what you want? <laughs> I, I, so I think in the Arctic, it's quite interesting, right? Because like w one thing that we can start thinking about, right, is, is, is the, um, the potential of these new cross Arctic shipping routes, right? Um, and so then, you know, you're like, oh, great. You know, I'm, I'm saving so much money because I'm not going through the Suez Canal anymore, right? But I think the issue with that is, well, sure, that's like part of the story, but then, you know, there's lots of other costs involved as well, right? So it's, and, and then, of course, when it comes to economics and, you know, everyone always discounts the future, right? And so the question is like, how much are you discounting the future? Um, and so it, it
the problem oh, is that yeah. don't unmute it yep now i can hear you oh but then actually made him hear me when's doug can you hear me now yep so if i do what the media people tell me not to do you can hear me but now we have an echo are you on your laptop mic? So let's see, I can, I turned down the volume, but we still have an echo. And now one of the media folks just left, so. <laughs> And there's still no drinks outside. I think he went to get the professional. Does it help if you turn your volume off? I turn, I turn my, my volume, volume off here. here. Let's see, Let's see, we, we have, have the media, media person back, back. So, so we are echoing because I'm unmuted. Mic check. One, two. Mic check. That works. You can hear us now. It'll work. Yep, yep. can still, still hear you. you. Okay, great. And there is no echo. All right, well, we have a YouTube stream.
Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for your patience, and thank you for joining me this evening for this special session focused on the Safe Climate Research Initiative, which is a partnership between Silver Lining and CAR, the university community, and the Amazon Web Services. So how this all started is almost three years ago, so that was in May 2020, Kelly Wenzer, the executive director of Silver Lining, reached out to me and asked if I would speak at a sunlight reflection briefing that she was organizing. So if you remember May 2020, that was just the height of the pandemic lockdown. I had my kids at home. I had major Zoom fatigue and an overflowing to-do list. So obviously I said, no, sorry, Kelly, I can't do it this time, perhaps another time. But Kelly's extremely passionate about keeping a safe climate for everybody, so she did not take no for an answer. So here today in the session, and also many other community members, and the scope of this entire effort has reached beyond my expectations. Uh, so the partnership between Silver Lining and CAR in the university community, and as well as AWS, has led to the generation of assessing responses and impacts of solar climate intervention on the Earth system, or simply ARISE data sets, which were carry, carried out with CSM to Wacom. And some of those simulations were done on the NCAR supercomputer Cheyenne, and two of the sets were done on the AWS computer uh, due to a generous donation uh, by Anna, who is a picture here, who facilitated uh, the entire endeavor, and Brian Dobbins, who's gonna talk about that in detail. So on behalf of the entire community, I would like to thank Silver Lining for bringing this incredible team of researchers together, unified by the common goal. And I'd also like to thank Silver Lining for being continuous advocate for funding for this research and for tirelessly speaking about the importance and advocating for the importance of this work. So finally, I'd like to thank all the scientists, software engineers, and other team members that have been involved in the project nearly through the entire pandemic, but it's now great to see many of you here in person. And hi, Doug, online, sorry you couldn't be with us today. Um, but without further ado, actually, let me turn it over to Doug from Cornell University, who's been at the centerpiece of this endeavor at the very beginning. And I have just many, many memories of being on the phone with Doug discussing the design of a rice simulation for hours on end uh, in the spring of 2020 and, yeah, and, and beyond. beyond. So, so over to you, Doug. Thank you. Um, you need to enable the share screen for me. Um, or you have to stop sharing so I can share. Um, but I'll start um, by saying uh, thank you to all of the same people that were just on that last slide. Um, this is really a joint effort with a whole lot of people. Um, and definite uh, shout out to Yaga and Dan in particular for making all of this happen. Um, so I'm gonna talk about Arise. I'm not gonna drill into too much technical detail. I'm going to talk about the uh, motivation and design of the simulations more than anything. Um, so these are climate model simulations of stratospheric aerosol injection. Um, and if I can find where my mouse is, there we go. Um, if you saw Yaga's talk yesterday, um, you will see you will have seen some common information about all of this. Um, there's a number of talks that uh, that you may have seen here today. Uh, and yesterday involving these simulations already. Um, and I actually want to start, I was browsing uh, uh, New York Times this morning. Um, unsurprisingly, as usual, there's headlines about climate change. Um, the reason for talking about any sort of climate intervention, in this case, reflecting a tiny bit of sunlight back to space to cool the planet is of course, because of climate change. Um, which is, continues to get worse and will continue to get worse. Um, so we have to drive our emissions of CO2 and other greenhouse gases to zero. Uh, that does not solve climate change. Uh, that simply stops climate change from getting worse once we get to net zero. Um, we can, in principle, suck CO2 out of the atmosphere. Uh, lots of great ideas. I'm not going to talk about that. Um, none of them exist at scale today. And it's important to remember that all of these have a huge uncertainty in them, right? We don't know if I told you the emissions, how much the planet warms. Um, we don't know what future policy decisions are gonna look like. And some of this relies on technology uh, maturing as well. Um, and that leaves us in a position today where we don't have a guaranteed strategy to avoid significant climate change. 
Some people might be more optimistic about this than others. Uh, there's, uh, you know, there's definitely some substantial risk of a significant overshoot. So that's the context for talking about sunlight reflection methods, solar geoengineering, solar climate intervention, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the two main ideas and the one that I'm primarily talking about uh, today is with stratospheric aerosol injection. Um, when aerosols up into the stratosphere, they reflect sunlight, cools the planet. Um, and the other uh, idea I'll just mention briefly in passing is marine cloud brightening. Uh, in principle, we can reflect sunlight off of marine cloud, boundary layer clouds. Um, I made that vertical axis uh, qualitative on purpose. Um, depending on what impact you're looking at, if you, for example, made the global mean temperature constant, um, some other things will get worse, some things will get better. Um, and the important question and the reason for conducting a rise and the reason for looking at climate model simulations is to better understand what all of these trade-offs are. So, uh, you know, fundamentally, this is a risk-risk calculus of what's worse, following that green line or following the blue line. And the only way to answer some of that is by running climate model simulations. Um, so just to start at the top, what do we need to know for policy? Everything, right? So what is what would happen if we were to deploy, if someone were to deploy, what are the effects on health, extremes, cryosphere, sea level rise, agriculture, ecosystems, whatever your favorite impact is, or least favorite impact is. Um, this is why what Arise is for, is for answering all of these questions. And so you will see in some of the other talks, you will have already seen in some other talks, there has been some uh, looking at some different impacts here. My uh, dream, which I'll mention again at the end, would be anybody who is looking at future climate change projections, you know, whether, you know, writing their NSF proposal, writing their paper, section 3.2, <laughs> After you look at here's what we think will happen under climate change, go point your simulations to stratospheric aerosol injection as well, uh, so that we can build up a better robust understanding of what will happen under um, uh, different future scenarios. Um, will also be, of course, important- For to just assess. one second, because we're having a little trouble hearing you and our volume is all the way up. So if there's any way you can speak a little closer to the microphone, um, we might be able to hear you a little better. How's that? I'm uh, pretty much as close to the microphone as I can get. Just talk loud as if you were um, shepherding your children to come in. <laughs> you don't want me to talk that loud. <laughs> um, I'll project as well as I can. How's that? Any better? Um, and I know we started late, so I'll try to make up for time a little bit, but um, so uh, important factor to consider in all of this is uh, these are not binary questions. Uh, the impacts depend on how much cooling you're doing. Um, for stratospheric aerosols, they depend on all sorts of design choices. These simulations use sulfate, same as volcanic eruption mechanism for cooling the planet. There are other choices. Uh, I'll talk more about injection latitude in a little bit. Uh, we did not play with the injection season in this type of work. Um, and for injection altitude, this is at 21 and a half kilometers. That's sort of as high as we sort of realistically thought we could get in the moderately near future um, without the cost going through the roof. Um, and if you're doing marine cloud brightening, there's sort of a similar set of issues. Um, and in thinking about scenario design, this is partly what Yaga and I spent interminable hours on the phone and Zoom uh, and talking with all sorts of other people about what to choose. You need to think about the background scenario. Um, you want to be able to do a risk-risk comparison with, exist with other simulations without SAI. Um, what's the start date for deployment? If deployment started in 2060, we've got lots of time to do the research, so we want to focus on things that are nearer term. Um, how much cooling you're doing, uh, how that cooling is achieved, as I mentioned, and I'll say a bit more about it in a while. Um, and then in principle, all sorts of other risks as well. Um, so I'm going to first say uh, this is sort of pre-arise. We did a bunch of simulations in the middle atmosphere version 
uh, which is about two thirds of the computation, um, just so we could explore more things. Um, but this basic scenario set is the same. So starting in 2035, that's about as early as we thought we could, maybe people might deploy that soon. Uh, we also looked at simulation starting in 2045. Part of the motivation for that choice of 2035 is somewhere in that 2030 to 2035 window is likely where we would cross one and a half degree Paris Agreement threshold. Um, 35 year simulation, a lot of people, a lot of climate model simulations run out to 2100. That's a deliberate choice. Um, 15 years for things to converge, you get a 20 year period for analysis. By keeping the simulations shorter, we have more computer time to look at more scenarios, to look do more ensemble members. If you're picking a scenario that short, the SSP choice doesn't matter as much. So we only picked one. Um, originally, we started with three temperature goals. For a rise, we uh, decided to only use two. Um, two is good enough to assess linearity. Um, we do have simulations in the middle atmosphere version of termination, phase out, and some interruptions. If you're interested, let us know. Um, and we, in principle, one could also imagine a much broader set of inconsistencies um, and a broader set of strategies. We've also explored the strategy dimension more in the middle atmosphere version. Um, if you were listening to the Wacom earlier, uh, Eva, uh, talked about that as well. Um, I will point in particular the choice of how to define one and a half degrees matters. Uh, we defined that based on when we think the world will actually reach one and a half degrees above pre-industrial rather than when uh, Wacom happens to be one and a half degrees above its own pre-industrial. The advantage of defining the target that way is when you're doing model comparisons, then you're thinking about you know, similar increase in radiative forcing over time uh, for each model. Um, in uh, Arise, we basically, as I said, uh, we picked uh, the baseline scenario, which is described in this paper, uh, stays at one and a half degrees above pre-industrial. So basically when you turn it on, you're holding temperatures roughly constant. Um, we looked at one simulation. We have an additional uh, set of 10 ensemble members that cool the planet. Um, that gives a different set of trade-offs, um, and then an additional set of 10 ensemble members with a delayed start. Um, and what that looks like, so the, here's the cyan is the one and a half degree run. The purple is keeping temperatures a half degree cooler than that. Um, and then if you choose to look at the delayed start run, there's a slight inconsistency that was supposed to be the te same temperature target. Um, as the one and a half degree case. If you want to use that run, we'll just wind up interpolating in between the two. Um, in terms of the latitude of injection, uh, you can inject wherever you want. Uh, if you inject at 30 degrees north or 31 degrees north, you're never going to see the difference. This is sort of a reasonable set that's sort of different enough. Um, what we know in general is that if you inject in one hemisphere, you're going to shift the intertropical convergence zone. So you don't want to do that. Um, tropical injection broadly will overcool the tropics. More sunlight if you, in the tropics. If you've got more aerosols in the tropics, you'll have more cooling there. Um, you can imagine a more polar strategy that focuses the cooling at high latitudes. Um, that might also be easier to implement just because the tropopause is lower. Um, and then the strategy that we used here is exactly the same one as used in the Glen simulations, if you're familiar with that, um, injecting at 30 north, 15 north, 15 south, and 30 south, and basically using a feedback algorithm to learn how much to inject at each of those latitudes uh, to manage not just the global mean temperature, uh, but the inner hemisphere and equator to pole temperature gradients as well. When you do that, um, you actually do a reasonably good job in CESM uh, at managing the pattern of climate change from increased greenhouse gases. Um, so this is again from Yaga's paper. Uh, you may have seen this again yesterday. The pattern on the left is the pattern you get from warming the planet with greenhouse gases. And then the pattern on the right is offsetting that with stratospheric aerosols. And so when you're done, 
it actually looks pretty similar to if you had neither the greenhouse gases or the stratospheric aerosols. There's a, in temperature, not in everything else. There's a couple of key exceptions. One, you see that warming hole in the North Atlantic. Uh, that comes from a slowdown of the Atlantic meridional overturning, uh, which we don't uh, fully recover with stratospheric aerosol injection. Um, and then you also see things like a, um, a, a warming tongue in the um, Eastern Tropical Pacific um, that's also present in the SSP simulation. Um, I'm actually, you know, I should be checking where I am on time. Um, the, are, there are also a set of companion simulations conducted in UK ESM. Uh, Matthew Henry talked about that earlier today. So that so gives, uh, starts giving a little bit of a sense of... Into the new concept of how fast they could run in a re-engineered uh, or speed by performance on GPU. Sorry, I'm getting... And then I guess I would... Okay. Um, and then in addition, we have done uh, uh, a slightly simpler strategy that's easier, potentially easier to do in more models um, of just using injection at 30 north and 30 south um, to manage global mean temperature. So that hasn't yet been done in the full CESM Wacom, but we have a plan to do that as well. Um, so uh, there's been a bunch of talks at this workshop using a rise and related data project products. Um, I'm not going to walk through all of these. Um, if you're interested and you missed them, you can go back um, and take a look. Um, but, uh, oops, I was going to skip that slide. Um, but just to wrap up, so we have uh, simulations in the full chemistry, CESM2, Wacom, uh, 10 member ensemble member with two temperature targets with a delayed start as well. So you can actually get some comparative risk assessment and look at different, uh, how the impacts scale with different uh, choices uh, and what some of those trade-offs are. Um, there's a larger set of scenarios and strategies that's been explored in the middle atmosphere version if people are interested, uh, but with fewer ensemble members. Um, and then there's a website you can go to uh, for, um, uh, and, and contact Yaga or Dan or I uh, if you can't find any of the data you need. Um, and as I said near the beginning, one of the things that I would really love to see is shifting from uh, you know, a small community of people working on stratospheric aerosol injection and just trying to understand it to a much broader, um, you know, if you wanna be able to write the next IPCC report, <laughs> you might need a much more robust set of literature exploring what are all of the trade-offs um, with cho choosing to uh, consider stratospheric aerosol injection or not. Um, and that requires basically being able to look at all of the things that people care about. Um, so I will wrap up there and pass it off to the uh, next. I'm happy to take questions if people could actually hear all of that. Yeah, so we're yes, happy, happy to take, take short questions. questions. Um, let's see, we see got we now. And, can you still hear me online? So I I'll also mention the Danielle Visioni. That we we keeping a registry uh, of all the people doing analysis, and Danielle Visioni is one of the people who's keeping track of everybody doing the analysis. So if you go to the link on that website there is a scroll down the bottom there is a registry of people doing analysis so work is not being duplicated and that spreadsheet goes to both myself and i, I think mari and danielle just so somebody could, um so we coordinate a little bit are there any immediate questions for doug all right then our next speaker will be jim hurl from csu so he's going to talk about the work that his group's doing Great, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Yaga, uh, for putting this together. Thank you to Silver Lining and, and all the people that uh, Yaga acknowledged at the opening. My intent here is just to share a little bit about some of the work that we're doing, taking advantage in particular of the ARISE simulations 
been a great resource for our group up at CSU. Um, and so this is a presentation I, I want to mention that uh, all of this work is really being led at CSU um, by Libby Barnes as well as myself. And indeed, I want to begin by saying, actually, I've done very little of the work. Uh, the credit for all of the work that's been done here goes to this amazing group of people um, that we call our project team. And in particular, I want to call out a number of the, the postdocs and the research scientists and the graduate students that are listed here, several of which are in the audience. Raise your hand if you're associated. Raise your hand, Danielle. Up, oh, Kirsten, you're still there. Uh, and all of that. So Kirsten uh, Meyer now at NCAR. So the one thing about having students and postdocs is they graduate, they move on. So this is our team past and present, but this is really the group of people. And I'm going to try to really fly through some results here just to give you a feel for the kind of analysis that we've been doing uh, with this data. And um, the way that I'm going to organize this is actually organized around a proposal that we wrote to DARPA that we got funded. Um, three main goals, and I just want to highlight a couple of uh, selected results from each one of these goals. The first relates to detection, which is a major issue. If you look at the National Academy report that came out in March of 2021, you know, how do you begin to, you know, can you detect the influence of uh, solar climate intervention or stratospheric aerosol injection on the climate? Maybe in terms of things like global mean temperature, but what about regional? Uh, climate variables, extreme variables, and the like. The second goal is to quantify the changes that, that stratospheric aerosol injection in particular may introduce uh, into the Earth system. And then the third part that I'm not going to talk very much about today, but, um, you know, is scenario and scenario design. Uh, there was a workshop here last fall on the importance of scenarios, and we've tackled trying to uh, think about how one might think about unilateral deployment around geopolitical uh, considerations as well. So those are the three goals. So I want to begin by just saying a little bit about some of our work with detection and attribution. This is the CSM workshop, so I know that everyone is familiar with what internal or enforce, unforced uh, climate variability is all about. It's a focus of our efforts up at CSU. And this is just a, a simple way to think about this, right? And this is actually not a rise, this is Glenn, so I'm going back a little bit in time, but the, the point is the same. And what you're looking at here is the, uh, the trend in near surface temperatures the first decade after a hypothetical deployment as simulated in the Glenn's experiments. And if you average across all 20 members of the ensemble, you see that there basically is no trend in, in near surface temperature. That is the forced response, that's essentially saying SAI is doing what we intended it to do. But if I unmask and look at the individual 20 ensemble members, so these are individual realizations, and we don't live in an ensemble mean world, we might be living in one of these worlds, you can see that there can still be significant variations in temperature. And this is, this is the, the fundamental uh, challenge behind trying to uh, say that we can detect uh, that we are living in a climate with stratospheric aerosol injection as opposed to a climate without. Now, that's a broad statement. Of course, it depends on the scenario, et cetera, et cetera. But we have been uh, utilizing the ARISE data sets that have been highlighted here to ask these kind of questions. And in particular, we're using machine learning approaches, uh, artificial intelligence, and explainable artificial intelligence approaches so that we can understand how a computer can, can decide whether or not it's sampling a world with or without stratospheric aerosol injection. So we're focused on things like trying to detect the regional impacts of SRM on Earth system variables, uh, how different would an SRM world be from one without SRM, and how does this vary regionally? And these are very challenging questions, and I'm not going to go through a bunch of detailed results, but rather kind of a summary slide. We're looking at a range of our system variables, just three of which are located here. I'll give a, a little bit of a feel for a fuller range in, in another slide or two. But thinking about things like extreme temperatures, extreme rainfall, changes in permafrost and how all of this may affect things like permafrost tipping points. And in general, what we find is that using artificial intelligence, um, we can detect uh, impacts, certainly globally, within just a few years uh, after deployment, but even regionally, depending on the variable, somewhere between about a, a year and maybe a, a decade or a decade and a half. Um, and one of the interesting things about these approaches in, in using this, you can find out 
which regions of the globe the computer is really picking up to say, I'm sampling a world with SAI versus one without. And that can offer insights into where observations may be critical for uh, detecting some of these kinds of impacts. This is just one slide. Uh, um, one of the postdocs, uh, Zach Labe, who's now moved on to GFDL, um, published a paper uh, earlier this year looking at these issues uh, regionally. This is looking at temperature. The control simulation here is just the SSP245 uh, simulation. The SAI runs are the, the uh, Arise SAI simulations. The colors in the dots just show how much confidence the computer has in being able to say, I am sampling a climate change world versus a world with SAI. And you can see, in general, the, the computer has quite a bit of confidence and gets the predictions right. Although, regionally, where the signal of internal variability is a lot higher, um, there, there is some uncertainty in some of these dots in certain regions. Now, this is a pretty complicated slide, but I just wanted to show one more example of how we're using some of these uh, machine learning approaches. This is a, a new paper that's just been submitted by Antonios uh, Mamalakis. Uh, who is a research scientist with us at CSU for a little bit longer, just took a professor position at University of Virginia. And he's applied this in a very interesting framework. And, and the question is, um, can the computer distinguish um, whether it's sampling um, a climate in the future or, and quantify how similar that future climate is to today's climate? So fundamentally, how is the climate different and is it different? And how does that differ between a climate change run and then a climate change run with stratospheric aerosol injection? So the pink dots, and you can see all the different Earth system variables that he examines in this paper, are indicating that indeed the computer can say, uh, it, un, un, the pink dots represent the climate change runs. And so what those results are indicating is that uh, the computer can definitely say the climate of the future is different from the climate of today due to the building up of greenhouse gases. The blue dots are doing the same thing with stratospheric aerosol injection. And there's two main points that I want to point out. Number one, the world is still different. The computer says this is a different world. Climate is distinguishable in the future, even with SAI, compared to present day climate, okay? But in nearly all cases, SAI is decelerating, decelerating the ongoing changes. So it's a very interesting kind of approach. The other uh, work that we did uh, over the last year or so was to think about this in the context of how society may perceive stratospheric aerosol injection. So because of natural variability, you could uh, easily imagine yourself being in the upper left panel. This is a grid point near Beijing, China, but you could pick anywhere around the world, where maybe the planet or the location was cooling a bit. Then you do SAI, and due to natural variability, you actually have some warming. Or panel B, where you were warming and you continue to warm. You may think of that as perceived failure. And so this is a paper that, that came out. Pat Keyes led this paper in uh, proceedings in the National Academy this last year. And we can use the ARISE ensemble and quantify um, where perceived failure is most likely. And that is indeed over land regions where the internal variability is very, very high. Okay, so I want to move on a little bit toward quantifying changes in the Earth system. Um, I put this slide up so that I remember what TALIC is as much as introducing it to you. TALIC is unfrozen ground within permafrost. It's a precursor to accelerated thaw. And this is work that Ariel Morrison uh, in our group at CSU has been doing in, in looking at the impacts of stratospheric aerosol injection on permafrost and in particular uh, perhaps preventing or uh, delaying uh, reaching tipping points with permafrost and, and releases of carbon to the atmosphere. So again, the same kind of an approach. Um, what we're looking at here is the ensemble amine across the ARISE uh, SAI members. You can read the color bar yourself. Uh, the very, well, yeah, okay, on this screen it looks like purple, on my screen it looks like blue. That's where TALIC uh, forms in the world with climate change, but not at all if you do stratospheric aerosol injection. And then the bluish colors are grid boxes where TALIC forms earlier in the climate change world, but it still does form with SAI. And you can see most of those grid points are either on this screen, that purplish color, or the blue color. But when you look at individual ensemble members, again, you see maybe the majority of the points look like that. 
but if I put these bright red ovals, um, yeah, this, this is not working on this screen at all, but where these ovals are are just some samples of where talc actually forms earlier, even with stratospheric, aeros with stratospheric aerosol injection than it does without. And it, again, it's just emphasizing the importance of the natural variability. That's kind of a theme of a lot of our work. Daniel Huholt, who is in the audience here, published a, a paper in Earth's Future earlier this year. Um, looking at the, uh, the, the impacts of stratospheric aerosol injection in both the Arise and the Glenn simulations. And you can't really directly compare those, but Daniel came up with a novel way to frame this paper and say this really focused on what happens immediately before and after deployment and comparing things that way. And you can see that his paper, this is just one figure from that paper, looks at a lot of different variables and really quantifies these kinds of impacts. Really nice piece of work. And tomorrow in the Climate Variability Working Group, he's going to be talking about some new work, not this work that he's been doing. So go to that. Uh, Daniel Tuma, who's also in the audience here, um, uh, is, is one of the world experts on thinking about how fire weather conditions are going to change into the future. And she's written some very nice papers on this under climate change. And we teamed up to do some work on how that looks in the ARISE simulations. And again, in the RCP scenarios, you see that fire weather conditions uh, worsen um, across much of the globe. But what happens when you do stratospheric aerosol injection? And this is a difference plot. And so the blue colors indicate here where, where fire uh, weather, um, where um, fire weather event frequency decreases with stratospheric aerosol injection. And the key message is that happens over much of the globe, but not everywhere. If you look at, for instance, West Central Africa, you see actually an increase in fire weather conditions uh, due to drying over that region in the stratospheric aerosol injection runs. This slide might take a second to explain, so I'm going to go through it very quickly. How much more time do I have? Two minutes? Oh, that's sort of a whatever I want. Okay. No, I, I won't abuse that. So this, this slide is from a, a, a graduate student, uh, Ivy Glade, and she was looking at the Arise simulations, and uh, we have another project funded through NOAA looking at how climate intervention may impact mesoscale features and things like thunderstorms. But to take advantage of the ARISE simulations, of course, which are done with an Earth system model, we're looking at changes in large-scale convective parameters. And so if you look at these parameters, CAPE, convective available potential energy, convective inhibition, tropospheric wind shear between the surface and six kilometers, and the product of CAPE and SO6, these are all important large-scale parameters um, to, to think about how future convection might change. And this is over the US over two regions, the southeast, uh, southeast region and the Midwest region. The dashed lines here show the ensemble mean changes, so more CAPE, lower SIN. That means that when thunderstorms do occur, they may be bigger, stronger, more intense. Um, and again, you can examine the internal variability since a rise is an, uh, is an ensemble approach, and this is really nice for documenting not only what the force change might be, but where we might actually land in reality. And you can do the same analysis then in the SAI simulations, and now you see that many of the changes, for instance, in convective available potential energy are significantly reduced due to uh, decreases in anticipated future changes in relative to a climate change world without SAI. And again, look at the overlap of the ensemble members. So there, are, there is overlap, so even in a world with SAI, we expect to see changes in effective activity. Um, almost done here, another really interesting uh, piece of work, and, and this is just being submitted now by Shen Rei Dao. Uh, Shen Rei is here somewhere, yeah, there he is. And sorry, I won't explain this as well as you do, but um, came up with the idea of the controller in Arise, of course, is working to try to inject aerosols to keep our temperature targets, keep the global mean temperature near 1.5 degrees relative to pre-industrial values, as well as equator to pole temperature gradients and the like. So what happens though, we know that natural climate variability for instance, due to ENSO, warms up the climate system or a La Nina cools down the climate system. 
How does or does the controller respond to that? And so Shen Ray's done a really, really great uh, analysis here. And if you look at changes in SO2 uh, injection over time, standardized anomalies, and then just composite, what about those years that have high injection amounts versus low injection amounts, and then composite the SST field? That's what you're looking at here in the top diagram. And indeed, what you get is a surface temperature pattern that's very reminiscent of ENSO forcing. So you can do a simple linear regression analysis, compute the ENSO-driven component, that's shown in the lower left, and then the residual. And the residual hints at things like PDO, North Atlantic Oscillation, and all of that. The point being the controller is responding to the internal variability in the system. So it raises some interesting questions about how you can design maybe future versions of the controller. Okay, I'm basically done. Uh, goal three, all I wanted to say with that was that, you know, what, what we call the scenarios, our terminology for the scenarios like under a rise or like collective actor, somehow the world comes together and says, this is the temperature targets we want to meet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but but what, about, what about possible unilateral action? So our group has, has utilized game theory um, with social scientists to actually help think through all the possible geopolitical situations that may lead some actor somewhere in the world to consider deploying SAI. And we're beginning to do those simulations right now. And Brian Medeiros, I want to call him out because he was really helpful in helping us. Uh, no, not uh, Brian Dobbins, sorry. Get my Brian's confused here. Brian Dobbins has been extremely, extremely helpful in setting, setting this up. And as part of that, um, there's no way that you can possibly sample all of the possible scenarios that may be deployed under a unilateral action. So we're leveraging AI methods to learn the sensitivity of the Earth system to a wide variety of possible scenarios. And uh, Charlie Connolly, uh, Charlie, if you raise your hand, is here as well, and she's doing a lot of that work. So since this is the Arise session, this is not bragging. This is just I wanted to show you. These are publications that over just about the last year or so, our group has published based solely on the Arise simulations. And these are papers we currently have submitted, and there's more work in the hopper. So at CSU, we've really tremendously benefited from Arise. So Thanks to NCAR, thanks to your leadership, Yaga, thanks to Silver Lining for making this happen. So I'll stop with that. Are there any brief questions for Jim? I've just... All right, so as you've seen from Jim, has a small army of students and postdocs doing lots of analysis of the Earth system, and ideally we would have such a small army across the country and across the world, and that's where Brian's talk is going to come in. So the set of simulations that we carried out on Cheyenne was about 10 million core hours. So with the donation of the time from AWS, we were able to carry out two more of these ensembles. And Brian's going to walk you through the difficulties associated with that because none of that was straightforward. So coming up, Brian. He's coming. Help is on the way. And Brian is the single person responsible for making all the running on the cloud happen. So I would give him a round of applause even before he starts. Oh, right. I got to speak in here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, a quick overview of what I'm going to cover real fast. Uh, how do we run the models on Amazon? Uh, how do we store and access data on Amazon? And then I'm going to get into these challenges that we've encountered, which is understandable. It's the first time we've done something like this. And, uh, and when I say future plans, a demo of a Jupyter Notebook, uh, that doesn't mean I'm going to demo a future notebook in the future, I'm gonna, I'm, uh, a Jupyter Notebook in the future. I'm going to do it now, live, which is why also you're seeing my browser windows there. We've had a lot of trouble with technology already, so let's hope this goes well. So when we talk about the cloud, uh, the cloud is basically a lot of capabilities. We want to think, well, what do we want from the cloud? Well, you guys as scientists, you're used to logging into clusters and running clusters. So we want to configure the cloud in a cluster way. Now, the nice thing is, 
we can lean on Amazon to provide a lot of the heavy lifting for this. They have a tool called Amazon Parallel Cluster, which does exactly this. It spins up some resources, you can see more jobs, it functions like Cheyenne in that regard. Of course, it doesn't have CESM on it, so that's where a lot of this customization comes in. The other thing that you'll notice is, uh, so this is a command that we use here in green, uh, it's not green there, well, it's sort of green, uh, is we use these YAML files to configure the, uh, uh, what this cluster looks like. And again, you guys are scientists. You don't want to deal with YAML files and subnet IDs with you know, hexadecimal characters. So this is what Parallel Cluster does, but we take a step back and try to abstract it away a little bit. Uh, that's the goal of good software. We want to make complex things look simple. So here's how we do this. We say CSM create cluster. We can specify some user accounts if we want users. We can specify a mode. Uh, we recently used a serial node for some CTSM single point runs, but really basically make it pretty easy. Uh, so behind the scenes, this does a bunch of stuff. It validates the credentials, creates these user accounts, installs the CESM environment, so that when you get a system after this command completes, you just log into it and everything just works. It runs, that's the nice thing, make it easy on people. Um, the other aspect of this, one of the key goals is we don't, we're, like, we're, we really benefited from Amazon's generosity here. They gave us a ton of credits, but we don't want to be tied to Amazon. We don't want, you know, if you're using Amazon one week and you're using Azure the next, we don't want you to have to learn different things. So we abstract that away so we can use the same commands with different backends so that you can deploy to any cloud. So that's our approach. So that's how you run it, and the rest, once you log in, is just like any other cluster. You run create new case, you case uh, build, case submit, Standard CESM stuff. So let's talk data. So data is a tricky one. Okay, so uh, these Wacom runs generate about 840 gigabytes per model year. We had about 600 model years total. That's 504 terabytes. And if you were to do this on the parallel file system that's needed to get good performance out of a run, that's about 72.5K a month just to run the file system. Uh, actually, and, and I, I used Amazon's cost calculator. I was on Derecho earlier. It's got 55 petabytes and uh, 54.7 were free. And I, I put it in, I said, what if I wanted a 55 petabyte file system? And it was $7.9 million per month. So uh, this is the efficiency of, of NCAR system is really good. Nobody pays for storage, but we needed this. And so what do we do? Well, we tried this new workflow where we'd run a year at a time, we'd post-process it, we'd put it on slower, cheaper storage that was more uh, viable and keep our, our FSX system small. Uh, you know, hey, we're doing yearly cycles anyway. Uh, this sounds really simple. Uh, this resulted in a lot of headaches. Uh, this, this was a new way of running the post-processing. Uh, I would definitely do it differently next time. We always learn something from new, new endeavors, right? So. Uh, how do we access this data on Amazon? Uh, so the nice thing is, uh, one of the great things that Amazon does, they have this open data program. All of the data that we've run is now in this open data program. It is available for free. And anybody can download it anywhere in the world, no cost, you don't need an Amazon account. Uh, and I'm gonna show you uh, two ways here, and I'll show a third later, because these are still a little bit uh, geeky. If you, uh, you know, and I say that as a geek, so uh, you don't wanna have to use an Amazon command line, but you can. If you're used to Python and used intake ESM, we have catalogs of data, you can do that. I'm gonna show you an abstraction of that a little bit later on that's really good. And while I'm not usually one to call out commercial things, this is a cool thing where our cloud infrastructure, we can deploy Jupyter Hubs on Amazon and you can do the processing local to the data or you can download the data and use it local. Uh, I just learned about this a few days ago. This is you can use your local Python environment on your laptop but use cloud workers in a DAS queue. So that, that's a pretty cool thing, I wanted to, to mention it. Okay, let's talk about the challenges. So uh, this one, uh, it's never good to see data corruption when you're talking about science. Uh, this was the first one we ran into. Uh, we didn't know what was going on and we kept, uh, like we would post-process things, we would hang, and it turns out if you did an NC dump on the command here, it turns out that, well, I, okay, I'm sure you can see what the error is here, right? This is a you know, three hourly file, it should be a pretty consistent pattern, and we had nonsense data. Uh, the really annoying thing about this was this was non-deterministic, so you hit it one time on you know, uh, year two, month three, and the next time you'd hit it uh, five years in. Uh, the worst kind of problem. Uh, also very infrequent, so one out of every one to 2,000 files. So this took 
months to, to solve, and we tried a lot of things. Turned out the solution ended up being easy. This was an, an issue between Amazon's EFA, this is their InfiniBand type adapter, and Intel MPI. They just don't play nicely. We switched to OpenMPI, no more problems. Worked good after that. Uh, the next problem, this is what I alluded to before, post-processing. Uh, you know, so generally when we run post-processing on Cheyenne, we finish a run. We, however, run, however long we're running for, 25 years, 35 years, 100 years, we have the whole data set and then we run our post-processing to generate time series. Uh, it had never been run in incremental yearly values before. There were some unique issues, which kind of makes sense. The, the LAN model was set to do uh, 30 days of output at a time. There's 360 days, 365 days in a year. It doesn't go evenly, so you'd start to get some extra data sets. Uh, but the really annoying one was these extra time slices. Uh, these popped up. We still don't know why they popped up. Uh, the time series, uh, the post-processing tool is no longer supported. This is an issue with, again, when a lot of our development, I, I hammer on this all the time, we focus exclusively on the model. We need to focus more on tools. This is helpful for the community. This was not an Amazon issue. This was how we were running on Amazon. So uh, I'm going to give a, a shout out to Jonas Shaw here. Uh, he was extremely helpful in, in helping getting this mostly solved. The reason he didn't get it all solved is we thought it was all solved. Then he went back to his studies, and we found there were a few more issues that we had to, to get solved. But uh, this is something that better tools would fix, and we'd really like to uh, address before next time. Um, one new issue, and this is a big one, that uh, credit to Ezra Brody and Dan Vizioni. Uh, this just came out, what, a week, a week ago, two, two weeks, something like that. Um, and there's an issue with the ocean energy. Now, uh, we don't know, I don't know what the issue is here. Uh, the first two bumps that you see look like they coincide with the restart, so I'm guessing it's a restart issue, but we don't know what the 2060 one is, and this requires more investigation. So, uh, okay, so having said all that, I've gone through the, the issues, I'm gonna switch to, uh, this is where we live in dangerously, I'm gonna do a, a, a live demo of what it looks like to access some of this data in the cloud. So, this is a Jupyter Notebook, I imagine most people are familiar with them, and this has this new tool that we're writing called the CSM Toolkit, and I'll show you how that works. Uh, I'm gonna uh, cross my fingers and uh, hope this all runs here. All right, that Russell works, so this is great. So one of the nice things about this data sets tool is, uh, you know, we have a lot of different ways of distributing data. And I know one of the NCAR scientists, who even with our climate data gateway, has a page long cheat sheet of how to find things. That's a problem, we can do it much better. So when we look at this, I can get a list of all the data sets that are available in this tool and they have names, and I can load them up by name. Now, there's a really cool thing I'm gonna talk about in a minute when I get to the end of this, but I just wanna show you it works first. But that, that is one of those things where it looks really simple and it enables something that's really cool and transformative, which is why I feel this is a way we wanna go in the future. So now I've loaded this data set. If I'm gonna load up a variable like this uh, reference height, uh, the monthly data, I say that. Right now, it is pulling live from the cloud uh, this data. I don't need to download anything locally. I don't need to, you know, subset my data. I just tell it what I want, and it's going to pull it live. Uh, I'm on a slow Wi-Fi link right now. It's much faster if you're uh, on a fast link. And uh, one, one odd thing it does with this software is it doesn't sort your ensemble members. So we're just going to force a sort. That's a small wrinkle that we'll, we'll fix later. But now I've got all this data loaded, and I can just uh, plot it. So here you go. Here's all the ensemble. So this is just a really quick demo, and I'm gonna go back and just highlight one thing here, loading of the data. When we talk about uh, you know, democratizing data and making things available, the really cool thing that we can do in here is we can hide uh, some logic to say, well, okay, where are you accessing this data from? And if, they're, if you're on Cheyenne, it'll load the local, local copy. If we have a copy in South America, it'll load that one. So it's much faster access for people. So it's it's, that's, that's the whole goal, is make the technology simpler. Everyone uses the same command. Everyone loads data the same way. You don't have to remember long repo names, but make it simple and fast and accessible for everybody. So uh, I know that was fast. Uh, that's all I'm gonna show for now. Uh, thank you very much. Hopefully I got us back in time so you can all get a drink faster. So. <laughs> Any quick questions for Brian? All right, then we're going to move on to Lily, who is another university partner. So she's from Rutgers University.
And ideally, we would clone Brian and have all the support for the world running these notebooks, but uh, we need some extra resources for that. Hi, Lily. Hi, Yoga. How are you? Good. So I think my slides, it's only four slides, so it's already. Yeah, we're going to advance them for you here. Yeah, I don't know why I couldn't share my screen. So if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and start speaking, we'll get your sure. slides up really shortly. Sure, sure. I'm Lily Shah. I'm working at Rutgers University, as shown, and I think in one of the slides, Rutgers has a still a group of people working on impacts of sulfate aerosol uh, injection, climate intervention. So our group is really focusing on agriculture impacts and uh, air pollution impacts. And we are trying to understand under sulfate aerosol injection how it will change the surface environment, which will change the surface chemistry, change the surface carbon cycle, uh, and of course the agriculture. We are curious to understand the food security under uh, climate intervention. And our group is part of it is doing a model development working with the land modeling group here in the NCAR, and the part of the group is working on using COM crop and uh, simulate, um, simulate agriculture response. And another big part of our group is doing is communicate with agriculture modeling community and trying to build the connection and trying to introduce climate intervention this scenario especially arise to the agriculture modeling group. And hopefully we could have a multi, multi-modal uh, assessment of agriculture impact under arise. So. so Lily, we're running without your slides now. There have been some multiple technical issues today. So I would just okay. go and say in the interest of time, keep going. Okay, even without slides. So basically, I'm um, just uh, saying on the slides is there are so many uh, climate model simulation uh, on how the Earth system will respond. So the climate response after we inject the SO2 or other kind of climate intervention strategies. And what the way we are trying to understand the agriculture responses we are taking the climate output such as temperature precipitation and the solar radiation and use those as input to force the crop model. And currently CLM crop is the only crop model coupled with the earth system model. So when we are doing the earth system simulation, climate simulation, we are going to get the agriculture output directly. But if we would like to work in with other crop models, we have to provide them the precipitation, so radiation and uh, um, temperature input. So we are working with a large group called Agriculture um, AgMap, Agriculture Model into Comparison Project. And there are more than 20 uh, crop models uh, working together there. So I'm working with the GGCMI Global Graded Crop Model Initiative, the leader there, Yunus, and trying to have a really pilot study and passing the ARISE simulation output to them, just one ensemble members to them. And the three crop models will do the offline simulation. And we hope to have uh, some results to present it in the ACMAP uh, workshop. Um, end of June, I think, in New York City. And after that, we hope there could be more crop models join this project. And the second phase of this project, we're hoping to include the 10 ensemble members from CSM2 simulation and also five ensemble members from the UK ESM uh, simulation. And then moving forward from there, we hope there could be more crop models included and also include the rise one point degree um, simulation and half degree simulation. So basically that's what my slides saying, the summary from our group. Um, and the reason, okay, 
And the reason why we hope to have a, a multi-crop model assessment is because different crop model, we did some preliminary results. Using CLM5 crop, we find out under a rice simulation, the global Global crop production for rice, maize, soybean, and wheat has been increased compared with SSP 2.4.5. But there's another crop model. They find solar, the solar radiation management, the sulfate aerosol injection, basically does nothing to global agricultural production. So they have really different response. That's why we hope there are more crop models involved, and then we could have a robust response to understand the agriculture response. So basically, that's 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 what our group's doing, and uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully after the model development, we could include the ozone damage and the UV impact to study how the um, crop responds under sulfate aerosol injection. Thank you so much, Lily. Mm -hmm. I know you're all ready to go towards the reception, but we have one last speaker, Alex Wong from Silver Lining, who's going to close us out with some future directions. Good, 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 good. All right. Well, yeah. Well, thank you for joining us for this celebration of the formal release of the Arise data set. And uh, I hope you'll stay around. I think I got to run out on that one, right? Oh, no, it's okay. I'll do it. Um, and uh, I hope you'll stay around for the reception that we're hosting. But First, a quick word from our sponsor, which in this case happens to be me. Um, so a few quick words about Silver Lining. We do a few different kinds of things uh, that are related to our overall mission. One is that we fund research in a focused way on near-term climate risk and interventions. We're also interested in how innovation can help research move more quickly and expand access. And so we partnered with Amazon and a couple of other companies with various angles on how technology can help accelerate things. And uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later. And we work on policy and advocacy, again, around this coordinated mission effort to drive research and information for effective decision making within a decade. So we do work on US policy, uh, international policy, and uh, while I won't spend a lot of time on it today, we do that with a focus uh, and interest in access to scientific information and equity. So that's part of our practice. Uh, and while we're here to celebrate a three-year-long partnership between Silver Lining, NCAR, and the other members of the Safe Climate Research Initiative, for me, that partnership stretches back nearly a decade when I cornered Jim Hurl at the end of the 2014 AGU and gently suggested that wouldn't NCAR like to conduct the world's largest, most sophisticated and computationally expensive ensemble of something called stratospheric aerosol injection, implemented using a barely validated methodology called closed loop feedback control. Jim said yes, and that engagement produced the geoengineering large ensemble, the intellectual and spiritual predecessor of Arise. And the reasons that NCAR was the right place to take that transformative step that leapfrogged over the prior state of the art are still true today. There just aren't a lot of, there just aren't single institutions that bring to the table all that NCAR does. What I would particularly like to highlight is that, you know, NCAR is the place that has as an explicit mission enabling research across a broad range of the academic community. And so while they, you know, do and lead work, um, helping others engage in transformative science is an explicit part of their mission statement. So Silver Lining's mission for our research efforts is to ensure a safe climate in a decade. And to achieve that, we leverage a network of senior experts in science, technology, and policy to define a roadmap of research and policy goals, and use that to identify coordinating lines of work that could be developed as programs or initiatives. Our philosophy is to find the best people and empower them with the resources that they need to collaborate, iterate, and accelerate. 
So I just want to say what an incredible privilege it is working with the members of the Safe Climate Research Initiative. Our initial members that we started with are, you see their logos there. And we have now about 70 researchers on our monthly meeting invites, which are the highlight of my uh, working life. It's particularly gratifying to see the number of young researchers who have become engaged in this topic. And the growth and interest and attendance in previously sleepy and static conferences like the Gordon Research Conference on Climate Intervention. The explosion of papers that explore fascinating research questions and approaches that went far beyond what we thought we could do with these kinds of simulations. So why did the world need a rise in 2020, given that Glenn's was already a step change in the sophistication and detail of SAI scenario data, and that the rest of the climate intervention community hadn't begun to catch up? much less the broader climate science and policy world? Well, the easiest answer is that by pushing the envelope, we learned an incredible amount, and we knew we could do better. We could do better in policy relevance, in enabling the kinds of impact analyses that we knew decision makers and that the broader society would need. And we knew we could do better in terms of increasing the availability and accessibility of that data for the whole world. Not just the global north, uh, to do state-of-the-art climate science. So I could talk about the publications we've produced or how we've enabled various kinds of firsts, but uh, like the first production deployment of global climate models on the cloud uh, with both CESM and 3ESM. But I think a nice way to convey the depth and breadth of the work here and the kinds of analyses that arise data sets enable is to just mention in these talks that you've heard at the conference today that use the ARISE simulation data set. And this opening up of climate intervention to a broader community of scientists is exactly the point. One of our key messages at Silver Lining is that the wrong way to think about climate intervention is as an isolated research domain. Instead, it's the application of everything we know about the earth and environmental sciences, and something about which all earth and environmental scientists have something to contribute. So our goal with Arise was to accelerate the maturation of research so that it can catalyze the development of new programs and efforts. And then those programs and efforts can be leveraged and complemented to maintain the pace of research across all the science that needs to be done. And if we look at the current efforts that are building on what the Safe Climate Research Initiative teams have done, I feel like we've been pretty successful. Uh, without going into this too much, I'd like to highlight a few things happening at NCAR with Jack Chen uh, working on the ERB program, with Mari and Simone supporting the Degrees Initiative analyses in the Global South, and with Monica and Peter Lawrence and their work to define community climate intervention strategies with support from the NSF. Another developing line of effort is the exploratory research that's laying the groundwork that is needed to start envisioning an Arise-like simulation of marine cloud brightening, famously complicated, where the explicit representation of the processes that we know are critical for marine cloud brightening are used to define a strategy and to assess the ability of MCB to achieve certain climate outcomes. Without that understanding, it's unclear what we even mean when we say that we're assessing the efficacy and impacts of potential future MCB interventions. Very briefly, I'll mention some initiatives that Alicia Karspeck is running as our Director of Climate Information Programs, trying to take some of the pioneering work that we've done in conducting HPC simulations uh, uh, on the cloud and making those data sets available on cloud data providing sources uh, and operationalizing that so that we can bring these tools to uh, communities that face barriers in their ability to access the tools and capacities needed to do state-of-the-art climate science. One example of that effort is the Africans Downscaling Africa project, which is a uh, African-led uh, consortium, African university-led consortium, uh, conducting that attempts or is uh, aiming to achieve um, Cortex simulations using Amazon uh, and cloud HPC resources to 
conduct a very computationally intensive uh, set of experiments. So I briefly mentioned the work that we do in international policy, for example, through our global youth initiative. That's Arushi Shah, some of you may know her, uh, in the middle there. Uh, and our engagement with international assessment bodies. And what we're hearing loud and clear in these fora is that the kind of information being produced by RISE is urgently needed across the globe. So as we look ahead, we see some critical path activities for ensuring that we have the kind of capabilities that you need in order to evaluate near-term risks and impacts of climate intervention, and have formulated an initial predict, uh, perspective on how they might fit together and lay out in time. And one of the things that emerges in that is that some of them are quite resource intensive and take, will take a long time to mature. And so if we don't start on those things early, then delivering the required information in the requisite period of time is going to be Really briefly, I'll touch on a few uh, potential future directions. Uh, and all of these things have to do with a um, significant piece of model development that will be required in order to do risk-risk analyses of critical questions that we have about climate intervention. For example, how, eff uh, how effective might they be in preventing or reversing some of the uh, tipping points that evidence is emerging may face us in the future. For us to do this in a realistic and explainable way, we might have to do things like uh, conduct scenarios or experiments where we couple explicit representation of tipping processes with the explicit representation of climate intervention processes. And if that makes you nervous, it makes me nervous too, because those are likely to be incredibly expensive. Something which uh, Lily touched on is that this same coupled um, analyses are critical for the evaluation of climate uh, impacts, especially the second and third order effects of those climate impacts and their evaluation of safety against near-term warming pathways in a risk-risk framework. So as we celebrate the release of Arise, we might ask ourselves the same question that we asked as we completed Glenn's. Does the world need an Arise 2.0? And I think the answer, and the reason for this answer, is also the same. That by pushing the envelope, we learned an incredible amount, and we know we could do better in piloting new capabilities, in enabling impacts analyses that decision makers and bro broader society need from us, and increasing the availability and accessibility of the tools needed for the whole world to do state-of-the-art climate science. So to conclude, I want to say that NCAR has been a fabulous partner and a convener to enable collaboration and engagement with the broader scientific community. Even as other institutions slowly wake up to the importance and urgency of this research, I think it's no exaggeration to say that NCAR has been ground zero for producing the best, most broadly relevant scientific evidence on climate intervention available in the world. And if we think ahead about the kinds of choices that we'll be confronted with, as climate damages and risk exposures increase in the not too distant future, it's clear that much work remains ahead of us. And just as clearly, I see the importance of the role that NCAR continues to play in producing science that the world needs. So thank you. Thank you so much, Alex. Are there any questions for Alex or anybody else? Well, then I think I'm the last thing. Patience with the technology. And let's thank Silver Lining is sponsoring the reach to say hi to Alex and say thank you and thank you all for coming. <laughs>